the hearing room of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Congressman James Florio of New Jersey will be chairing the Subcommittee on Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Competitiveness, which will consider legislation to reauthorize the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before the hearing began, we spoke to Congressman Dennis Eckert of Ohio about its purpose. Well, what we hope to get from the hearing is a fuller understanding of the demands placed on the CPSC, whether or not they're capable of meeting those demands, and whether ultimately or not uh, consumers, as we go into this critical Christmas shopping season, are going to have all the information they need to know that the products they're buying are safe. You will be hearing from commissioners and the chairman of the CPSC. What will be your line of questioning to them? Well, the focus I'm most interested on is the performance of Chairman Scanlon, a rogue regulator who, in my view, has attempted to pervert the mission of the CPSC and, in fact, even from time to time, has perhaps deliberately misled the Congress of the United States. What happens after this hearing now? After this hearing, we go to a markup in which we will vote on the reauthorization of the CPSC. That's the law by which they will be allowed to exist and by which they will function over the next several years. And hopefully we will get the kind of testimony we need to create a CPSC that's stronger, that focuses on specific products uh, such as uh, butane lighters, uh, children's sleepwear and the like, and to ensure uh, ultimately that the majority of the commission, which I think is interested in consumer protection, gets a chance to work their will. That was Congressman Eckert. We then had an opportunity to talk to Terrence Scanlon, the chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, who gave us his views on the reauthorization legislation. There are two bills, as you know. There's one in the Senate and there's one in the House. Uh, I would much prefer the Senate version of a bill. On the House side, I would prefer the Dannemeyer uh, bill uh, over the Chairman Florio's bill. Why the Dannemeyer bill? What does it do? Well, yeah, he calls for a single administrator, which I think uh, is, is a good idea. I think the commission should be uh, under the aegis of one person. There would be better accountability. Uh, I think also uh, Mr. Dannemeyer's bill uh, keeps the commission pretty much intact as it is now. I think the commission works pretty well. Uh, obviously, we have some problems that uh, any regulatory body would have, but I think it works pretty well. We also spoke with Congressman William Dannemeyer, the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, about his legislation. It will uh, implement a recommendation of the General Accounting Office to transfer the function of CPSC to a uh, department or within HHS. It will also uh, change the existing provision for five commissioners and place a single uh, administrator in charge, which, are, which is designed to, I think, improve the efficiency of the, of the uh, organization. It will also uh, uh, not implement uh, recommendations of an alternative bill authored by Mr. Florio that in effect micromanages uh, the agency. I just don't think we in Congress have any business uh, specifying what should be done with three or four or five products. We frankly don't have the time to do all that. What we're witnessing really in this whole fight, if I may put it that way, is, is just uh, rehashing the November 1980 and the November 1984 election all over again. Uh, Liberal Democrats here in Congress uh, believe that uh, they won the election in November 1984, and uh, they're trying to tell the American public that by passing along Congress, by expanding CPSC's jurisdiction, that somehow we can uh, reduce or eliminate accidents that take place in our country from the use of products. Uh, that's simply not true. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to have accidents in our society. Uh, we, we can't very well pass a law to outlaw accidents, although some people here on here might uh, suggest we can do that. And uh, this struggle is going on between these two philosophical points of view. Um, the Reagan administration has reduced uh, modestly the budget for CPSC. The existing commissioners, I think, are doing a responsible job. They're not doing as much as some of the liberal Democrats on that subcommittee want to be done. Uh, but that's part of the political dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now we take you to the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee, chaired by Congressman James Florio. Senator Alphonse D'Amato of New York is the first witness, followed by Representatives George Miller and Larry Craig. Let me uh, apologize for the delay. One of our witnesses is not here yet, but will he'll hopefully join us before too long. And out of respect for the schedules of all of our witnesses and the members, we'll start our hearing. I'd like to welcome all in attendance to today's subcommittee hearing. 
which is going to consider legislation that's been introduced to reauthorize the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I, along with eight of my colleagues on this 15-member subcommittee, have introduced H.R. 3343. This legislation would restructure and reauthorize the Consumer Product Safety Commission and seeks to address the very serious problems with the Commission's performance and leadership which the subcommittee has found to exist in the series of hearings that we have uh, conducted over the last number of months. It's clear to me that the public's and the Congress's patience is running out with um, regard to agencies that don't do their job. About two weeks ago on the House floor, the um, House of Representatives rejected an effort to assign to the Federal Trade Commission um, advertising, unfair advertising jurisdiction over um, aviation matters, notwithstanding the fact that the FTC clearly has that jurisdictional area. I think in large measure because people are dissatisfied with the FTC. This week, another subcommittee of this Congress, or this committee, is going to be taking up a proposal to re-regulate the railroads in large measure because of dissatisfaction with the performance of the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which our chairman of our full committee has described as being brain dead. Well, it seems to me that we're coming to the end of the uh, period of time when a laissez-faire approach to public responsibilities was, uh, was willing to be tolerated. The legislation that we are addressing today is designed to address the obvious problems that exist at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The legislation will improve the Commission's administrative structure by making both the chairman and the staff more responsive to the Commission as a whole. The legislation will improve the regulatory process by requiring the Commission to begin the regulatory process if there is a significant risk of injury associated with a product and a safety rule would reduce the risk. This would serve as an incentive for the development of meaningful voluntary standards. This commission would improve, the legislation rather, would improve the role that the states can play. If the commission is unwilling to act, the states would be able to step in to protect consumers more readily. In response to evidence and testimony that we've had at past subcommittee hearings about the Consumer Product Safety Commission's failure to deal adequately with the hazards of particular products, the legislation will improve the way the Commission deals with certain particular products, such as all-terrain vehicles, disposable lighters, and lawn docks. Just on a, as a parenthetical note, it's interesting to uh, observe that since our last hearing, the confirmed death toll with regard to all-terrain vehicles was at that point 696 deaths. Between March 2nd and June 8th, there were 93 more deaths an average of almost 30 per month, making a total of 789. At the conservative rate of 20 deaths a month, the death toll now reaches 880. The subcommittee will also consider today H.R. 3443, a bill introduced by our colleague from California, Mr. Dannemeyer. This legislation would abolish the Consumer Product Safety Commission and transfer its functions to the Department of Health and Human Services. It would also make further changes in the Commission's ability to inform the public about unsafe products. I'm hopeful that the witnesses today will address the two bills pending before the subcommittee, along with their views uh, with regard to the Commission's performance in general. We have a long hearing. We have a long list of distinguished witnesses. The testimony has been presented to the committee in advance in accordance with the rules. I trust that the members have had an opportunity to go through the testimony. And therefore, all of the formal testimony will put in, be put into the record in its entirety, and the witnesses may feel free to proceed in a summary fashion. We would ask them to attempt to limit their presentations to about 10 minutes. I would like to yield to the gentleman from Texas at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, proud to be a sponsor of H.R. 3343, uh, the legislation that you and several others of this subcommittee have introduced. Uh, later in today's hearing, we'll hear testimony from one of my constituents, uh, Mrs. Ann Settle of uh, Burleson, Texas. Her young son, Adam, uh, was tragically killed uh, several years ago on an ATV. Uh, I'm most concerned about uh, 
these vehicles. I think it's a misnomer when they're called all-terrain vehicles and they can tip over and kill people uh, traveling at slow speeds on level ground. I look forward to the testimony. I'm sure that the panels are going to be very informative and I'm hopeful that the result of this hearing and perhaps one or two others will be legislation that uh, does something about these, uh, these vehicles that kill our nation's children. Thank you very much. Gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we in Congress uh, are supposed to be uh, experts on arms control, defense, monetary policy, problems in Central America, health care matters, energy policy, and I suppose some of us may qualify for expert status on all of those, but I don't, and I'll admit it. And I only mention this to give it perspective in the sense that if a member of Congress has enough knowledge to be able to micromanage an executive branch of the government so as to precise what is to happen with a particular product, uh, I'd like to meet that person because uh, I don't know how they sleep. I don't know how Congress, members of Congress, can ever get involved in telling an executive branch of government what regulations to adopt for what products that are on the supermarket shelves of America. I'm not suggesting that CPSC shouldn't look at these products. I'm just suggesting that we're going down the wrong road, Mr. Chairman, when we attempt to micromanage specific products in legislation as is in your bill. And also, we should be very understanding of what we're about when we change the whole scope of what CPSC does in terms of its threshold jurisdiction. Right now, it's unreasonable risk of injury. When we move to significant risk of injury, we're going to substantially increase the products that can be looked at by the Commission. I'm not sure that's sound policy, and from a philosophical point of view, I'm not suggesting we live in a perfect world, but the way our system works is that when people are injured as a result of faulty products placed on the market, the existing tort litigation system compensates victims in an adequate way. No amount of money will ever compensate any victim for a loss of a limb or a life of a loved one. No amount of money. But my point is, this existing system of compensation in the tort litigation field has a beneficial salutary effect on any producer of a product that wants to produce in the interstate commerce a, a defective product for two reasons. One, it hurts their profit line. Second, it hurts their ability to get product liability insurance. And those factors redound to the benefit of we consumers in America. We should be careful about wandering down the road that by legislation we're going to create a federal agency that's going to protect every consumer in America against every conceivable injury or tragic death. Because if we suggest that to the people of this country, we're blowing smoke <coughs> in their face. And I don't choose to be a part of that effort. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from California. Well, the gentleman you. yield for a minute. Yeah. Just, to respond to the, just to respond to a point that was raised, it was a very legitimate observation with regard to the appropriate role of government um, in these areas and the appropriate role of the Congress. Obviously, we are charged with the responsibility of spelling out policy. We spell out policy in all the areas the gentleman very clearly uh, talked about, but then we have a responsibility of seeing that the policy is carried out. What this whole discussion is about is whether the policy, the policy of ensuring safe products is being carried out in an effective way. So that our oversight responsibilities dictate that we go and periodically review the implementation of the policy that we have spelled out. And when in policy is not being carried out, then of course we have a responsibility to reauthorize and conceivably restructure the mechanism for carrying out that policy that we are charged with carrying out. So I appreciate the gentleman's observations, but I think what it is that's happening here today is not incompatible with the system and the process as it's clearly spelled out and understood by, I think, most mainstream Americans. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. The gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, think these are important uh, hearings on the reauthorization. It's been 
been my view in the five years that I've been in Congress that basically the regulatory bodies, not just in the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, but throughout the federal government have been quite inept and inefficient in most cases. We have problems with the ICC not regulating uh, the shippers. We have problems with the FAA. The, the airport's uh, scheduling is in uh, chaos. And right on down the line, it's, it's not a question of micromanagement which occurs, but, but that we really we're not having any strong regulation being enforced as an oversight throughout government. Uh, for example, an amendment I may offer on this bill that has to do with the exemption of tobacco, number one killer in America today, the most preventable health a problem we face, and it's exempt from any regulation by either Consumer Product Safety or Food and Drug Administration. So. Uh, I think these are uh, timely and uh, significant hearings, and I commend you for holding them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are now pleased to move to our witnesses, and we're particularly pleased to have one of our colleagues from the other house uh, on the other side of the Capitol. Uh, Senator D'Amato has been a very outspoken um, uh, supporter of the need to uh, review the authorization and has gone uh, further than perhaps some of us would go in expressing his concerns about the status quo. So we're pleased now to have uh, Senator Alphonse D'Amato, United States Senator from the state of New York. Senator, welcome to our committee. Uh, any statement you have will be put into the record in its entirety. You may feel free to proceed as you see fit. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you and the members of your subcommittee. And I appear before you today because of my concern for the children of America. My grandson, Gregory, who is nearly two years old. My concern for senior citizens represented today here by the AARP. My concern for all American consumers who deserve the full benefits of consumer legislation, such as the Consumer Product Safety Act, which was carefully enacted for their protection. Mr. Chairman, let me commend you for your leadership it's necessary, and the oversight, it's necessary, and the goings on in the Consumer Product Safety Commission have been shocking, to say the least. As lawmakers, we have a responsibility to do everything possible to ensure that the tragedies that have been fallen, befallen so many American families, such as David Snow and Mr. and Mrs. John Settle, who will be appearing before you later this morning, do not continue reoccurring. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is a small agency with a critically important job of protecting consumers from unreasonable risks of injury associated with 15,000 consumer products. Each year, there are approximately 30,000 deaths associated with consumer products. And the persons who have been appointed to run this agency, Mr. Chairman, have an enormous responsibility that cannot be taken lightly, and that should not be politicized. Let me stress that again. That should not be politicized. And there is no doctrine, whether it be the Reagan doctrine or the Carter doctrine or anyone else's doctrine, as it relates to the running of an agency. There is statutory law. There's common sense. There's decency. There's the obligation that comes with that under the mantle of the creation of this agency. And let me suggest that I have never heard anyone in the administration or from the Reagan administration from on high suggest to me that the agency should be disbanded. And Mr. Chairman, that's exactly what the commissioner of the agency has been bent upon doing as a result of his administrative actions within the agency, and as a result of the manner in which the agency has conducted itself since it has come under his stewardship. Since it was established in 1973, Mr. Chairman, the Commission has been fortunate to have outstanding presidential appointees dedicated to the safety mission of the agency. Former commissioners such as David Piddle, Susan King, Stuart Statler, John Byington, Nancy Stewart's may have had differences over the most effective means of achieving product safety 
but each and every one of them clearly understood the mandate of the agency. And these individuals, Mr. Chairman, took to heart the meaning of the oath of office. They took to uphold the laws of the United States. Safety never became a partisan or ideological issue. Under their leadership, the agency made significant progress, relying on the expertise of a dedicated career staff. Unfortunately, that situation is radically different today. Quite frankly, this agency is in a terrible mess. Now, you may ask why I've offered an amendment to the HUD Independent Agency's appropriation bill that cuts $250,000 from fiscal year 1988 in order to provide funds for a national cemetery in Albany, New York. Well, first, I feel the cemetery is a worthwhile project. But just as important are my serious concerns about CPSC's present leadership. Under its present chairman, Mr. Scanlon, the commission has earned an unenvi unenviable reputation as a nest of political infighters. If even half the reports circulating in the media and the government are true, it's become a place where the mission of the agency's safety has taken a back seat to intrigue. Frankly, Mr. Chairman, I thought the money more appropriately spent on a resting place for our honored veterans than in funding the political wars at CPSC. The Senate agreed and unanimously passed my amendment to cut funding for the agency's political staffers. Well, let's examine the record. Since Mr. Scanlon became chairman in July 1986, the agency has not issued any new major safety regulations and has not filed any major enforcement actions. Many persons in this room today are concerned about the safety of the all-terrain vehicles. Over the last five years, there have been 789 deaths as associated with the ATVs and 310,000 estimated hospital emergency rooms treated injuries. 55 of these deaths, Mr. Chairman, have occurred in my state, New York, the second highest death toll nationwide. Nearly half of the deaths and injuries have been to children under the age of 16. 1985, the estimated death and injury cost was over $1 billion. These alarming statistics prompted a majority of the commission to vote to bring an imminent hazard enforcement action to resolve the problem. Chairman Scanlon dissent, dissented from this action. We know about Chairman's dissent since it was somehow leaked to the press and the industry. The Commission referred the case to the Justice Department in February 1987, seeking help because it lacked the resources to bring this kind of complex case itself. Now, what's happened since then? Unfortunately, not much. The Commission began an intensive study of the ATV hazards in April 1985, and over two and a half years ago, voted to bring the action in December 1986, over 10 months ago. It's now over eight months since the case with extensive supporting documentation was referred to the Justice Department. The Commission still has not been officially notified by the Justice Department that it will litigate on behalf of the Commission. However, Mr. Chairman, I have been personally assured by Justice Department officials in the last few days that this matter will be given their highest priority. Each month, there are 20 additional ATV deaths and 7,000 estimated ATV injuries. And the only beneficiaries of this pattern of inaction are the Honda people, Yamaha, Kawasaki, Suzuki, and other members of the ATV industry. And the families of the victims and the victims themselves seem to be forgotten. Now, who's to blame for this shameful delay? Certainly, a large share of the blame belongs to the chairman, Mr. Scanlon. Our chairman is legitimately entitled to dissent from the commission decision. However, Scanlon's actions and inactions appear here to have gone beyond dissent and suggest, frankly, a deliberate effort to undermine the majority's decision. The fact of the enforcement action was somehow prematurely leaked to the industry in January 1987. Mr. Scanlon, ignoring the concerns of the other commissioners about the leaks, refused to conduct any investigation. The leak gave the eight TV industry advanced knowledge of the agency's plans and time to lobby the Justice Department not to take the case. In June of this year, Mr. Scanlon appeared to simply ignore a May 27th decision, again of the majority of the commissioners, 
that would have expanded the authority of the two CPSC attorneys on the AT litigation team. He summarily removed the team. Well, Mr. Chairman, a short while ago, there was the question as to whether we're trying to manage the affairs of a particular department or a commission. Let me suggest to you that there comes before those of us as legislators these kinds of activities. And I would suggest that it is absolutely imperative and appropriate for your committee to look in and to review these kinds of matters. And so I reject the idea of an attempt by congressmen to attempt to, to manage an agency, but I also reject the kind of mismanagement and the kind of deliberate thwarting of legislative initiatives or legal initiatives that should be undertaken when it becomes so apparent. And that's what the record reveals. He summarily removed the team of two attorneys selected by the commissioners and before, and, uh, before Graham and Dawson several days before. And then he appointed attorneys who, were, who, who had absolutely no experience, who had never handled this matter, so as to thwart this investigation. Mr. Scanlon's sorry product safety record isn't confined to ATVs. It's extended into many other areas, and especially those involving infants and children. For example, he voted against enforcement actions to address the suffocation hazards with mesh-sided playpens and cribs where there were 11 dead children, seven of whom were six weeks old or younger. He also voted against enforcement actions to address strangulation hazards with children's enclosures where there were three deaths, and choking hazards with infant squeeze toys where there were two deaths. Mr. Scanlon's personnel shifts at the commission have disrupted not only the ATV effort, but other enforcement activities as well. And over the objections of Commissioners Graham and Dawson, he removed David Schmelzer, the well-respected 11-year head of enforcement, and replaced him with a non-lawyer. Effective yesterday, Mr. Scanlon reinstated David Schmelzer as head of the enforcement, one day before your hearing, Mr. Chairman. And although it's encouraging that Mr. Scanlon changed course in this instance, the overall picture is still a sorry one. We deserve, and the country deserves, a chairman who thinks about product safety every day of the year, not just the day before the reauthorization hearing. What then can be done to improve this situation? Mr. Chairman, Section 103B of your bill contains a critically important provision, that in making appointments to the commission, the president should at least consider individuals with experience in the safety of consumer products or in related fields. This consideration should be a requirement. Your bill also contains important provisions addressing the structure of the agency. And I commend your willingness not to pledge allegiance to a structure that is now failing the American public. The major reason we are being let down, however, is because the agency is under the leadership, unfortunately, of someone who appears bent on scuttling the federal product safety regulation and the law by resolving every statutory ambiguity against the consumer and invading the legitimate, evading the legitimate purposes of the act. It can only be said that Mr. Scanlon has not followed his oath of office and has let down the Reagan administration and all American consumers. Closing, Mr. Chairman, I urge you to continue your efforts to address the serious safety problems at this troubled agency. And I certainly pledge to you my full cooperation in this undertaking. Thank you very much, Senator. Obviously, you've done an awful lot of research because you have tracked the, the clear course of events at the agency over the last number of years in a very accurate way as, as far as I'm concerned. I would just warn you not to take a lot of um, pleasure in being informed even within the last few days that this is the highest priority on the Justice Department's um, agenda. The same words were used to us at our hearing in June. That was 90 deaths ago on the all-terrain vehicle. So you should not derive a whole lot of satisfaction out of that type of representation um, that was made to you. I guess my only observation is, and this might be in, in partial response to the gentleman from California, um, Mr. Dannemeyer earlier saying, quite correctly, that if there are unsafe products and they result in injuries to people, there is always the tort law system whereby people can get their, um, their compensation. But as I think most people know, there is a movement in, in, the, in the Congress and across the country 
to reform uh, the, uh, the product liability laws particularly. And as this committee, this very committee, reviews in a good faith effort those laws to see if there are things that can be done to change those laws, it is totally unsatisfactory and totally unacceptable to be seeing the agency that up front is supposed to be um, ensuring the fact that products are safe, that that agency isn't doing anything. And at the other end of the scale, or the other end of the liability spectrum, you've got a situation where some are asking for reductions in the capability to have people to have access to the courts. You can't do that. That will result in business and social anarchy when you just tell people that there's no one looking before the fact of injury, and then after the fact of injury, you will not have ready access uh, to seek, uh, seek remedies. So I think this is very much related, and all in the audience should be aware of the fact that this hearing and this subject is very related to product liability reform and efforts to uh, make changes in those laws have to be uh, linked with regard to our, our process here. I want to express my appreciation to you for your participation and, and recognize the gentleman from Texas, gentleman from California, gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to publicly express my uh, admiration for the senator who speaks out on an important issue, consumer uh, product safety for all Americans, but who raises the level of these discussions above partisan differences or uh, infighting and really, I think, gives credibility to these hearings at, and certainly the politically safe position would be to say nothing or do nothing. So I just wanted to commend you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much, Senator. Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, let me say to you that um, I do believe, because I spoke to the Deputy Attorney General who, in regard to this, uh, this mess, this problem, um, and, I, and I take Arne Burns and his word and his commitment very seriously, I really do believe that uh, this, this matter will be handled with the kind of priority and attention that it deserves. I, I um, understand your, um, your suspicion in regard to that, that assurance. Secondly, um, Senator, can I just interrupt on that one point? There are two levels of involvement. One, which has not even been met yet, is the decision to take the case. Once that decision is made, then of course, there are lots of other things that have to be done. We have not, in this long period of time, even got out of the Justice Department the commitment to take the case that the Consumer Product Safety Commission says, at least the majority of the commissioners say, should be undertaken. Um, we have not even gotten that first step. I, I can assure you from my discussions with the Deputy Attorney General that this matter is being pursued now vigorously. And I'm not going to proffer forth what the decision ultimately will be, uh, but I think that they are working in such a manner so as to <coughs> certainly justify. They, they have a legitimate concern as it relates to other actions that were brought in this area. Uh, the FX car, I believe it was. They don't want to see a repetition of that kind of situation. And I can understand that. But secondly, I, I want to commend you again for um, not letting go of this matter, for pursuing it, and it should be pursued in a, in a bipartisan, nonpartisan manner. Uh, because the appointees, the other commissioners on the board, are Reagan appointees. This is not a situation where we're talking about Democrats fighting Republicans. We're talking about commissioners attempting to discharge their responsibilities in, in an effective manner, in a manner that is certainly in the best interest of of all Americans and children in particular as it relates to the ATV case. It's no coincidence that the head of the enforcement division is reappointed or reassigned back to his job the day before this hearing was called. And I say, well, thank God for that. Let's get professionals in. There are cadre and a staff of decent, hardworking professionals. They should be permitted to do their job. And that's what we ask the chairman to undertake and to somehow get out of this zany ideological philosophy that we block even the, the, the most obvious of areas that call for inspection and investigation. And that's what's been taking place. And it's under your leadership, I believe, that, that this cause has focused a great deal of public attention and that we are at least beginning, hopefully, 
to redirect this agency and its priorities and see to it that the professionals are allowed to do their job. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we now are pleased to have a panel of our colleagues um, from the House of Representatives, the Honorable George Miller and the Honorable Larry Craig. We would ask our colleagues to come forward. Appreciate their participation morning. this morning. morning. <laughs> morning. Your statements have made a part of the record in their entirety, and you may feel free to proceed as you see fit. Um, Congressman Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee in support of the legislation to restructure and reauthorize the operation of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The bill you're considering today is a testament to your tireless efforts on behalf of the consumers and that of your committee. And I want to address its impact on children in light of the Consumer Product Safety Commission's deplorable record in recent years. <laughs> the case of Danny Linewe Lineweaver in my district puts it in a clear focus the failure of the commission to protect even infants. Danny Lineweaver was found by his parents hanging from his crib corner post almost five years ago. Today at age five, he is permanently disabled as a direct result of that accident. An industry standard was agreed to just two years ago, but it is voluntary and does not fully address the hazard. It allows the production of cribs with corner posts on which children can still hang themselves and children continue to be killed and injured in this way. I am proud that my constituents have formed the Line Weaver Foundation to bring attention to this issue, to warn parents of the danger of infant cribs, and to provide information on who to call if an accident occurs. Members of the foundation, however, are dismayed at the Commission's failure in this area, and they have commissioned Temple University to study the threat posed by, by current crib corner post standards, and I anxiously await their results. The Consumer Safety Improvement Act corrects many of the weaknesses in our nation's consumer safety laws. Fifteen years ago, the Consumer Product Safety Commission was established to protect the consumer from dangerous products, to aid them in evaluating product safety and to establish uniform safety standards, and to help investigate ways to prevent product-related injuries. Fifteen years later, there is still a crisis in consumer confidence and a special danger to children, the most vulnerable of our consumers. Too often when it comes to taking decisive action against the product that endangers young people, Americans get delay, deferral, and an abdication of authority. All Americans, but especially our nation's children, suffer. A great many of the products that make it to the supermarket shelves or to toy stores are used by children who do not discover the danger until it is too late. Lawn darts have injured over 6,000 people in eight years. A great majority of them are under age 15, but compliance has been virtually non-existent. The Commission recently found that in 21 of 22 cases, manufacturers had not complied with the regulations. With the regulations. All-terrain vehicles used largely by youths have been killing 20 people or injuring 7,000 people each month but no standard, either voluntary or mandatory, has yet been developed. 125 children under the age of five die each year as accidents involving cigarette lighters, and the Commission's own staff has acknowledged that the current voluntary standard is inadequate to protect these children. But as of yet, no regulatory action has been taken. I am very pleased that these three product hazards are specifically addressed in this reform measure that you have authored. There are several other children's products that present serious danger because of the do-nothing policy adopted by this commission. The six-year-old constituent of mine was permanently disabled because he almost drowned under a pool cover. At least 26 deaths have occurred under similar accidents, but today there's still no standards to address the danger of pool covers. No standard other than a weak industry guideline has been issued to address the dangers of bunk beds, even though 23 deaths have resulted and injuries have increased dramatically. A cancer-causing agent has been reduced in baby pacifiers by the Food and Drug Administration, but the Commission still allows a higher level. I hope to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and the subcommittee to address my concerns in these areas as they affect children. The Select Committee on Children, Youth, and Families, which I chair, has investigated the issues of child protection. The unmistakable conclusion we made is that failure to take reasonable steps to protect children is extremely expensive for the U.S. taxpayer and for the country as a whole that failure by the Commission in just four of the above areas cost an estimated billion dollars a year in lawsuits, medical bills, lost lives, and work. Accidents on all-terrain vehicles were estimated to cost as much as a staggering $2.8 billion in 1985. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act 
which would make the chairman more responsible to the commission's whole and establish important guidelines in developing meaningful voluntary standards and mandate greater state and local involvement enforcement efforts. By taking these steps, we insist that the commission live up to the mandate it was given in 1972. This bill will save American families and their children a lot of money, but more importantly, it will save us the pain and the sorrow of the unnecessary deaths and injuries from preventable injuries. And I thank you again for your efforts on behalf of the consumers and the children of this country. Thank you very much. Congressman Craig. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the uh, subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to express my views on the Consumer Product Safety Commission's past performance and the issue of re its reauthorization. I think it is most appropriate for this committee to review the questions of management and the criticality of that management as it relates to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and you are doing so through a responsible and a legitimate course. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I have maintained a position that despite the best intentions of Congress and the federal regulators, we cannot produce a risk-free society. We cannot legislate a risk-free society, nor should we try to enforce one in total. Nevertheless, in some circumstances, Congress has found it necessary to establish federal agencies to protect us from certain products. As you know, we did so in 1972. We established the Consumer Product Safety Commission, formed under the Consumer Product Safety Act. The intent of Congress at that time was fourfold. To protect the public against unreasonable risk of injury associated with consumer products. To assist consumers in evaluating, I repeat, to assist consumers in evaluating the comparative safety of consumer products and to minimize conflicting state and local regulations. I think that's an important one because to date, or at least to this moment this morning, somehow we have left out the role of responsible state and local government in the area of human safety. They too have a responsibility, Mr. Chairman. Thirdly, to develop uniform safety standards to consume for consumer products and to minimize conflicting state and local regulations. That was part of the debate in 1972, to bring together some continuity and some conformity to the whole process of determining what may or may not be safe for the consuming public. And fourthly, to promote research and investigation into the cause and prevention of product-related deaths, illnesses, and injuries. At that time, Mr. Chairman, Congress wanted to get out of business the business of micromanaging consumer products because to that date we had been doing so. Perceiving this still to be the sentiment of Congress, I believe it will, I could not support your legislation. In reading it, I find that it appears to be approaching that direction. I personally will not support certain portions of it where clearly the effort at micromanagement is there and that is in the area of ATVs. It would not be prudent for this Congress to blunder into the consumer product safety issues that more appropriately should be resolved either by the Consumer Product uh, Safety Commission Cooperative Education, Consumer Product Safety Commission Industrial Negotiations, or judicial review in the courts. Congress does not have a response, does have a responsibility, Mr. Chairman, however, to ensure that its agencies like the Consumer Product Safety Commission do not overstep their boundaries or exceed their congressional mandate. In doing so, we ensure that these agencies do not encroach upon the freedoms uh, provided our citizens to make informed decisions as outlined in our laws and our Constitution. Between 1973 and 1984, it appears that the Consumer Product Safety Commission, in its zeal for safety, regulating uh, overstepped its bounds. During that era, at least nine commission mandatory standards and or actions banning hazardous products were successfully countered in the courts. Only two Consumer Product Safety Commission rules were left totally intact following judicial review. And yet no one talks to the kind of damage that oftentimes arbitrary decision-making brought 
to a certain segment of our society. For some reason, this Congress or other Congresses tended to find that acceptable. I do not, Mr. Chairman. For example, in 1983, the case of Gulf South Insulation versus the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission, the Commission's six-year study and rulemaking proceedings banned the use of foam insulation in residences and schools, uh, was dismissed because the Commission failed to produce substantial evidence necessary to support its rulemaking. Despite the fact that the ban was later struck down, it nearly destroyed the urea formaldehyde industry. Well, we have a dual responsibility, Mr. Chairman, this Congress, I believe, this government, not only to the consumer, but to the person or the individuals who are willing to provide a product to the consumer. It nearly destroyed that industry, and for those who owned homes who had that type of insulation in it, the industry or the standard was that that home was devalued by $15,000, when later it was found that that home was not unnecessarily unsafe. Through sufficient financial resources, the, this in, in insulation industry was fortunate to have the means to defend itself against a government agency with millions of tax dollars at its disposal, Mr. Chairman. This case, though, raises serious concern about our nation's small businesses. Let me tell you what's happening in my district right now. I have a manufacturer of a product, a product that will go unmentioned other than to say there are tens of thousands of this individual's product on the market and not one injury recorded to date. And yet an agency of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, this do-nothing commission as so described by this committee, recently saw that product on the shelf, made the arbitrary decision that it appeared to be unsafe appeared to be unsafe and started to review a process that may ultimately cost this producer thousands of dollars and take his product from the market. I've been asked to look into it, representing that particular manufacturer. I'll work that one out with the Consumer Products Agency or the Con Consumer Products Commission. But what I am suggesting, Mr. Chairman, is that somehow there must be a middle ground and that we simply cannot have the attitude that we can arbitrarily go out there because something might appear to be unsafe and squash a business on the sidewalk as if it were a bug. That should not be the role of this agency. If the Consumer Product Safety Commission is to advance the cause of true consumer protection, it must learn from its lessons of the past, and we wonder why it has not yet to, uh, as yet reacted to date to the ATV issue. Maybe it's because the Justice Department is a little concerned that the last time they were brought into an issue similar to this by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, better known as the U.S. versus General Motors, they got beaten court. And the reason they got beaten court, because they didn't do their homework, they did not do the proper analysis, and they said, could simply can, could not confirm the findings that had been produced as a result of the arguments involved. I think that's really the issue at hand, Mr. Chairman. To keep the record balanced and fair, the, con the Commission should be congratulated on some of its positive accomplishments. To date, it appears, at least in front of this committee, that there have been none. A recent example is the Commission's implementation of Operation Toyland, a substantive preventative program that will keep many dangerous imported toys off the department store shelves for Christmas. According to a National Journal article, this year, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has seized 10 times the number of unsafe imported toy products as it did last year. This program is of profound significance to, quote, the young, innocent consumers of America and certainly to the well-being of the public, and I congratulate them on that effort. In reference to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Mr. Chairman, and in conclusion, uh, I think it is important for this government to have an agency that is an advocate for the consumer, that will review the safety standards that we insist upon for safe products in the marketplace. I believe that it is the Consumer Product Safety Commission's mission to assist consumers in making those kinds of evaluations. It should not, however, become the big brother to freedom of product choice. I will endorse the Commission in providing uniform standards for industry, but again I oppose subjective uh, governmental intervention.
I applaud substantive research and investigation into causes and preventions of product-related deaths and injuries, but I expect the Consumer Products Commission finding to be uh, substantive and conclusive. The Consumer Product Safety Commission can be an effective agency if it operates within the statutory mandates that it currently has under the 1972 Act and the laws that we have prescribed in the area of consumer safety. Mr. Chairman, one other brief observation. Last year there were 474,000 baseball accidents. Young people, the future of this country, out playing baseball, injured. Bicycling, 385,000. Swimming, 136,000. Roller skating, 112,000. ATVs, 85,900. And a substantive decline in ATV injuries as a result of the visibility of this issue as produced by the Consumer Product Safety Commission to date, whether they were right or wrong. 11% decline in those injuries in 85 and 13% in 1986. Well, I suggest that there are things happening out there and there are other areas that may not have the political buzz to them or the, or the items that catch the headlines. But I suggest if you try, as the Consumer Product Safety has with ATVs, to remove bicycles from the market or roller skates or sleds, that maybe the point of view of Congress might be different. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for an opportunity to testify before your committee. Thank you very much to, uh, to both of our witnesses. And obviously, there's a different perspective between our two witnesses and other members in the, in, in the Congress. But I, I have to just say, at least the majority of the members of this subcommittee uh, are not prepared to in any way uh, acquiesce in the observation that there's been an uh, over-exuberant zeal for safety out of the Commission um, over the last number of years. It is fairly clear to me personally, and I think to other members of the, of the Congress, that the approach that's been followed by the committee is woefully inadequate in about three or four different regards. I mean, the deference to voluntary standards that in some instances don't exist, uh, or in other instances that the commission itself has said were woefully inadequate and no action has been taken, in the ATV situation to give one example. The whole question about uh, voluntary standards that are in effect, that are not complied with by the people that created the voluntary standard, in the instance of the disposable lighter, and the instance where we have mandatory standards that are not enforced, um, in the instance of lawn darts, are clear examples of where the entire system that the agency is operating under is literally falling apart in each and every, each and every dimension. That, I think, um, forces the Congress to look very, very seriously at the deficiencies in the current structure, and of course that's what we're trying to do. And we certainly appreciate both uh, of, of our witnesses here giving their perspective, but I think it is beyond the realm of even legitimate debate to say that we are going to accept the status quo. Which direction we'll move, how it is we restructure, I think is the major thing that the Congress will be looking at, and um, that almost appears to be a matter of um, almost universal, universal acceptance. And we're hopeful that within the confines of the various options to change the status quo, we can come to some consensus to move in the correct direction. Let me yield to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate both my colleagues testifying. I'd like to ask uh, several questions to Congressman Craig. Uh, I understand that in, in preparing your testimony or, or, or reviewing legislation uh, in other areas that you asked for some information from the Consumer Product Safety Commission and were told you couldn't have it because you were a member of the minority party and that their, uh, their regulations only allowed information to be released uh, to the majority party. Is that correct? And if so, what possible remedy would you suggest to prevent something like that happening in the future? I thank my colleague from Texas for that question. Yes, there was a time when I did request information from uh, the proceedings of the Consumer Product Safety Commission as it related to its decisions on ATVs, and I was told that because I was not the chairman, I think that's an important distinction, because I was not the chairman of a committee uh, but the minority, uh, that I couldn't have that information. 
and that was a regulation that. Uh, uh, you were the ranking minority member. Well, that's correct. Uh, but uh, that's always just a challenge, and uh, we pre we persisted and ultimately got the information. Uh, and as a result of that, I will say that uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has now is now changing their regulations. Uh, I simply believe that, uh, and I think we have convinced them, uh, that every member of Congress uh, should have access to the information of its government. Now, I will agree that there are sensitive times, and certainly when an agency like the Consumer Products Commission is pursuing a finding that may ultimately end up in major litigation, but they have to be very cautious, and they need to assure that those who have access to the information be very cautious. Well, they found out that I was. There were no leaks. We investigated. We were able to review it. I will have to say that my staff member did go in in the dark of night, uh, simply because it was at the last minute that the information was provided, and he spent all night in the agency reading it. It was late in coming, but we've remedied that. Uh, but I was a bit surprised, uh, and I would hope that if other agencies of the federal government um, are aware that they have similar regulations, that they ought to be changing them. Let me ask a little uh, more difficult question. I, based on your testimony, I think, although you and I probably 95 percent of the time agree in our voting records on the ATV issue, I think we uh, are about 180 degrees apart. And you rattle off some statistics about baseball injuries and swimming injuries and several others. How many uh, those baseball injuries resulted in death? Any idea? I did say injuries. I did not say death. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I cannot give you those statistics. Well, I will say that one of the great difficulties today, and it seems to be alleged at least or floating out there uh, in a gray cloud uh, as to why justice has not moved swiftly to uh, bring about uh, the voluntary compliance uh, uh, and uh, voluntary uh, turn-in type of approach that CPSC has come up with for ATVs is because there has not been good comparative analysis done. And that's why they got in trouble in the past, that's why they, s and they spent millions of dollars and lost in the courts. Now, uh, the thing that I think is most important in the figures, and remember we can use, all of us can use figures in a, in a, a lot of different ways, is that over 50 percent of the deaths and injuries that have resulted from ATV use have been a direct result of operator negligence. 31 percent from vehicle collision with other vehicles, trucks and cars and other ATVs. The reason you banned a product from the market is it because it is inherently or structurally or mechanically in defect and causing these injuries because of its malfunctioning. You cannot arbitrarily say, in my opinion, that something ought to be banned from the market because the operator is malfunctioning. Well, uh, Congressman, I would hope that you can stay for about another 15 minutes. There's going to be a, a mother of a child that was killed on one of these is going to testify. Mm -hmm. I want, if you would do me the courtesy of staying and listening to her testimony, you may, you may change your opinion. Now, I've been injured playing baseball. You can't see from out in the audience, but that finger got bent because I was playing first base and caught a ball the wrong way. Uh, I've also broken my leg playing football because a 220-pound fullback ran over a 150-pound linebacker. <laughs> so I have been victimized, so to speak, in some of these other sports activities, but there are people, children that are killed riding ATVs not because they're not being operated safely, not because they're not being supervised, but to paraphrase your own words, the three-wheel ATVs at a minimum are structurally defective. They're, un they're unbalanced. They're not safe. And if you'll do me the favor of just waiting and listening to this testimony, uh, you may change your opinion, well, and I yield back to the Mr. Chairman. Uh, Barton, I would do you that favor if you would ask that individual witness a couple of questions. First of all, I think it's important to find out whether it was 150 cc or greater. Uh, was it a child ATV or was it an adult ATV? Was the child 14 years of age or younger? And if they were, that parent was told that that child should not be on that vehicle, nor should that child have been allowed 
uh, should that parent acquire that vehicle for that child. Now, those kinds of regulations are already in the marketplace. The problem is we cannot, as a government, become parents for parents. I agree with that. And there are a lot of kids that are killed today, sadly enough, on two-wheel motorcycles for whatever reasons, two-wheelers, motorcycles. And maybe it's because they didn't adhere to state laws that say put your helmet on or there wasn't a state law that said put the helmet on or simply because the parent made the decision they'd allow that child to ride when they shouldn't have. And I'm saying where do you draw the line? I think that's the fundamental question that has to be asked. Time, if you'll, yeah. <coughs> the time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from California. I'd like to ask Mr. Miller a question. When it comes to the uh, possession or use of what could be described as a toy, who properly should make that decision, the parent or the government? I think it differs in, in, in different cases. I think in the, in the, uh, in the case where, where it's possible that you don't appreciate the inherent danger, as I think in some cases TVs is the case, I think the government has, has an obligation to, p to make sure that that information is in fact provided and provided in a meaningful way. In other cases, uh, I think it's inherent on its face of the activity that the child is undertaking and that, that's the role for the parent. I don't think it's a question either or. It's a question in some cases, can the government be helpful to, uh, to parents or to children? And in other cases, wh whether they augment that, uh, that knowledge and supplement that knowledge, it's, it's not a question of, 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 uh, of substituting uh, one's judgment for another. I mean, I find cases where, where you know, the, the most recent discussion of, case of, ch of young people riding uh, very high-speed, high-powered uh, uh, street racing bikes, uh, were not meant for that kind of street, but road racing bikes, uh, I, I don't understand a parent that would let a 16-year-old uh, ride that way on the, uh, on the streets. And I, I, you know, I just, I'm not sure the government can do much about that. With ATVs, I think it's different. I think it's different because of the notion because this has three wheels or that it's constructed correctly that it can be safe and it's turned out that hasn't been the case. My two sons raced off the road motorcycles. I've ridden off the mo road motorcycles for many years. There's a much different appreciation of that two-wheeled motorcycle than there is in this case. And the notion is I think also that, that simply it's marketed as a toy. That's not a toy. It's not a toy at all. And uh, so I don't, I don't think that you can break this one down. In some cases, uh, I'm absolutely dismayed at the decisions that parents could make, and I'm not sure the government could ever keep them from making that decision because somehow uh, uh, in, in some communities, when I live in, it's a status symbol if you can ride a ninja motorcycle. It's also killing an awful lot of kids, but some parents can't turn down that, that status of having their kids have that kind of uh, well, motorcycle. It, and I don't the think role, the government can is, prevent that. Is it that. the role of government then to say that the manufacture of a product, since parents in America are reluctant to assert discipline over our children, no, but I think it's the also government should say to the manufacturer, you can't produce a product into the flow of commerce? But I also think that, that, that uh, assuming that the parent is, is, is making a decision with the child, it may be, inher it may be important for the government to make sure that the parent has, has the information. Most parents, I dare say, are not experts on how uh, on the speed that, that uh, various size motorcycles will produce and the purpose for which those motorcycles were designed well, and the use for which they're being put. And with putting that information out there is helpful. With all due respect, uh, you know, we've all raised children. I've raised three. And uh, I'm not willing to buy the idea that a parent that loves a child and wants to exercise discipline on that child with common sense can't look at a motorcycle or a vehicle, two-wheel vehicle that's motor-driven and not estimate that it's going to assume some speed in operation. And uh, I think Mr. Craig's point is well taken. It is not the function of our government to act as a parent for parents who don't care enough for their kids to supervise them. That is not the attempt at all. Well, That's I not what the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, has done. That is not its role. That's not its legislative mandate. And that has not been the outcome of its actions. And if it were the parent of our children, we'd have a hell of a lot more children dying and being injured because it's been so damn negligent. Well, we may have a difference of opinion about yeah, that. Apparently Thank we you. do. <laughs> Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from California, Mr. Bates. <coughs> 
No, no comments at this time. Gentleman from Ohio. Well, I would just uh, comment on my colleague, uh, member of the committee, Mr. Dannemeyer's uh, exchange with Mr. Miller, who uh, I guess reflects Mr. Frank's view that uh, the right to life begins at conception and ends at birth. Uh, children, I think, uh, uh, whatever philosophical perspective one has, uh, in the course of their uh, conduct and contact with a wide variety of devices, uh, some of which can or can't, uh, they, they either are or aren't able of, of, of handling, uh, perhaps do need some parental uh, guidance. And sometimes that parental guidance extends beyond the home. I know it extends to the classroom where my son is this morning. It extends to the playroom, uh, playground where he will be in about uh, uh, 40 minutes. And uh, I suspect it also s extends to the ball field. And perhaps it also extends uh, to a uh, ATV dealership in Fairfax County where my staff went with an eight-year-old boy and was sold or attempted to be sold uh, an ATV vehicle uh, twice the size for his capabilities. The question isn't uh, one of, of, of parents. The question isn't one of the role of the government. I think the question is the one of uh, properly ascertaining what we want those uh, who are least capable of making decisions uh, to have in their grasp when they make that decision. I have no additional questions. Let me uh, thank the witnesses and just make one last observation. Uh, just to keep in perspective what we're talking about on the all-terrain vehicle, this commission has already made the decision that the existing voluntary standards are not adequate, and this is not a particularly aggressive commission to start with. They made the decision that the existing voluntary standards are not adequate. They made the decision that there should be uh, initiatives taken with regard to mandatory regulations. They have the capability um, on the law of enforcing that. Unfortunately, they don't have the resources. They don't have the capability of going forward. This commission has taken a greater proportional cut in resources over the last six or seven years than any other agency in the government. So the idea that the Justice Department is sitting out there evaluating whether this is a case to bring, the commission, if it had the resources, could bring the case and decided to bring the case. They don't have the resources, therefore they turn hat in hand to the Justice Department to bring the case that the Commission could bring the case if they had the resources to do. So the case has already been determined by the agency of expertise as being meritorious enough to pursue. We have been trying to get the Justice Department to focus on the first threshold question, yes, we will take the case. We have not been able to get that done. So I just want to make it clear that we're not discussing whether there is merit to the case or not. The commission that is the agency that makes the determination has already made that. We're just trying to get someone to pick up the ball and run with it in this instance. So I think on the all-terrain vehicle question, this is not something that somebody's making substantive decisions about. We're talking about a procedural decision to take the case that the agency already says is, is meritorious and should be taken. So I want to just express my appreciation to both witnesses uh, for their participation, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. We are now going to move to our next panel of witnesses, which is made up of two um, citizens, two groups of citizens. I would like to have Mr. David Snow of Riverside, California, come forward, and Mr. and Mrs. Uh, John L. Settle of uh, Burleson, Texas, come forward. Mr. Snow, we are very pleased to have you back again to our committee. And I would ask um, our colleague from Texas perhaps to um, acknowledge and introduce the settles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the summer of 1985, I was in my office one evening reading my daily mail, and I came across a letter from a youngster in Burleson, Texas. Uh, the young man's letter stated that his best friend had recently been killed when a ATV vehicle had uh, flipped over and crushed his chest and crushed him to death. And the, the letter in, you know, scrawled in a, in a childish scrawl indicated how concerned he was about that and what could I do about it. Well, at the time, there wasn't much I could do about it, but I, I called the, uh, the young man and, and talked to him and talked to his family and got the details. The, the letter didn't say who, who the individual was that had been killed. 
and I began to investigate the accident and I contacted the, uh, the manufacturer and gave them an opportunity to uh, explain uh, uh, what had happened in their view of the particular incident. Uh, bottom line was nothing happened uh, and I uh, said that if I ever had an opportunity to make something happen, I would do that. Well, that day has arrived today, Mr. Chairman, thanks to you and this committee and the legislation that you've introduced. And today I want to welcome my constituents, Ann and John Settle from Burleson, Texas. Ann's son, Adam, was tragically killed by a three-wheel all-terrain vehicle two years ago when he was 11 years old. Adam was a good child. He was popular, well-liked by all his teachers and peers. He had been expertly trained to safely operate ATV since he was five years old. At the time of the accident, he was supervised by adults and was traveling at slow pace, ready to stop the vehicle. Through no fault of his own, the vehicle flipped over on top of him. 350 pounds of structurally unsafe equipment crushed him to death. Although a relative in attendance was trained in CPR, he didn't have a chance to be saved. As I investigated the accident, I discovered that ATVs were advertised as children's toys for all-terrain travel. Safety training and notice of risk of injury or death are not provided, were not provided by ATV manufacturers. Industry maintains that roll bars or some safety design feature is not feasible, yet the three-wheel configuration when examined from an engineering standpoint is both laterally and longitudinally unstable. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Specialty Vehicle Institute of America recently issued a special safety alert to warn consumers of the potential operator risk. CPSC Commissioner Ann Graham stated on December the 18th, 1986, that the ATV issue is the most serious problem the Commission has ever discussed. Ninety people died, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, earlier, I believe, before the Ford Motor Company pulled their Pinto automobile off the market. Yet 20 deaths and 7,000 injuries a month are reported related to all-terrain vehicles. Many deaths and injuries go unreported. Think about it. Most accidents occur in rural settings and most rural hospitals are not hooked up to the National Emergency Injury Surveillance System to report the accident. For example, you will not find a record of Adam's death because he was brought to a hospital without the NEISS system. Living in Texas, where many people own ATVs, most of my constituents know of someone hurt or killed by an ATV. No wonder a Japanese manufacturer, manufacturing spokesman recently broke down and cried at a hearing when confronted with the large number of deaths related to ATVs. This is a nightmare. These machines are killing people and people aren't warned. Perhaps the greatest tragedy is that half of the AT victims are children. Lawmakers cannot continue to ignore the problem. To ATV proponents, the problem is a misuse of the ATV and a lack of training to operate the ATV. Adam's case clearly shows that this is not the problem. Adam was trained and was operating the vehicle safely. The problem in Adam's case was the machine itself was unstable. I am proud that Adam's family is here today to share their story and his story with us. These are great people. They've spent their own money to come here to testify and to make a difference. It's too late for Adam, but hopefully we can legislate to save another Adam. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for introducing this bill, and I will do all in my capacity to support its provisions to help legislate away the ATV tragedy. We call ATVs all-terrain vehicles. Mr. Chairman, in my opinion, they're absolutely terrifying vehicles. Thank you very much. And I, too, would like to welcome the Settles as well as Mr. Snow. This is an extremely difficult experience, I'm sure, and because it certainly revives things and thoughts that uh, are not easy. But we appreciate your participation so that we can make the changes uh, in the law to hopefully move in a direction to avoid other people having to experience the difficulties that, that you've experienced. Mr. Snow, why don't we hear from you first, and then we hear from the Settles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you don't mind, I'd like to read Please proceed. my statement. A frightened, crying little girl is trapped underground in a well shaft in Midland, Texas. Get that child out. Save that child, the nation cries. Rescue workers battle feverishly day and night. More equipment is flown in. Thousands watch standing behind police ropes, hoping and praying and crying. From Maine to California, millions are glued to televisions, 12 inches to go, 5 inches to go. Finally, the child emerges in the arms of a rescue worker. 
applause, cheers and tears break out. Thank you, God, the life of a child has been saved. The president calls, the vice president arrives. Elation is the word of the day. Jessica McClure, you are loved by us all. No economist stood at your rescue site with a calculator in one hand and society's willingness to pay data tables in the other and cried out, everybody stop. This rescue is going to cost more than a million dollars. Not worth it. Go home. No cost-benefit analysis for you, Jessica. We are Americans. Any economist who tried that would be saying in soprano now. I remember another precious little girl lying in a hospital bed. I see a doctor slowly shake his head as he turns the respirator off. One last tear rolls down this little girl's soft, sweet face. A mother and a father try to hold each other up as their child is taken away. Another child killed by a lawn dart. The president didn't call. Always infused within us as a nation has been the premise that the health and safety and protection of our children was a paramount concern. Their protection overshadowed all other considerations. However, it's becoming apparent that some of us have other priorities. The Consumer Product Safety Commission has taken it upon themselves to modify their congressional mandate of protecting the public from unsafe and dangerous products. They have turned 180 degrees and now serve to protect the business and industry from the public. That's absurd, you say? I don't think so. After my child was killed by a lawn dart in April of this year, astonishing information has surfaced about this product. Among the most notable are, conservatively, 6,100 lawn dart injuries are treated in the nation's hospital rooms every year. Um, I'll correct that, in the hospital emergency rooms from 1978 to 86, excluding the injuries treated by private physicians are at home. Lawn darts have been around since the mid-1950s. Imagine what the total injury count is. 81% of these injuries are to children from this adult toy. All the known deaths were children. All 14 lawn dart importers were found to be in violation of federal law. As to the required cautionary warning, 30% of the retailers were found to be in violation of the law as to the location of sale of this product. Lawn darts were already banned once by the federal government under the Hazardous Substance Act as a result of death and injuries. Unfortunately, an exemption was carved out after a legal battle with the lawn dart marketers. 300,000 sets of lawn darts are sold annually. Average cost is $5, or $1.5 million in yearly sales. The annual medical cost to treat lawn dart injuries is $5 million. How's that for a cost-benefit analysis? When you have a product where you spend a dollar at the cash register to purchase it, yet you're spending three and a half dollars at the hospital just to treat the same injuries. And this has been going on for years. Lawn darts exert 23,000 pounds per square inch at the tip when dropped from 15 feet. Armed with this information and more, the Commission's chairman, commissioners, and various directorates met on September the 17th 1987 to discuss the various options and courses of actions available to them with respect to lawn darts. What occurred during this meeting was the most incredible exercise of a dysfunctional interchange of ideas, information, and opinion that has ever occurred. These people not only missed the boat, but they were standing at the wrong berth at the wrong port. For example, the majority of directorates opposed the ban of lawn darts. They repeatedly referred to the data contained in a comparison table that was presented at this meeting. Lawn darts were compared to other lawn games. These directors concluded that according to the data that they've seen, lawn darts don't appear to be any more dangerous than other lawn games. The games of comparison were archery, badminton, horseshoes, and tetherball. Archery is not a lawn game. Arrows are shot in an archery range similar to rifle and pistol. If I go out in my front yard and start shooting arrows, the police will arrive in five minutes. Badminton, how many quarter ounce birdies have crashed through a skull? Those injured have either victims either fail or bumped into a pole, which you can do anywhere. Horseshoes, uh, the frequency of use is three times that of lawn darts. Three times as many sets are in use. Injury severity is, isn't as much. And maybe the CPSC should encourage the use of uh, rubber horseshoes that are available on the market. This would greatly reduce the injuries from this product. I'm sure we've all been at summer camp chucking horseshoes around. But they do have rubber horseshoes. And uh, maybe they should look into that. At least there's an option available with this product. Tetherball, again, a secondary cause of injury. Bumped into the pole. 
Um, I doubt if the rubber ball or the rope was ev has ever been, ever been a significant cause of injury. It may have caused a few bloody nose, but tether ball holes are usually embedded in concrete on school playgrounds, and kids are always running into them. I smacked into a few of them myself. When all factors are considered, lawn darts still stand alone in their inherent dangers. These directorates fail to employ even a minuscule amount of common sense when analyzing this knee-jerk comparison table. It confirms the old axiom, garbage in, garbage out. Unfortunately, this misinformation will probably factor in allowing the continued sales of lawn darts, which will continue to kill and, to kill and injure unabated. At this meeting on September the 17th that I referred to, I think this is very important because it, it, it gives an indication of the, the philosophy of the agency. One directorate states that only 675 annual injuries and three deaths does not constitute a major product safety problem. And then he starts talking about screwdrivers. Like, uh, let's throw a steak on the barbecue, invite the neighbors over and play screwdrivers in the backyard. Uh, how many screwdrivers have injured or killed anybody if it wasn't used in malice? Even when you throw one up, it comes down handled first. I mean, that's the thing. I've had people talk to me about cars. And, and um, we have to consider the inherent dangers of the product its intended use, how many people use it, is it worth it or not? I'm not saying we should ban cars. I'm trying to keep a sense of awareness about this. But something just, products go beyond that threshold. Another directorate says, there is no evidence that the ban is not working. And I want to remind you that all the importers of lawn darts were found to be in violation of the ban, and 30% were in violation of the retailers were in violation. 81% of those injured were by this adult toy were children. An incredible statement. Still another says, when you walk into a store and pick up a lawn dart, the danger should be self-evident without anybody having to tell you. I want to remind people the way these are sold in combo sets. They're in an enclosed box, and most purchasers don't see lawn darts. And usually most of them are sold with inadequate warnings. And 30% of them are in toy department, so even as an intelligent adult, this one can slip by you. And I, and I think that this smacks of some sort of a Neanderthal serves them right attitude. And so it went. I think this is what Congressman Florio meant when he said that the CPSC Chairman Scanlon has loaded the deck, referring to Mr. Scanlon's placement and reassignment within the commission of individuals who, like himself, have no idea of the commission's mandate. Throughout this meeting, the commissioners and directors expressed or implied their continued benevolence <laughs> towards these lawn dart importers. The commission seemed fond of calling these people an industry. These importers were all found to be violating the law. These violations contributed to the death and injuries of thousands of children. Yet the commission is heard to justify and make excuses for these people. One commissioner asked, what standards could we develop that would gain acceptance to the industry or be acceptable to them? Hey, CPSC, who's in charge here? You're taking this voluntary compliance to the point of revulsion. And don't get mad when people accuse you of acting like wimps, because this perception is well-founded. On October the 1st, 1987, the commissioners met again to decide the fate of lawn darts. They could have banned lawn darts by revoking the exemption. It's as simple as that. No such luck. They voted 3-0 to zero to start the ANPR process to implement the five voluntary steps carved out with the lawn dart importers. That is, the strengthening of the warning, warnings on the fin, notice to the retailers, et cetera. If all the importers fail to comply with the voluntary steps, the commission might promulgate them as rules. The CPSC claims that the option to ban still remains. Fat chance with these commissioners. It's just a ruse. The bottom line is this. Lawn darts are still going to be sold, and children will continue to be killed and injured by this product. These five actions will do little to stop the carnage. Children are the primary users of lawn darts. These voluntary, the five voluntary steps still only address the secondary issues. Lawn darts are just too irresistible to children. They are going to get their hands on them. We can't deny the nature of a child. We should always opt for their protection and safety. Never should we gamble like the CPSC is doing. Lawn darts must be banned. The Congress and the public must understand that all of us are potentially at risk from being injured or killed by unsafe products. Many ill-conceived, dangerous, and illegal toys and products are marketed each year. Operation Toyland is a good example. Does anyone wonder why millions of banned illegal toys that choke by ingestion are being imported in the first place? The CPSC admits that some importers are trying to sneak these toys into our country. 
Notice that only 10 percent of the distributors and retailers responded to the CPSC's request for cooperation in recalling the illegal toys that have already reached the stores. Food for thought. Operation Toyland is like closing the barn door after the cows are out. How many children will choke and die from these toys? And I want to stop at this point. I started out addressing lawn darts, but I want you to understand that as a parent who, who watched his child die, that I have sympathy for any parent who has to stand and watch their child be loaded to the ground, whether it's a lawn dart or whether it's something that I just walked into the store just minutes before I left for Washington and picked up something like this, clearly intended for a child under three with jingle bells on it that you can just, child can poke off and choke. And there are millions of these all over the place. How about this, roly-poly speed car? Says up here, not recommended for children under three years of age. I doubt if you will see it. In addition to that, they say that on everything. This toy is clearly intended for a child under 36 months. How little child can come here and pull these wheels off. They come off quite easily. They're only just barely threaded in. Pop into his mouth, a child will choke. I mean, something's got to be done. Something has got to be done. It's, should we print this in Chinese and send a million copies to Taiwan or Hong Kong? Would that help? Should somebody from the CPSC go over there? You, you know, you've got to understand these cottage industries here. We're not talking about Mattel or Fisher Price here. How many product safety engineers do these people have? Uh, I think the Consumer Federation of America will give you the statistics on how many children choke on these things every year. A child is a child, and it's not an irresponsible parent that goes out and buys something that'll kill their child. We're all human. We all make mistakes. But I think that uh, these people have superior knowledge of this product. I like the comments of Dr. Peter Drucker. He's the father of management science. He was having a seminar at Claremont Graduate School of Business in California last week. One student asked Dr. Drucker, how about the businessman who knowingly sells a child a toy painted with a substance that would harm it if it licked? And Dr. Drucker went on to say how this, this is no longer acceptable behavior. Our society will not tolerate this anymore. And Dr. Drucker went on. Not only businesses, but others, including government agencies, must realize when the common action is needed, precisely because the smaller, the weaker ones cannot afford to do the right thing, and because the irresponsible ones, the greedy ones, the expedient ones, the stupid and greedy members of the club exploit the responsible behavior of others. He has lower costs because he doesn't use safety helmets. And yes, Congressman Dannemeyer is right. We do live in an imperfect world. But I don't see any reason why a child should die from a toy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Snell. Um, Mr. Settles? Mrs. Settles? I seem nervous to y'all in here. Could you perhaps pull the microphone in a bit? Okay. If I seem nervous to y'all in That's here, quite right. Please you're right. Um, the last time I spoke before a group was uh, two years ago when I read the minutes of the last PTO meeting of my son Adam's school. I've never spoken to a congressional hearing before and certainly not about a subject so important and so in near and dear to my heart as I'll speak of today, the love and light of my life, my son Adam. On June 25th, 1985, a mother's worst nightmare happened to me. My 11-year-old son, Adam Gordon, was killed by a 1982 200E Big Red. When he was killed, Adam was not at home. He was visiting with his father. I wasn't there, but we've tried to piece together and put together enough information for you from eyewitnesses so you can see how the accident happened. According to the depositions, Adam was not going fast or hot rodding. As a matter of fact, he was coming to a stop. He had ridden for several years and had been taught to ride by his father and other people who had ridden ATVs and were experienced riders. At the time of Adam's accident, he was being closely supervised by his stepmother, her sister, and her grandmother. The fact is, this three-wheeler 
just flipped over and landed on top of my son and crushed his chest and killed him. In the other papers we've brought you, you can see that Honda is still saying that an 11-year-old boy can safely operate these 350-pound vehicles. Honda tries to say in its advertising that its product is safe and that parents who are careful and people who are careful don't have children killed on these machines. They say that when a child gets hurt or when a child gets killed, it's not because of Honda, it's because of bad parents and that careful parents don't have children killed. But this is just not right. My son is dead. What he had to do in his life will never be done now. And it's left undone forever. You all have a big responsibility. When I talk to people about what happened to my son, they say, well, if this three-wheeler was that dangerous, the government wouldn't let Honda sell it. People think that these machines are okay just because nothing is done. What you can do is stop a manufacturer from saying that a product is safe and that for an 11-year-old boy and telling parents and adults that good parents and good adults don't have children killed and injured on these machines that these machines are perfectly safe and only bad people who aren't good parents have this happen. The records and statistics show that 20 people a month are dying on these machines. My son is not listed on these statistics and I know of three other children in the Burleson area who are killed on these machines in the summer of 1985 as well as another child in West Texas that I'm aware of. Four years from now, I expected to try to talk to my congressman to try to get Adam an appointment to one of the military academies, which is one of his dreams. Instead of asking our congressman for an appointment to an academy, we're now asking him to help stop the destruction of our children by recalling these ATVs. Burleson had a day in honor of Adam, and they named the Burleson Boys Club Pee Wee football field in his honor after him. But what else he could have done and would have done in his life won't happen. This is happening every month and our future is being taken from us. And John and I would just like to ask for your help to please stop the killing. Please do something. Thank you. Let me um, thank all the, uh, the witnesses here, the entire panel, for its um, obviously moving testimony to try to uh, bring to the attention of the Congress and the country the need to, uh, to modify the existing system that we have, which is resulting in things such as we've heard about it from this panel. Mr. Simpson, uh, you're the attorney for the family in, in litigation? Yes, I am, uh, Congressman Florio. Uh, myself and Ricky Brantley are the attorneys for Ann Settle. You represented to me that in the litigation, uh, Mr. Scanlon has been listed as a defense witness for Honda. Do you know if he's been subpoenaed? Uh, Chairman Florio, he has not been subpoenaed. As I understand, he was listed as a person with relevant facts in the discovery by Honda. I don't know whether they intend to call him or not. I would anticipate that he would be outside the subpoena power of the court in Tyler, Texas. So in fact, therefore, if he shows and he's outside the subpoena power, it will be a voluntary appearance. Yes, uh, just because he is listed with relevant facts does not necessarily mean that the defendants intend to call. I understand. Let me uh, just observe that in these two instances, you've got glaring examples of deficiency of the existing system. With regard to the all-terrain vehicle instance, there are no mandated regulations at all. One can argue as to what the scope of them should be, but there aren't any at this point. And of course, as I think everyone has heard, there doesn't appear to be any movement from the appropriate authorities to impose whatever degree of mandatory standards should be the case. Mr. Snow, of course, his situation um, illustrates 
what happens when you even have mandatory requirements that are not enforced. And just to clarify for those in the audience, there are mandatory regulations that are theoretically in place that ban the sale of lawn darts to children. Um, the, and actually, they ban the sale, with the exemption being that they can be sold to adults if there are the appropriate warnings. Mr. Snow, it's my understanding that subsequent to our last hearing, that the Consumer Product Safety Commission went out and did a market survey. And it's my understanding, and you can clarify this if you have information about it, that they did a market survey in apparently 21 instances <laughs> where the survey was conducted, all 21 indicated that there were violations of the standards. Do, are you aware of this, this survey? I'm aware of it. I'm also aware at the September 17th meeting that the commission claimed that in 1984, in a survey at that time, that there was a compliance. And there were very few labeling violations, but then one directorate of, of compliance at that time said, that uh, those that weren't complying were brought into compliance. So I got to thinking, now wait a minute. Now you're telling me that in 1984, you had total compliance with the labeling standards, but yet in 1987, less than three years later, you went out and did a survey and all 14 of the importers were in violation of the law again. Was this some sort of an accident? It has something to do with the alignment of the planets. And then I hear the commission make excuses for them. Well, maybe they had a change of ownership, or maybe this, or maybe that. That's no excuse for violating the law. And these people should know what the law is. Somebody consciously made a decision. Somebody picked up a telephone and told somebody somewhere to take the warning off the package, or put it on the side panel, or put it on the back panel, or reduce it from a quarter of an inch to a sixteenth of an inch. Somebody made that decision, and it occurred 14 <coughs> times. And and we're, we're not talking about a responsible industry here. We're talking about a bunch of importers whose only concern is lining their, their, their Gucci suits with dollar bills. And they don't care about your kids or my kids or anybody else's kids. That's what Dr. Drucker was talking about, the stupid, greedy members of the club. And there's enough of them out there, believe me. Well, the obvious question that uh, your situation that you've just described raises is whether the alleged compliance rate in 1984 was real, and if it was, why is it and what it is that's happened over the last number of years to result in non-compliance, and it may very well be that the message has been sent out that there is no real enforcement that's taking place, and therefore if there was compliance at one point, there isn't a sense of a, a need for diligence in complying anymore, and of course that's what this whole hearing is about to focus in on what is perceived of a non-enforcement oriented agency that is resulting in these types of difficulties. Let me yield to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mrs. Settle, I know how big Burleson is, but I don't know that the people in the hearing room uh, do. Uh, what's the population of Burleson? Approximately. About 12,000. About 12,000. I think so. And, uh, my, if my recollection is in your testimony, you said that in, in the year that, uh, the summer that your son was killed, that three other children were killed in Burleson, is that correct? In our area, yes. Uh, in Burleson, Fort Worth area. And how many of those deaths were reported, to your knowledge? I don't know of any of them that were. So there's a good possibility that instead of 20 deaths per month, it, per month, it could be considerably larger than that. Yes, sir. Okay. I feel like that's the tip of the iceberg, maybe. Now, I want to ask a question. Uh, about the accident itself. Uh, uh, you heard Congressman Craig a little earlier, and, and, and he was talking about that most of the deaths that occur are because the vehicles are being misused, or they're not, not proper supervision, or they're improperly trained, or various reasons. Uh, my recollection in, in talking with you earlier and, and, and other people that are familiar with the accident, your son was driving on level ground, is that correct? Yes, sir. And at a slow speed. I've been told that, yes. And he had been, he had been uh, using the, either this vehicle or another ATV for several years. Yes, sir. He'd been properly trained to the extent that's possible. Yes. Uh, you know, it wasn't adverse weather conditions. No. It wasn't in a race. No. It wasn't going up and down a hill. No. And the thing flipped over on him. 
Yes, sir. All right, now, has anybody, to your knowledge, who was, a, I understand that you were not a witness, that you were not there at the time, you indicated there were adults there, uh, has anybody, to your knowledge, indicated who was actually on the scene and saw the accident transpire, indicate in any way that Adam was improperly utilizing the vehicle? No, he wasn't. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would, uh, just for the record, indicate that uh, in my communications with the, uh, the manufacturers, I gave them what I thought was every opportunity to uh, make their position clear. I asked them if there was anything underway to, uh, to change the design of the vehicles, uh, it, you know, safety belts, roll bars, uh, redesign the center of gravity, reposition the center of gravity. Uh, what I, now I, I won't speak for the committee, for the entire Congress, but for one congressman, the, the, the manufacturers and their representatives have absolutely stonewalled this issue. They sent me about a two inch thick PR package uh, that was absolute trash. Now I am convinced that Adam case is not an isolated case. It's not abuse, it's, it, there is a inherent defect in this product. And I personally am not too concerned whether the Justice Department does something about it or the Consumer Product Safety Commission does something about it or the United States Congress does something about it. But since I can't control or impact anything but the Congress, I'm going to work with you to see that we do something about this. Now let me ask you one final question. Are these, be if I were to go with you to Burleson, Texas, and walk into a, a showroom somewhere in the Burleson, Texas area, could I purchase a three-wheel vehicle today similar to the one that killed your son? Yes, they're available still. You could, we could do that. All I've right. seen them out. I yield back well, the gentleman yield. Sure. Just to um, <coughs> express uh, you know, empathy for his frustration as he expressed it, and, and the gentleman is a co-sponsor of the legislation that's being talked about. This regulatory void that is out there, particularly in all-terrain vehicles, is, um, is going to be filled one way or the other. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that the state attorneys general have asked for enhanced authority to um, deal with these problems. And uh, part of the legislation that the gentleman is a co-sponsor of will provide for enhanced authorities to attorneys uh, general across the board in this area of consumer product safety. Because if the federal agency is not going to be dealing with the problem, someone in law enforcement is going to. And the attorneys general have requested increased authority and we're hopeful that that will be part of the initiative that uh, this Congress will enact. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. The gentleman from California, Mr. Danamon. Thank you. Uh, to both of these parents, let me express my condolence to the misfortune you have experienced. Uh, all of us on this panel, I think, have raised children, and my instance, grandchildren, and. Uh, we understand the tears that tear at you when your children or grandchildren are injured and we empathize with you and we want you to understand that. I'd like to ask Mr. Snow a question. Uh, there's an uncertainty about the package that uh, contained the dart that you purchased uh, from your previous testimony here on, <coughs> on June 4. Uh, <coughs> I think you, you, you said to the subcommittee that uh, the uh, package that contained the, the dart that was purchased uh, had lettering in it uh, uh, that was uh, an eighth of an inch high. Is that right? That was the package I brought. Uh, Congressman Danamar, I want to ask you a question. Did you receive my letter of September the 6th, 1987? No, I didn't receive Just this that. letter that I sent no, to you? No, I don't think I received that. Okay. I will have... But the reason I asked the question, uh, there Thanks. seems to be some uncertainty about it. Uh, I think your testimony previously said that if you had... If the package containing the dart that you bought, if it had been a quarter inch high, you wouldn't have bought it. I think you said that, didn't you? No. I don't really recall what I said. You see, I was here six months after I buried my child. I was doing the best I can. I understand. My child's already dead. It's really a mute point. It's like beating a dead horse. I'm only here trying to save the lives of other children. I understand. But, but I want to read you something I, I wrote to you 
uh, when this issue was brought up, and I explained this to you. When I testified on June the 4th, <coughs> 1987, I was unaware that the container I had showed to the committee was different than the one I had purchased, or that the fatal dart had been altered. I was aware that it was not the actual box. I believe the two were identical in all respects. The actual box was retrieved from my garage by a neighbor as a courtesy to me when it was clear that Michelle was not coming home from the hospital. My neighbor correctly assumed that I would not want to look at the darts or the box. Later, this was given to my attorney by a neighbor. When I was asked to bring the box to Washington by the committee staff, a box was delivered to me by the law clerk from the attorney's office just prior to my departure. The box looked to me as the same that I had purchased. I understood now that the firm did not want to release the actual box because it was an evidence in a civil action. There was a misunderstanding, factored partly because I was unable to speak with my attorney before I left. I was made aware of the altercation of the dart on June the 8th, 1987 by the CPSC investigator, Roger Burroughs, when he showed me the coroner's picture of the dart that he believed was responsible. I presented to the committee the truth as I believed it to be at that time. Well, we'd like to have your letter in the record if you would this, permit this that to be done. This letter that I sent yes. to you? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have it. Uh, also, the uh, dart itself was modified. Do you know who did that or how it was done? I have no idea, but I'll show you how it's done. But it really doesn't make any difference because I had to do the agency's job form. As a, as a machine shop supervisor, I have a pair of uh, micrometers and calipers, and I can, I can know how to make measurements. This, this is usually how they claim the dart was modified. I, was see, I saw a picture of a modified dart. I am to this day trying to figure it out. This would have been a modified dart. This cap screws off. But uh, I have tried to toss this, and for the life of me, I can't get it down to come down because of where the weight is. It always comes down this way. It never comes down this way. The coroner of Riverside reported that this was a sixteenth of an inch. The agency said it was an eighth of an inch. I finally measured and found out it's .154 inches at this tip. This tip, or this is .157, this is .154. This is tapered. This is actually about the same diameter. This is two and a half inches. This is eight and a half inches. You can talk with the neurologist if you want. He'll tell you anything goes into your brain two and a half inches can be just as lethal. I really don't think the alteration is that important or makes that much of a difference. My child is dead in one way or another. It's already killed two other children just the way it is. And there's already, there are already dozens of children that are brain dead from this product. I mean, we're talking about a product that generates a million and a half a year in sales that costs five million to treat the injuries. Enough is enough. This is just too ridiculous. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Thank All you, right. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Bates. Mr. Chairman, I uh, sympathize with the testimony. I, re I really don't know what to say. I mean, these are, are tragic circumstances. As for the Federal Consumer Product Safety Commission, I, I, I get back to the point that I tried to make earlier. and. I, I haven't been here that long, but in the five years that I've been here, it seems like the staff studies these, the regulatory agencies issue statements, we hold hearings, the media covers it, legislation is passed, and nothing really changes, except we replace the old unresolved, unsolved problems with new ones as our technology changes, and, and it seems, seems that we go on and on and on. I'll do everything I can to support your legislation, to reorganize, restructure, take away their money, give them more money, try and get some kind of action. But it isn't just this commission. It's throughout the government. The Defense Department is, is just mind-boggling in the waste and the incompetence. And we continue to throw a trillion dollars at that problem. You, you get into the pesticides, insecticides, the fungicides, the hazardous waste. They continue to go unabated, unregulated, no permits issued, no cleanup in the past. We spend $15 billion on legal fees to decide who's at fault. <coughs> and we just go through the government. And, it's, and, and you say, well, you're, you're a United States congressman. You got elected to Congress to do something. If you can't do it, somebody's got to do something about it. And so we come here, and we don't do anything about it. And, and I just frankly get very frustrated and very discouraged. And we, we put out these releases and we introduce these bills and they're passed. We asked the FCC to, to enforce the Fairness Doctrine and they abolished it. Um, and I don't understand it. 
we break the laws, and, and if a person is popular, we ignore it. We, we, we say this isn't a good law, we won't go by it. Or we don't agree with this, so we won't enforce it. Frankly, I don't understand it. And I, I just have to admire your perseverance in trying, trying to get in, into this. I mean, we've got, we've got probably one of the most serious consumer products in the safety of the, of the consumer public. And, and we got to get into the infighting of, of, uh, of the uh, commissioners. I mean, it's mind boggling. Well, the gentleman, you, the gentleman highlights one of the reasons for this legislation being as dramatically different from the traditional reauthorization as it is. We are talking about effectively restructuring this agency because tinkering at the edges is not going to deal with the changes that are needed in this particular agency. So I, though there may be criticism for saying that we are reordering and restructuring, that uh, reordering and restructuring is as a result of the frustration that many of us have about the inadequacy of just working at the margins. Rather, well, there's a need to restructure and go to the heart of the mission of the agency. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. Well, that's why I'm a co-sponsor. I don't know if it'll work. I hope it does. I hope the restructuring won't be uh, as ineffective as what we have now, and I think it's worth a chance. So, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Gentleman from Utah. I have no questions. Thank you. I would like to express uh, my appreciation, sir. Uh, Chairman Florio, if I may, I would like to just address a couple of things that have been said. Sure. Congress, Congressman Craig uh, stated that as I recall that there were warnings to parents on these three-wheelers not to let the children ride the adult-sized bikes. And I know that contention has been made in the May 1987 hearing. From 1980 until fall of 1985, there were no recommendations or warnings that children should not ride the adult-sized bikes. Adam Gordon died on June 25, 1985. His father nor his mother had the benefit of any of these warnings. Now, I think also the manufacturers, when asked about their recommendations, they do not call them warnings, and they will not admit that they are warnings. They state that they are recommendations. We also have one other problem. The manufacturers continue to tell you what they are doing in 1986 and 87. They fail to bring up the fact that they have hundreds of thousands of three-wheelers on the market that have no warnings that have, and that these users and parents have not been advised of the danger that their children uh, could encounter by riding these three-wheelers. We would like to thank the committee on behalf of Ann and my co-counsel Ricky Brantley for being allowed to speak with the committee and applaud the courage of Congressman Barton and asking us to come here today and testify. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Ohio. Uh, this is not directed towards the witnesses. I would just like to point out, however, though, that uh, my staff person this weekend uh, visited several retail stores uh, accompanied by her children uh, 6, 10, and 11, and found in two instances in major U.S. retail stores, lawn darts for sale. On both of the boxes, there were no warnings evident at all. And, Mr. Chairman, in one of the stores, they were found on one aisle, one side of which the lawn darts were being sold was the sporting goods section, and the other side of the aisle in which items were stacked up on the shelves, Mr. Chairman, were the toy section little dolls and things for three, four-year-olds. So, Mr. Chairman, the, the way in which these items are still being marketed, at least from just Saturday's experience, uh, Mr. Snow, suggests one to believe that there is not an effective warning mechanism. There is no concern, uh, at least being evidenced uh, in the retail community, about the availability and the proximity in which these are found. And third, Mr. Chairman, if there are warnings out there, they were not evident to, to this staff person uh, in an examination of retail stores in the Washington, D.C. area this, this own very weekend. Uh, Mr. Eckert, can I just make a comment? I have taken my campaign to the private sector. I've written major retailers, nationwide retailers, asking them, giving them all the information, all the facts. 
you know, I'm going to get them one way or another, either legislatively, privately, I don't care how I do it, through the media, make everybody aware. These lawn darts are history, as far as I'm concerned. Just, just a matter of how long it's going to take me. That's what it's down to. But I have thought it interesting when I've, I've had some response, but most of the major retailers, even when you hit them between the head with what's happening here, still opt for the uh, pursuit of the almighty dollar. And uh, I've had very little success with that. It's okay. kind of very discouraging. I thank the witnesses. I thank you, Mr. Snow. I just wanted the committee to be aware of our experience this weekend. Once again, thank you very much. We appreciate the panels. I'd like to indicate to Mr. Snow, I've seen at least two of your reports on CNN headline news, so you are making some, some progress in getting people to know about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Thank you very much. We're now pleased to welcome as our next witness the Honorable Terence Scanlon, Chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Chairman Scanlon, welcome to our committee. Your statement will be made a part of the record in its entirety, and you may proceed as you see fit. <coughs> we would ask for the record that you introduce your yeah. colleagues. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen from Utah. I note that you have the chairman on one panel and the two, uh, two commissioners on the second panel. Uh, would we not save a good deal of time if we had them all on the same panel, and so we could uh, talk back and forth where there are differences? Would at, that the request, at the request of the uh, other commissioners, we're structuring it in this way. I would like to know why the commission cannot all pair together. Well, the chair, the chair is, sees fit to call the witnesses as, as I understand, as appropriate. but I'd like you to indicate why you didn't. Well, you will have an opportunity to ask them on the next panel. I, I'm asking you right now. Well, I don't know. We will find out. And you can ask the question if you'd like. Mr. Chairman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and members of the committee. Mr. Uh, Chairman, could you turn on the... Uh, on my far left uh, is Tom Murr, the Deputy Executive Director of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. On my immediate left is Dr. Leonard DeFiore, the Executive Director. And on my right is Jim Lacey, the General Counsel. I appreciate the opportunity to comment on H.R. 3343 and H.R. 3443, bills reauthorizing and reorganizing the Consumer Product Safety Commission. While I share many of the concerns that gave rise to H.R. 3343, the specific provisions of this measure are another matter. A number, in my view, would be counterproductive. Also, it is my feeling that a three-year reauthorization, or four years if two-year budget cycles are adopted, would be preferable to the two-year reauthorization language of H.R. 3343. Let me cite some examples. For instance, Section 101A2 of H.R. 3343 would require that significant rather than unreasonable risks of injury associated with consumer products be made subject to an expedited rulemaking procedure. On the surface, the use of significant instead of unreasonable might seem like a distinction without a difference, but in reality it is likely to mean a major but not necessarily justifiable increase in the number of instances a rulemaking procedure, procedure might have to be initiated. Why? Because the term significant may not take into account such things as consumer awareness and product misuse that would normally argue against recourse to the rulemaking process. Moreover, under the terms of H.R. 3343, unreasonable risks would remain the criteria for adoption of a final rule meaning that many of the rulemaking procedures the Commission would be ob obliged to undertake could not be successfully completed. Similarly, the precedent-setting provisions in Section 102 of the bill permitting unsuccessful petitioners to appeal to a federal court and get reimbursed for their legal fees are also likely to generate additional workload over which the Commission would have no control but which could detract from other more deserving projects. Consumers must be encouraged by these features to demand action by the Commission on any type of product concerns, regardless of how serious or frivolous it might be. Moreover, the Commission might be tempted to grant many of these petitions, not necessarily on merit, but to avoid the possibility of having to pay attorneys and expert witnesses fees. As a result, further impetus would be given to the initiation of discriminate rulemaking. 
Another drawback to arbitrary rulemaking deadlines is that the engineering studies or other research required to support a rule often take longer than 180, 270, or even 360 days to complete. Absent the resulting evidence, the Commission may be forced to conclude that rulemaking isn't appropriate under the circumstances or face the prospect of going into court ill-prepared to defend an action it has taken. As a consequence, instead of being expedited, otherwise achievable safety measures may be delayed or perhaps denied altogether. A further point that should be made with, with, with respect to research is that additional information on suspected product hazards can and should be obtained by working cooperatively with state and local officials. Improved enforcement of Consumer Product Safety Commission regulations also can be affected by stressing programs aimed at catching potential, potentially large numbers of non-complying products at the earliest possible point in the product distribution process. As a matter of fact, the Commission has been working along those very lines. In fiscal 1986, for example, work planning agreements between the Commission and the states were more than doubled, and state officials commissioned to assist the Commission were increased by 21%. Also, our cooperative state laboratory toy testing program is showing real promise. For instance, recent work conducted by the Colorado State Lab on our behalf not only indicated that safety violations could be successfully identified, but that the testing could be done quickly enough to help support our import surveillance program. Speaking of the latter, I am pleased to report that Operation Toyland has been very successful to date. Working with the U.S. Customs Service in two West Coast ports, our investiga investigators identified and have seized no less than 70 different shipments of toys and other children's items that did not comply with Commission safety regulations. Keeping in mind that a recall initiated once a product is on the market is not nearly so likely to remove dangerous toys from the presence of unsuspecting children, I think you can see why I am so enthused about this effort. Just the news that almost two and one half million dollars worth of unsafe toys were seized in approximately two weeks should encourage importers to be more respectful of our safety regulations in the future. I'm also pleased to tell you that uh, just in the last few days at the port of Newark, New Jersey, some 27 seizures of unsafe toys uh, have been collected uh, in the last seven days. Checks of these violative products will continue uh, throughout the duration of this week, and my guess is that that figure will increase. Uh, a rough estimate of goods seized to date is approximately, uh, uh, has a domestic value of some $300,000. Finally, Mr. Chairman, let me address that section of H.R. 3343, which calls for the election of the chairman by the other members of the commission. It will come as no surprise that I strongly oppose this provision. My own preferences with respect to the organization and functioning of the Commission have been provided to this subcommittee on June 4th. However, if the choice is between the provisions of the H.R. 3343 and those of H.R. 3443, sponsored by Congressman Dana Meyer and others, I would prefer the latter. Instead of reversing a 40-year trend relative to management of various independent regulatory agencies, implementation of H.R. 3443 would save money and el eliminate many of the time-consuming conflicts that have plagued the Commission since its inception. That concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you or other members of the committee might have. I'd just like to demonstrate uh, some of the toys that were found uh, in these seizures on the West Coast in Operation Toyland. This is a rattle, which would fail the rattle test, the CPSC, uh, in addition to a handle, which is non-complying. Uh, we also have a small part here, a bell that could easily come out with almost no effort uh, and cause a choking hazard. We also have a number of items that failed the lead and paint standard. Uh, this is a toy train. Uh, there were several of those that have some 21% uh, of lead paint, uh, which, of course, would be toxic uh, on this train. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Mr. Chairman.
Sounds like the last few days have been fairly busy for you, um, not only in terms of um, seizures out of the port of Newark, but also Mr. Schmelzer's return. And I note that uh, yesterday, the Consumer Product Safety Commission's semi-annual regulatory agenda and came out. And I was interested to note that in a couple of key areas that the committee is, um, is interested in, we look under the agenda and we see that on all-terrain vehicles, the Commission's next action is, quote, undetermined, end quote. And then we look down to see the uh, petition for a rule to make disposable lighters child resistant. Here again, the Commission's next action is, quote, undetermined, end quote. Likewise, when we look at the regulatory agenda uh, with regard to um, okay. small part regulation to prevent choking by children under three, again, the regulatory agenda indicates that it's undetermined. Is that a, an accurate assessment of where the Commission is on those key provisions in terms of what it is you intend to be doing? Okay. Uh, there are a number of things there, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the ATV issue, it's undetermined because the case is before the Department of Justice. Uh, the designation of, uh, on cigarette lighters is such because we have not had that commission briefing. The last part that I made reference to was the small the part same, regulation to prevent the, choking by children under three. The same would apply to that. So the uh, answer to my question then is yes, it is true that the action, uh, the regulatory agenda projected for the commission is as yet undetermined in those three areas. On those three issues, that's okay. true. Let me ask on the all-terrain vehicle, the last time you were here and your fellow commissioners came and said that you decided you didn't have the uh, resources to go forward um, and therefore you had to defer to the Justice Department's decision as to whether they were going to move or not. Um, is it the case that if you did have the resources, if the Congress were tomorrow to provide you with the resources to prosecute this action, I presume, notwithstanding the fact that you don't agree with it, the Commission's a decision to have mandatory standards would be able to be enforced, uh, would be able to be uh, prosecuted? Could, could I uh, correct a, a, Certainly. a false assumption? First of all, uh, I do support this case. Uh, I voted for part of the case. I don't support one remedy of the case. So if uh, in fact, I, as I, ra I said- I'd rather not go into that, uh, Mr. Chairman, here because I, I think it would be detrimental to the case. but. Uh, Overall, I do support this, this case, and, study I, that and, previously have and I have done, I must say, and I've done everything in my power mm -hmm. uh, to bring about uh, a rectification of the problem with ATVs, yeah. including now, guess, much prodding at the Department of I guess of my, question, my question really is, notwithstanding your concern about a section of the proposal, the proposal has now been approved by the Commission. That's correct. Okay. Now, if you had the resources, because my understanding was that the reason why it was not undertaken by the Commission, which you clearly had the authority to do, was the absence of resources. Is that correct? I think the chief reason, no, uh, for, for a simple answer. The, okay. the, the answer is no. The, the response would be that uh, justice has much more expertise in this type of litigation. Is that and not a factor of resources? It's a factor. Uh, but I would also want skilled attorneys who are in court every day uh, handling my case. Has the Commission, in any other instance over the history of the Commission, initiated mandatory standards with the Commission doing it, as opposed to deferring to the Justice Department? It's not a, a this is a Section 12 case. It's not a mandatory standards case. Okay. But, but I'm suggesting- It's a litigation. Are you putting into question the authority of the Commission to move forward in not the at way all. the Commission has suggested? Not at all. Not at all. I think it was, uh, yeah. you can uh, ask my colleagues their opinion. My understanding is that all three of us uh, thought that it would be better to utilize justice attorneys. You heard, I think, um, Senator D'Amato this morning say that he has been given some assurances by people at the Justice Department that this would be dealt with as a high priority. Um, I'm assuming that the Commission is working with the Justice Department. Can you give us any clarification as to what high priority means in terms of the Justice Department? At some point in, in a time frame, we can expect the Justice Department to say yes or no, they will no. bring this action? Uh, we sent a letter uh, just a few weeks ago uh, signed by the three commissioners to the Department of Justice, uh, <coughs> prodding them to reach a decision. 
Uh, we have staff attorneys working daily in conjunction with assigned Justice Department uh, attorneys on this case. Uh, we have, uh, we're providing a number of, of uh, contracts to back up the research uh, to augment the case. Mr. Kenlin, that's the same answer you gave me in June. And um, I mean, you have, in other words, you have nothing to say that's different from our last conversation in June when you said essentially the same thing in terms of any expectation that within 30 days, two weeks, two years, we will have some answer from the Justice Department as to whether they agree to even accept this case? Uh, I would agree, uh, Mr. Chairman, with uh, Senator D'Amato's analysis on this. I, th I think everything is being done uh, as far as what we can see. Mr. Chairman, all you have to, to do is say, no, you haven't got anything to add, and that will be sufficient. Fine. Okay. Then no, you have nothing to add in terms of any assurance that the highest priority categorization is different today than it was in June when the exact same thing was told to us. It is okay. a still a high, high priority, priority both at the Commission and at Justice. Okay. Let, let's shift for a moment to Mr. Schmelzer. Um, we were all very, some of us were pleased yesterday to see in the newspaper that apparently the decision that previously been made by, by you has apparently been reversed. Mr. Smeltzer is now reinstated in its previous capacity. Um, can you tell us what it is prompted this uh, reversal? Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we had significant management problems in the Compliance Directorate. Mm -hmm. uh, in May of this year, uh, I had asked uh, through the Executive Director for a management study to see what could be done uh, to prove improve uh, the overall operations of that division. Mm -hmm. uh, when you had asked, or the committee had asked, for uh, extensive background on both our activities on cigarette lighters and on uh, uh, lawn darts, it was evident that uh, we had many problems. Uh, we had a very difficult time finding these files. Uh, some were out of date. Uh, there were a number of problems. Uh, at that time, I then uh, made a temporary detail of Mr. Schmelzer uh, to another assignment. I also asked that two top flight uh, agency managers go into compliance uh, and again report back to me uh, with recommendations for improvements. We got a, a preliminary report uh, from Tom Murr the Deputy Executive Director, which was supplied uh, to the Commission on October 16th. It's entitled, A Preliminary Review of the Compliance Study. Uh, following that review by me, uh, I reassigned Mr. Schmelzer with a management team there, uh, Mr. Schmelzer has agreed to, to make uh, the several suggested rectifications in that directorate. The date of the hearing uh, was not uh, significant. In fact, the date, the date of this hearing, I believe, was we had been told was going to be a week earlier, um, and then it was rescheduled. Many individuals um, happen to think that the enforcement deficiencies that may exist at the Commission are not as a result of Mr. Schmelzer, but rather are, are in spite of Mr. Schmelzer, and that the fact that you've got six vacancies out of 18 authorized positions is a major cause of concern. Now, your responsibility under the existing system prior to any change in the law is um, the administrative function. What, if anything, have well, let me tell you about operation. what, if anything, if you ha have you done to fill the vacancies? Are they uh, still vacant? First of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, there are three vacancies in the Compliance Directorate. When uh, has that been changed? Uh, this report is dated October 27th. The three include a GS uh, typist, GS5 typist, a compliance uh, technician, grades five through nine, and one compliance officer. Well, we're interested in, in your timing, uh, and uh, again, commendably that you, you've filled these things. With the last information we had, which was relatively recently, 
is that there were six vacancies, and you tell us today that three exist, which means, of course, three people have been filled. When was that done? I'm, Mr. I'm Chairman, curious. I think that the, um, in, in the spring, late spring, early summer, we had a number of people, um, including one death of a staff member, uh, mm -hmm. leave the, the uh, commission from the compliance directorate. And over those several months, um, I had a number of conversations with, with David Schmelzer to discuss how we would fill those. Um, the, we had, I guess as of last week, I think we may have had four vacancies. There was one attorney who we had spoken about in the summer who, had, who was at that time in the Office of General Counsel who I had indicated to David would be transferred to compliance once we got the ATV um, matters that were at, at hand uh, further, further along than they were at that point in time. And I indicated to him once that had slowed down, this attorney would be, would be coming to compliance. Uh, that person was working in OG, in the Office of General Counsel, handling compliance cases as a backup for an attorney that had been working on ATVs. So you're, in other words, you're transferring people. When we talk about going from six to three mm -hmm. or four, we're not talking about new people. We're talking about taking someone out of something that presumably they're doing that is worthwhile to go into another area. No, this, this was an attorney um, who was uh, over the ceiling in the Office of General Counsel. In other words, the Office of General Counsel has a certain number of attorneys. This is one that was extra because we had extra attorneys assigned there temporarily to work on the ATV case. Once the workload in that died down, we moved the person back. The, the, of the three vacancies we have now, uh, two of them, one is a brand new position that, was, that the commission approved as early as uh, early October, and the other is a compliance technician of vacancy created two months ago. Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that you or someone on the staff asked for an internal audit to review whether um, uh, Mr. Schmelzer did anything improper uh, with regard to previous testimony here. Was that audit completed, and what, if anything, did it reveal? Uh, what I did ask for, Mr. Chairman, was an internal audit on uh, the handling of the uh, Michelle Snow tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came to this hearing on June 4th, uh, I had been advised that uh, there, were, there was no uh, paperwork in-depth investigation or anything else on that uh, uh, tragedy. I, I checked the night before when the witness list was submitted to us by your staff and specifically asked, is there information on the uh, Snow case? Uh, I was advised that there wasn't. Uh, I subsequently learned that uh, our staff did have information in the Compliance Directorate at least two days before that hearing. So then your, your conclusion was that, and I think it's important to put this on the record since it's a matter of now common knowledge that the audit appeared to put into question the propriety of actions by Mr. Schmelzer, that the audit has been conducted and Mr. Schmelzer did not do anything inappropriate and was doing all the things that were required to be done by him in the performance of his duties? The, the question of the review was part of um, an attempt to get a handle on, on the management situation in compliance. Um, throughout uh, the month of June, I had been trying to get uh, the facts of the snow case clear. Um, at, at a minimum, we had a number of inquiries from Congress asking about that. And we were trying to make, get those facts straight. Um, sometime in, this, in September, um, uh, two memoranda came to my attention <coughs> that apparently we had um, about the snow case, which would have been very useful for me to have seen when they arrived, roughly June 5th, June 8th, June 9th. Um, Therefore, the, the review here was to see what was it uh, that the compliance directorate had, when was it that that information was made available uh, either to the executive director's office or to the commission. Uh, so there was no hint uh, that anything that Mr. Schmelzer had done was wrong. It was a question of looking at what were the communication and management procedures that were at, used by the compliance directorate to, one, gather information, and two, to pass it up the line and what seemed to go wrong. That and I guess what we'd like is just the conclusion. As you can appreciate, the sequence of events was a question as to the appropriateness of the performance of responsibilities, the removal of the gentleman for office, and now, of course, he's being restored. 
I guess I would like just to have you flesh out the picture um, in terms of whether um, your study indicated that he performed all his responsibilities and therefore his restoration in some way uh, results in, in uh, removal of any questions that have been raised about his performance right. in the compliance right. office. Right. I, I'd like to uh, establish for the record, Mr. Chairman, I don't think there was any propriety uh, to my knowledge in my or the other commissioners or the executive director coming up here and not being adequately prepared. Uh, at best, I would say it was sloppy staff work. Uh, that is a separate issue from the, the ongoing study that we had undertaken by three different uh, offices within the commission. I have other questions, but I'm going to yield to the other gentleman at this point and come back. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Bates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just briefly, uh, this, uh, legislation is different than uh, most reauthorization does attempt to restructure, reorganize the commission and try and make it more effective. And I really uh, don't have a great deal of experience in working with your commission. I'm trying to get some insight, I guess, additional insight into, um, I guess, what are apparent or acknowledged problems. And of course, as I had stated earlier, I, I don't view this as unique to your commission, mismanagement, uh, sloppy work or what, whatever, but in terms of how, how to deal with this, you differ with the legislation. You don't support that. Um, That's partic correct. Particular provisions. What, w what would be your solution to make this a model uh, regulatory agency, one that would, would in fact protect consumers, which I assume is your is how you see its role. Okay. I think, uh, Congressman, if you implemented your own congressional study, uh, uh, Congressman Henry Waxman had commissioned a GAO, General Accounting Office study. Uh, the report was author, uh, issued in April of 87. It's entitled Consumer Product Safety Commission Administrative S Structure Could Benefit from Change. Uh, in this document, it, it calls for a single administratorship. Um, it, it gives every rationale why uh, good government dictates that this agency should be under one administrator. Uh, it also cites that every previous confirmed chairman uh, held that belief. And I think to avoid the issue uh, that has plagued the Commission since its inception, you can't get away from it. Yes, there is internal bickering. There was internal bickering the first two years that I served as a commissioner under the previous chairman. There was internal bickering, I believe, according to this, from the outset. If you check the voting record at all times in every administration, about 95 percent of the commissioners do vote the same. So the philosophy well, that's true is pretty of most much the bodies, but are they critical issues? That's well. That I, mean. I think that's significant because I think. Uh, the the viewpoint is pretty much the same, but where time is wasted uh, is on policy issues. And I think, I would hope that the subcommittee would address that. Have you, uh, assuming that some of those recommendations... Management issues, I'm sorry, not policy issues. I'm what was the point? I, I, I said policy issues, I meant management issues. Management. I said that's where the excess time, in my opinion, is expended. Okay. Um, in as much as that, that report you think has merit, have you implemented to the extent you could the recommendations? In? Uh, I couldn't because it would take uh, legislation from the Congress. There, there are none, none that you could implement without legislation? No. Okay. Um, I was curious what, why you sought the chairmanship or why you, why you wanted to be on the Consumer Product Safety Commission in the first place and then how, how was it that you, you sought to be chairman or were elevated to chairman? Are those, what is your motivation for being chairman and what do you hope to accomplish? Well, just by way of background, I'm a career uh, government civil servant. I served uh, prior to my appointment in 1983 by President Reagan 
uh, in the Office of Minority Business Enterprise, later called the Minority Business Development Agency at the U.S. Department of Commerce. So most of my uh, work experience has been working uh, uh, with the blacks and Hispanics in uh, uh, getting into business and then in the more recessionary times uh, helping them stay in business. Uh, I was asked to serve uh, in 1983 uh, to be a commissioner and in 1985 to serve as chairman. But you didn't answer my question. Why, why did you want to be chairman or why? What is it you want to accomplish as chairman? What does it want to do with the position? Well, I, as a career civil servant, first of all, I'd, I'd want to help the public. Uh, I, consumer, I'm a father of three children. Uh, consumer issues have, have So you would describe yourself as a consumer advocate? I was never a consumer advocate. You're not? How would you describe yourself? You're the chair, chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and you're not a consumer advocate. In other words, you don't I, see I, yourself as my my response was that I have never to the consumer. As a background, I thought you in the, you were asking had I been a. I'm trying to get some advocate. insight into you yeah, as a person, no. your your values, and what it is that you when you say you want to contribute to well, society. Like, what in what way do you want to make a contribution? I, I would like to protect the public. Uh, I would like to offer the maximum amount of protection uh, on consumer products. There's some 15,000 uh, products that So you're we not trying to regulate. sabotage this whole operation from the Absolutely inside. not. Positively not. I'd gotten that impression, and I don't know where, and I was just trying to clarify. It's, it's the wrong impression, Congressman. All right, thank you. And I, I'm glad I have this opportunity to come up here and, and correct uh, some of this. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Scanlon, the uh, your written testimony refers uh, on page two to what you call precedent setting provisions in section 102 of, uh, of our bill, which you say would permit unsuccessful petitioners to appeal to a federal court and get reimbursed for their legal fees. <coughs> How is this precedent setting? The bottom paragraph on page two. Chairman has asked me to help out the congressman on this issue. Uh, precedent setting in in a couple of respects. Uh, first of all, and I'm looking at all of the relevant subsections of uh, of 102. The well, I'm referring to the unsuccessful uh, uh, permitting unsuccessful permissioner uh, petitioners to appeal to a federal court. Exactly. And reimbursement for legal fees. One of the biggest issues here is the provision for uh, attorney's fees. And we would uh, respectfully submit that the a standard here for attorney's fees is contrary to the principle set forth in the Equal Access to Justice Act, which provides for the Which was adapted <laughs> and when? Excuse me? When was, that, when was that enacted into law? It's at 28 U.S.C. 2412. I can't tell you exactly when it was enacted, Congressman. But, the equal, but I can tell you what it does. The Equal Access to Justice Act provides for an award of litigation costs and attorney's fees only to a prevailing party in litigation. And for attorney's fees only, um, it applies for attorney's fees only if, in effect, the position of the United States was not substantially justified. The problem that you have with this legislation, and one that we would ask that the committee consider, is that you could put the U.S. government in the position of paying attorney's fees for losing cases. Uh, the uh, standard does not comport with the existing uh, standard in the Equal Access to Justice Act, and we would uh, respectfully submit that you consider uh, the, the Congress has, factors. from time to time, however, decided to segregate certain different levels of government. The, uh, the CPSC was under a very similar provision throughout its entire history up until 1981 of allowing uh, unsuccessful petitioners to appeal to a federal court to get reimbursed for their legal fees. So how can what we want to go back to what we did before 1981 be precedent setting? Uh, Congressman, you certainly have the prerogative to do what you will. We're just making the point that this would be the only instance in the U.S. government in which the Equal Access to Justice Act was singled out for different treatment. Uh, let, me, let me move, Mr. Chairman, to uh, uh, Operation Toyland. 
Uh, do we have any indication of what the levels of imports are from 1982 to 1987 and uh, toys coming into the United States? I don't have that information, but I could supply for the record. I would, I would appreciate that. Um, how many full-time? From 82 to 87? Yes, sir. How many full-time CPSC staff members are working on Operation Toyland? Uh, in uh, the two west uh, coast ports during the two weeks of operation, there were uh, six CPSC employees in one city and four in the other. And uh, where did they come from? And, and, and one full-time person in my staff who was coordinating it. Where did they come from? What cities? Did no, they no what, where did they come from within their current employment structure at CPSC? What divisions were they in? I, I can't give you exactly, but some of them would have been field people, some would have been headquarters people, depending on uh, the, the investigators would have been from the field. Um, some of the technical experts that were on the, on the docks uh, would have been from headquarters. In addition, the people in the labs, uh, where they were not in, on, the, on the docks, but they were in, in, head, in, in our laboratory here, would have been headquarters staff. What effort uh, has this? Uh, what has this effort done to, uh, uh, in terms of draining resources from other CPSC ongoing investigations uh, or activities? I, I would say very little, uh, Mr. Record. Uh, you can see what the, the what the payoff is. Uh, in 1986, uh, I think we had 46 toys recalled. Uh, the amount of toys that have been seized just in two ports over two week period is 10 times that amount, well, is using it, fewer people. In other words, instead of going to the shelves of stores, of retail establishments around the country, and uh, which is uh, well, let's, very let's, resource intensive, okay. we can now get these goods at the ports. I think it makes a lot of sense, but let's not mix apples and oranges here. Let's not talk about individual toys recalled, one of which there may be 10,000 of them out there and compare that with tens of thousands of toys that you seize at the port. I mean, the, the, the two are not, are, not, are not comparable, Mr. Scanlon. Uh, I would, you know, if you want to compare the two, you can tell me the numbers of kinds of toys you've stopped from coming in, but don't tell me you've stopped 500,000 toys coming in and, you've, and the previous number was 46 toys because the, the, two don't, the two don't compare. I'm reading an article from uh, 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 a Times, uh, 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 Washington Times, uh, uh, newspaper story, uh, a newspaper I guess you would find to be more credible than the Post, but I'll set that aside. Uh, Honda faces meeting over all-terrain vehicle deaths, and it quoted uh, uh, a Honda representative as saying that the injury rate on ATVs has declined over the last two and one-half years. Do the CPSC statistics show this to be the case? Hey, uh, I comment that I, I have not seen that uh, article, uh, Mr. Record. The number of deaths uh, have not changed in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, the number of injuries have decreased, uh, according to our statistics. Uh, I don't know what Honda is using. Well, William Willen, spokesman for American Honda, said uh, that injuries that there have resulted in a decline over two and the last two and one half years in the injury rate related to the use of all-terrain vehicles and there was a 14 percent decline in the first six months of 87 compared to the same period of 86 uh, uh, he said however there is an october 6 cpsc memo entitled latest injury and death ups updates which states and i quote the hoped for reduction due in death rates due to the introduction of four-wheelers is not occurring the memo goes on to say, and I continue to quote, there will be no decrease in the overall number of ATV injuries for 1987. Now, either you're right or the ATV is right. Well, the ATV I, I, manufacturer I, I don't is right. think we can be responsible for what uh, data Honda puts out. I think that the, the staff analysis of a year ago indicated clearly that the market in ATVs uh, was shifting dramatically from three-wheeled ATVs being the predominant vehicle to four-wheeled ATVs being the predominant vehicle. Uh, based on that, the staff... Do you agree with this public 
publicized statement by the spokesman for American Honda that injuries have, have no declined over I the last no two and a half years? I have no basis for agreeing or disagreeing. I don't know how they came to their conclusions. But uh, the, the injury rate has, the number of injuries has not declined. I don't know if the staff has done an analysis recently which would com compute a rate of injury, which would be injuries per vehicles on the market. So, but I, I certainly don't want to be in a position of having to comment upon statistical data that's generated not by CPSC. Well, I'm trying to get to the point my colleague, Mr. Barton, was getting to, and that is, is the representations made by the manufacturers to the committee. The October 6th memo refers to a separate August 13th memo written by a Robert Verhalen, which it calls misleading, quotes, end quote, regarding ATV deaths and injuries, <coughs> statistics put out by the, uh, by the industry. Has this August 13th memo been made public? This is a staff memorandum? Yes, sir. If it's, I would say this, if it's um, restricted, it hasn't been. If it's not restricted, it has been. In other words, under the Government of the Sunshine Act, we put out any, any data or memoranda that's sent, entered into the record is available to the public unless the staff restricts it, in which case it is not. As the, uh, this particular memo I am referring to, uh, under CPSC procedures require that all written information regarding ATVs be authorized by the general counsel. Was this particular memorandum authorized? Uh, I can respond to that, Congressman. The, um, the memo in question was uh, produced, uh, as is my understanding, having uh, uh, looked into this a bit at CPSC, in connection with the regular quarterly statistics that are compiled by the CPSC and made available to the public, I would imagine that uh, the industry, uh, for whatever statistics they developed, uh, based or attempted to base their statistics on those that are made public by the Commission. We're very mindful of the fact that the Commission, that in generating uh, any documents of any type beyond the uh, basic reporting of our uh, statistic gathering uh, that we might uh, in one way or another be creating uh, paperwork that could in some way be uh, used in the litigation. So we're very concerned about that. Uh, I've spoken uh, personally uh, and as a matter of fact even prior to my becoming general counsel the policy was to be uh, very circumspect in the Office of General Counsel on any new documents that were developed at the Commission that dealt with ATVs. Did you share, do you, did you share this uh, document with the, uh, the other commissioners? The, this, as I'm saying, this document in question, the August document, was, was produced uh, on uh, my looking into this matter in connection with the regular quarterly statistics that are made available to the public. Now, I've talked to the individuals involved, and uh, it's our feeling that there's nothing uh, in that particular memo that in any way uh, takes away from our case or our activities, but nonetheless, uh, we will not be uh, producing uh, memorandum. We've, the Office of General Counsel has requested that memoranda of that kind are not produced from the statistics in the future, and that uh, public disclosures are only limited to the raw statistics. Well, I'm concerned that uh, this particular memo that we have not had a chance to examine may be the source of uh, Honda's claims. And I want to make sure that things that you're producing are not the, ben they, they are not the beneficiaries of them. I share your concern, Congressman. Mr. Scanlon, let me move over into one other, uh, one other arena, and then I will be delighted to yield back the, the balance of my time. Your recent actions to replace uh, David Schmelzer, I think, comes, uh, uh, is, is at least well received by, uh, uh, by this committee. But I cannot help but uh, get the feeling that, uh, uh, that this, is, this is reflective of a policy of personnel and intimidation. In February of 86, you wrote that, quote, Schmelzer does a fine job in managing the directorate for compliance and administrative litigation, close quotes. One year later, you removed him from his position, citing management problems. And now, days before this reauthorization hearing, you have restated him on the basis of a preliminary study whose recommendations say uh, that the resource, lack of resources, quote, close quotes, over which Schmelzer had no control resulted in the problems dealing with compliance. I fail to understand how things changed from February 
to August back to October cannot decimate morale, further obfuscate management authority, and not lead one to the conclusion that if they don't do what you want, when they want you to do it, they're history. Can you please respond to that? I'd be happy to, uh, Mr. Eckert. Uh, first of all, it was a temporary reassignment for Mr. Schmelzer. Uh, secondly, the fact that there were three, four, or five uh, vacancies in compliance, in my opinion, had nothing to do with the performance or lack of performance uh, by Mr. Schmelzer as a vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, management of the operation. Uh, again, I would invite you to review uh, this October 16th report, which I referenced earlier, uh, and you will see, uh, I believe, a very objective critique of what the problems are in that directorate. Uh, I personally think I would be remiss if I didn't make these changes. And they were quite evident uh, to the executive director, to the deputy executive director, to myself, when we were attempting to obtain information in response to this subcommittee uh, following the last hearing. But if he is not any good, then why did you put him back? Because I think this, if everything here is implemented, and we have every belief that it will be, because we do have some management controls there now, that the, the operation can resume uh, in good stead. You heard earlier, Mr. Eckert, that uh, in 1984, we were told that there were no uh, violative labeling uh, problems with lawn darts. This is in the same directorate that in two years, everything is, is wrong. Now, how did that happen in two years? I'm not sure how it happened in two years, but I'd like to know what happened in the last two months. And they direct and, and, they, and they, re they relate to you, Mr. Scanlon. I mean, there's a pattern and a practice here. This summer, you removed two attorneys on the ATV case with the most experience, replacing them with attorneys who had little or no knowledge of the ATV issue. That's a misstatement, Congressman, and uh, if I may respond, the attorneys who were replaced, and we've been through this before, but uh, this issue came up earlier in this hearing, it's, uh, it's symptomatic of the public misperception of the entire ATV affair at the commission. Well, did and, you or did you not replace the two attorneys who were working on the case? But you have said, and earlier it was said, and I'm not going to concede that because I'm going to hit this point, Congressman. You have said that these attorneys were replaced with inexperienced attorneys. Well, dead, I just want dead well, wrong, and it was brought up earlier. I'll be happy to divide and my if, statement. Did and you if or I did may you not answer replace? the question, Mr. Chairman? I'd that's like to all place I ask is to answer that issue. I'd like Mr. to. Chairman. I'd like to be able to place the question. I want to answer the issue of the experience of the attorneys. May I am I not please, a potted plant, and <laughs> you, sir, are going to answer the questions that the committee puts to you. But did you or did you not replace the wrong. attorneys? I will get to the second point. Did you or did you not replace the attorneys that the were working on the ATV case? Those attorneys. Okay. You replaced them with individuals who you believe to be more qualified than the ones that you replaced. They were, sir. Okay. That's the point I want to get to. You made a change in the management of the case affecting the prosecution of, of, a, of a legal matter vis-a-vis -vis ATVs. And Justice told us that it hasn't skipped a beat as a result of the change. The now fact I, of the matter is, and let's focus on those two attorneys, Congressman. The fact of the matter is, is that there were three attorneys assigned to the case. Two of the attorneys were changed by the chairman. They were replaced by three attorneys, so that we now had a total of four. The two primary attorneys that were, that were put on, the new attorneys, were supervisorial level attorneys. Not attorney advisors, but supervisorial attorneys who had, in fact, been engaged in the promulgation of the an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on ATVs going back to May of 1985. In fact, Congressman, if you were to read the December 12th transcript, closed transcript of the ATV matter, you would find that the very two attorneys that you and others have alleged are inexperienced were in the meeting that the Commission made the decision and active participants. And this has to be put to rest once and for all. The attorneys that were replaced were top senior attorneys that were involved in the case for up to two years and know their stuff. And they're doing a terrific job right now. And I'm very pleased uh, that uh, uh, Senator D'Amato 
has made the statement that he's made because that support from Senator D'Amato with the Justice Department is useful and I have every reason to believe in my own minor capacity in this whole business that, uh, that the uh, points that Senator D'Amato has made to you about the progress of this case are in fact true. Well, we're de I'm delighted, I'm delighted. Mr. Sure could I add uh, one thing? Uh, yeah. One of the two attorneys that was replaced had announced his resignation three months prior uh, to his replacement. Those, re if I, allow me to finish. Those sure. replacements, that replacement was done uh, with the anticipation that he would be leaving for FERC, another government agency, three months before. Uh, why did you bring, why did you bring uh, one also of them back? Also, let, let me finish. Uh, at the same time, in, in late March or early April, the industry, specifically Honda, had retained Wilmer Cutler and Pickering. So we were up against the pros. Now, am I responsible or is this general counsel responsible for keeping two middle-level attorneys uh, on a case that has been elevated to high status? No. It was our responsibility to bring in the best and the brightest, and that's what we have attempted to do. And they had the experience, and they were on record as having the experience for over two years. Did you bring years. back we one of the returns that you took off? We have been continually criticized by one of my colleagues, Commissioner Graham, from the outset. Well, I think we'll, the we'll get a chance. We'll get a chance to hear from uh, Commissioner Graham. Did you bring back one of the attorneys that you reassigned? We have not brought what? back. Uh, I'll, I should respond to that. I have had a conversation that's germane. The agency is at a point right now where we, uh, both of the agencies are at a point right now where additional legal resources could be useful. And uh, it is conceivable that one of the two attorneys that were reassigned off of the case um, um, may return. It's, it's frankly, it's, it's um, uh, frankly a, a question of resources and bringing uh, no, and having knowledgeable attorneys available to bring into the case. So it's conceivable, and I had a discussion yesterday with one of the attorneys to inquire as to whether or not that attorney would be interested in, in yeah. coming back. From so we have two prodigal sons who return. Mr. Schmelzer comes back. He is now uh, uh, a brilliant administrator, and one of the ATV lawyers now returns because uh, you now need the depth of their experience to fight the. I see nothing negative. Off to, uh, I see nothing negative somewhere else in either of those two actions. Oh uh, well, I, I would maybe you it, don't. I, this, I this would find does. it very hard to argue with bringing additional resources to bear. I want to on focus the on, Mr. Chairman, if, if you will yield to me just for one more moment then, uh, uh, Chairman Scanlon's references uh, about the, uh, the fact that there was going to be a, a reassignment to, to FERC. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, you and I discussed these, uh, these two attorneys' removals back at our, at our last, uh, last hearing. Uh, I asked, uh, from the record, uh, for which I am advised, and I'm quoting myself directly, I'm quoting you first. One is leaving tomorrow, Mr. Eckert, so it would be hard to keep him on the case when he is at FERC. Mr. Eckert, for which I am advised that he told you, that he advised you all that he was willing to stay to finish this case. Mr. Scanlon, we were never aware of that until after this decision was made. I wasn't, nor was the general counsel, Mr. Eckert. Uh, then we move on to, uh, to another discussion. When, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Scanlon, I have a memo here from one of the reassigned attorneys which said that the general counsel's office, the commissioners, and you were advised on Friday, May 29, that I decided to stay to complete action on the ATV case. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to... No, 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 I don't want your answer. I want Mr. Scanlon's uh, relevant to happy me, though, because to, the memo to, came in. He'll answer the, as well, but since the memo was to, the, the, to myself... The question has been phrased to Mr. Yeah. Scanlon. The staff right. people are here right. at the pleasure of the committee, okay. and uh, Mr. Scanlon, please uh, respond. Mr. Eckert, what I told you on June 4th was uh, correct. There, there are no changes. Phil Bechtel had announced his departure for FERC three months prior to when he left. He never discussed with me any desire to stay on after his uh, designated uh, resignation date, which was the first week of June. I don't know the exact day. 
I didn't see this memo that you referenced until about three or four weeks ago. Uh, and it was received in Jim Lacey's office uh, after hours on that Friday, after these reassignments had been made. And it's log. We can provide you the, the secretarial stamp and time. If but you, you asserted, Mr. Chairman, that neither you nor the general counsel was a, were made aware of these. I wasn't aware of it. What about I wasn't the, aware of it. He was aware of it when he got a memo after hours on Friday. But the hearing was after the day you obtained the memo. I, I did not see this memo that you're referencing, Mr. Eckert, until about three or four weeks ago. I never saw this memo. That's I, good I, management, Mr. Scanlon? Pardon me? That's good management, Mr. Scanlon? Uh, it's, you've, you've that, it you've wasn't have, provided to me. How, you, am I, how, how am I to know the contents of a memo that I didn't receive? Yet you've replaced two individuals because you accuse them of bad management, two of whom you've moved, and you've never even seen the memo that alleges whether or not they were in a position to stay or not to stay. Who's guilty of mismanagement, I, I Mr. Scanlon? Record. Uh, all I can tell you is I didn't have the memo. I can't predict things or comment on things that I've never seen. It's, well, been, it's been our effort from December when the vote was taken to do the best thing with this case to provide the best legal assistance available. Which is to move the We've enforcement personnel around like checkers on a board, Mr. One, one was leaving Mr. Eckert and the other one was taken off. Well, listen, this is, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I can see that this is going nowhere. Mr. Scanlon, I'll say to you that this is a, a classic all-star performance. Uh, you've, uh, it's, it's, you've changed your positions like a bork, you've flaunted the law like a north, and you've lied, uh, I think, to this committee like a deaver. And God bless you because you belong in this administration, but the American people and the consumers of this country don't belong to have you there. And uh, I can tell you that, Mr. Chairman, from my perspective, the only management problems at the CPSC are squarely between your ears. I yield back to the Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Utah. Mr. Chairman, I must protest the personal attack by the previous speaker. I think that's un totally uncalled for. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have, uh, Chairman Scanlon, I have several questions here, and I think I'll go at them first of all. On the ATV program, first of all, do you consider that a very complex issue? Very. Uh, could you describe some of the complexities of the ATV issue? Well, the questions about stability are very complex. Uh, the, the questions on safety of three-wheelers versus four-wheelers are complex. Uh, the, the causality uh, of accidents is, is an issue that we, we've uh, uh, grappled with uh, since early 1985. What about with these uh, complexities, and I know you have others to mention, but are these part of the reason for the delay as far as you're concerned as, and also as far as the Justice Department's concerned? Are the delays that have been encountered, are they justified by the complexities, I guess my question? Uh, I, I, yes, I think that is the reason. It's a tough, complex case. Okay, now let me ask about the statement of the settler's attorney. He said, you are listed as a person with knowledge of facts by the defendant in the acting action brought by the settles. This has to do with the uh, ATV case. Have you been contacted by Honda in this particular instance? No, I have not. Uh, do you have any reason to know why, any re idea of why you might be on the case? I don't know. Okay. Now that you know that you are on the case uh, and you are beyond subpoena power, would you be inclined to uh, participate? It would not be the recommendation of counsel that the chairman uh, participate. Okay. Let me ask, uh, you on page five, you say that if you had to choose between H.R. 3343 and H.R. 3443, you would prefer 3443. However, you later cited the GAO report, which of course uh, seems to emphasize that. But what about a simple reauthorization as compared with either 3343 or 3443? How would you rank those three? Uh, I would opt for a simple reauthorization, uh, preferably four years if obtainable. So four years? You yes. don't think we should review this more often than that? Uh, I would go for four years if it's, if it's attainable. What if you could only have two years, what would you do? We'd take it. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, now I congratulate you on the fact that you've seen about two and a half million dollars worth of unsafe toys. I think that's a very commendable thing and uh, certainly helpful. But let me ask you this basic question. Do you think that uh, this could be applied to other products besides the ones, the toys? Uh, I think it could, Mr. Nielsen. Which, which other product should it be applied to? I think it could be expanded into fireworks, where we have a, a big problem with uh, imported uh, fireworks, which are violative of our regulations. I think it also could be expanded into uh, flammable sleepwear for children. What would your, what's been the commission's, uh, how have they been doing to encourage international standards, safety standards? Well, you've gotten beyond the, the, the border. I agree with Mr. Eckert in this regard. It's better to stop them there than it is after they get in the stores. But what are you doing to encourage international product uh, safety standards? Well, we've done a number of things. Uh, recently, we sent uh, two of our staffers to the Orient uh, to meet with uh, various manufacturers in different uh, companies that make juvenile products, including toys. They apprised those manufacturers of all our regulations and voluntary and mandatory standards. Also, we have had uh, some meetings with the ISO, the International Standards Organization, on the rotational kickback standard on chainsaws. Uh, since we've had so much success here uh, with that uh, standard, we hope that it might be adopted internationally. Okay. You've uh, been criticized uh, for unduly favoring voluntary standards as compared with uh, mandatory standards. Is that an accurate? Uh, That's true. Okay. Do you have any voluntary standards that you've rejected? You found one you didn't love? Have I ever found a voluntary standard I don't love? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, yes. Can you name one? ATVs. Okay. Have you uh, ever found a mandatory statement that you've, su that you've supported, that you have loved? Oh, I have. I voted for mandatory standards. I voted for no, a mandatory, no, no. Uh, not standards, I should say mandatory rulemaking. I voted for a mandatory no, rulemaking. No, that's not my question. Just recently on methylene chloride. Okay, you do have some cases where you've opposed a voluntary one and some cases where you've opposed the, uh, man, supported the mandatory. Yes. Even though your preference is the other way in yes. general. Okay. Do you think you're carrying out the will of Congress as shown by the 1981 amendments to consumer product safety when you stress the voluntary standards? We are carrying out the mandate of the 81 amendments. Okay. Uh, let me ask another question in this regard. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on, I think, for a while, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. What's the difference between regulations to avoid an unreasonable risk and a significant dis risk of injury? You indicated that change of word would cause a great deal of problem. Uh, I know what significant means in uh, scientific statistical terms, but what is the difference between significant and unreasonable in your view? Well, I think if I could provide a, a example, I think a bat might be a significant uh, risk, but is, is not an unreasonable risk, a baseball bat. Because of the nature of the use and the so forth? That's and the, correct. Let me ask this question. If that word were changed back to unreasonable, and if that word were just simply changed, that one you object to, would that take away your objection to the Florio bill? Oh, no. That, that's just only I, one. I object to most provisions of the Florida Bill. But that particular one, you take that one away. Okay, uh, let me ask a question. To avoid a significant risk of injury at the authorization level specified in Chairman Florida's bill, could the CPSC in that case carry out a requirement to regulate all consumer products? No. And what would need to be done, either to reduce the uh, litany of things to do, or would it be to give you a lot more money? Which is the best direction? which would be required either. In other words, he's given you a, uh, you want to regulate all consumer products, and there's a suggestion you also add tobacco to that. That's one of the bills that uh, Congressman Bates is sponsoring. Uh, how could you do that with the authorization levels proposed by the bill or by the administration? We, we couldn't do it. What would you, where would you cut in that case? What would you not do? Well, I would say, Probably the bulk of our activity uh, is with compliance, so we'd have to cut that effort back uh, significantly. Would the uh, permit uh, customer, the provision that permits customer petitions help the commission or hurt it in rulemaking? We do it now, uh, it does Mr. Help. Nielsen. It does, it does help. help. 
Uh, okay. Is this same, similar to the way the law was originally passed in 1978? You see any marked difference between the way the 3343 is now proposing and the original bill? Yes. And what is that difference? I just have a sneaking suspicion while you're looking for that, that we're not going to authorize a simple, it's not going to be a simple reauthorization. There are too many things that have come up and we don't have the votes to do it that way. So well, well, let's fix as many provisions as we can that you can actually live with. It. Okay. Could I uh, ask my general counsel to respond to this on the petitions? He has spent a lot of time on this. All right. In this instance, I'll allow that. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Very quickly. The problem with the petition uh, provision is the attorney's fees. Uh, the problem here, as I mentioned uh, earlier and very quickly, is that the federal government would be paying for, uh, in our opinion, uh, uh, cases that uh, would have no chance of being won to begin with. The problem with Section 101, improvement of the regulatory process, means that our legal office would be preparing advance notice of proposed rulemakings for the Federal Register, one after the other on significant risks, and we'd have to divert resources away from field compliance just to processing Federal Register notices. Would you submit a more full answer to that particular question in writing? Because I think it's a very key question. Okay, now I'm asking ask about regulatory fees. Can you impose those fairly on manufacturers based on the mandatory consumer product safety rules? Why I think and it would why be not? very difficult. Why? Well, I don't know what the base for the fee would be. Um, the difficulty would be in setting an appropriate fee? It would be very difficult. Or in, a, in, in seeking the fee from the manufacturer. You also uh, wouldn't catch importers. Let me ask another question about the safety of consumer products in making appointments to the Commission. Is that desirable, undesirable, or neutral? I think it's uh, desirable and... Um, I was I hoping you'd find one provision you like. And, okay, and you. presumably, I think the President does do that. Uh, one more comment. Uh, is a violation of a labeling requirement determinative that the product presents a substantial product hazard is subject to recall without performing any cost benefit allowance? Would you co comment? It, it shouldn't be. Should not be. Should not be. Why not? Shouldn't the cost benefit analysis be rather important? I would think it might be. Well, it's, I think, a little drastic. I, I think on most labeling questions, uh, you have other. Uh, penalty provisions that you could use, they wouldn't be as drastic as a recall. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, favor product-specific designations in a bill? For example, previous bills we've had to do with uh, foam, foam rubbers, the different diff foam uh, insulation, things of that nature. They've mentioned specific things. And this present one uh, mentions disposable lighters, sleepwear, and so forth. Do you believe product-specific legislation by Congress is a good idea, or do you consider it micromanagement, or do you consider it that uh, perhaps it's very helpful to you? Micromanagement. Micromanagement. Not helpful at all? I don't think it's necessary, because I think all the issues that are proposed in the Chairman's bill uh, are under active uh, consideration by the Commission. Okay. I have a number of other questions I'd like to submit in writing, but I realize my time is well spent, and I'll return the time to the chair. Time and comment has expired. <coughs> Just ask one or two questions to clarify and then uh, excuse the chairman and the, and the staff. I'm interested in, in the description of some of the provisions in the bill as unprecedented. You've made reference, the council's made reference to the attorney's fees provision, and the concept of having a deadline on the requirement to act on petition. That's really not unprecedented, is it? And the fact is that it was in the law until the law was changed until 1981. So, I mean, what we're talking about is going back to the original intent. And incidentally, the philosophy in some circles around here is that we ought to have more original intent. Um, th th what we're talking about is having the original intent that was changed in 1981 um, so that really it's not unprecedented. We shouldn't be talking about this being an unprecedented initiative, should we? Well, we ask the chairman if he wants to defer, that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm not sure about the word unprecedented, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, it's your word. Okay, but let me give you an example. I think to put a time frame on a, uh, or one year time frame on obtaining a performance standard for ATVs is unreasonable. I, d I don't think you can get it. Is it a two year? I think you could get it in two years. 
Well, you say that the concept is, it's a perception. You may not agree with it. The perception out there and in most quarters is the agency is not performing in the way that some of us would like it to perform. In order to do something other than just accept the status quo, there is a need for higher degrees of responsibility. We are grappling with means of trying to get some assurance, some responsibility. Therefore, when we talk about 120-day limitation to respond to a petition, we want to ensure that somebody at some point just doesn't yes everybody to death and doesn't do anything when a petition mm -hmm. would be submitted. So I don't think that's a radical um, or unprecedented approach. We have that approach in many areas of the law. Give an agency a time frame within which to respond. Mm -hmm. If you don't like 120 days, you want 180 days, 200 days, that's fine, but this is not unprecedented. Well, the, the difficulty with the time frames is I, I think in, in many cases it could work to the disadvantage of the consumer. Uh, if, a, if we have to, you know, if we decide a petition based on the uh, information available to us at that point in time, if the clock runs out at 120 days and we have to decide if the evidence uh, is not available yet to grant the petition, then we're forced with denying it. And I think that is the kind of uh, restriction that we would prefer not to have. Obviously, there needs to be some time frame in which action has to occur that's reasonable but it almost always depends on the complexity of the issue that we face. Um, relatively simple products can be done quickly. Things that are technologically complex, such as ATVs or chainsaws or riding lawnmowers, those are things that, uh, let's say chainsaws, which took the agency six and seven years to develop sa uh, greatly improved safety circumstances. If we had a one-year deadline, um, we, we would have we would have gotten zero because at that point we wouldn't have had enough information to proceed with either a mandatory or a voluntary standard. But you're but working from the assumption that the year comes and you haven't been able to make a determination, you reject it. What if we put in a well statutory uh, tilt that if the year comes and you haven't made a determination that the petition has to be accepted? Well, we can accept it, but that doesn't mean we can defend it if it's challenged in a court. In other words, we, we will not have the record on the basis of which uh, to, to make a finding. So we, we would be then going down the track of being challenged in court knowing that the record we develop does not support uh, the decision that was found. Uh, so I don't, I don't see how the safety of the American public is, is improved in that way. In, in most cases, Mr. Uh, Florio, we got to obtain data once that petition is in. The Diana Denton uh, petition in 1985 on cigarette lighters, uh, <laughs> we had to find out how many cigarette lighters fires uh, involved children. We found out then it's approximately 140 annually. 125 of those are kids under five. Then we have developed a systematic approach to uh, groping with that, that problem. But that takes time, unfortunately. Well, that, that of course is the problem because even in your regulatory agenda issued yesterday, you are still evaluating, and in fact, you've got it described as undetermined what action, if at all, you're going to take. Now, if we're sitting here a year from now and the next agenda comes out and says it's undetermined, that's not acceptable for a lot of people. Therefore, we want to put some degree of accountability. And we don't want to have arbitrary time frames, but we want to have some time frames within which we can assure that someone in good faith is making a determination as opposed to putting it on a back burner somewhere where no one's ever looking at it. I think, Mr. Chairman, we agree with that notion that these things should be, d be done as expeditiously as possible. And I think th the cigarette lighter one, a child making or attempting to make them child resistant, is one in which we've tried to move as quickly as the data will allow. And we have, I think, a, 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 a report coming to the Commission in December on the basis of which they can decide uh, what policy direction they want to go. So in December, we'll see the Commission capable of making a decision? I think at that point they should have enough information to determine whether or not they want to go forward sure, with that's, an that's ANTR. that's the first good thing we've heard today in terms of a specific action did that we will we'll see. Let me ask one last question. Could, very could, I, could I just add one thing to that? Uh, nothing has been uh, mentioned today uh, regarding the uh, lawn dart issue, but uh, as you know, the Commission did publish a Federal Register notice on October 20th uh, at, with the publication of an AMTR. Yeah, but that, that review said you were going to look at the existing system to see if it's working or not. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of specificity that would give anybody, least of all someone like Mr. Snow, any, any comfort that something is going to be done beyond what it is that's being done now. Ch Chairman's asked me just briefly, um, 
no, the fact of the matter is, is that this regulatory action could lead to a ban. And even if the only option that well, there is a ban could lead to a complete ban. The elimination of the exemption. That's correct. And the, um, when I said ban, I meant complete ban. The fact of the matter is, is that the only way that the commission can get to a ban legally is through a three-stage rulemaking process. So the commission is not dilly-dallying with the action that it took on October 1st. Is that it the same thing with regard to, you say, the only way you can get to a ban? Well, you've, you've got a ban, but you've got exemptions. Do you have to go through that same process to remove the exemptions? Absolutely. As you would if you were starting initially from scratch to Ab eliminate? Absolutely. And okay. I'm pleased that Mr. Snow had called my office and an attorney in my office explained that to him. Let me ask one last question uh, so we can get to the other witnesses. And you've made much today of the, um, the effort to stop toys from coming into the, uh, to the country. Um, one of the things that's in the regulatory agenda that I made reference to before was a pending petition to amend your small part regulation to prevent choking by children under three of, uh, of toys. Does that mean, and that's regarded as um, yet undetermined, does that mean that toys coming in with small parts for which there is no regulation are unable to be seized? Uh, well, there is a regulation on small parts. Well, what uh, is Mr. Chairman, I think this is now. in reference, I, I don't have that uh, regulatory agenda before me, but I believe it, it has to do with the petition uh, submitted by uh, New York State's, uh, New York State Attorney General's Office, uh, which asks us to amend the small parts regulation. They want us to increase the size of this cylinder from, uh, 1.25 to 1.68 inches. inches. What is it you're doing about domestic toys? I mean, you're seizing toys at the port of entry. Well, we have an ongoing field compliance program that has not uh, changed. Well, uh, is this, I mean, uh, when you say every, Everything we're doing on the import uh, uh, program just mm -hmm. augments the other work that's being done by the commission. Mr. Chairman, on the domestic front, um, we, we, we have traditionally had an ongoing market surveillance of, of toys. Mm -hmm. um, however, obviously, it, it's not nearly as effective on a volume basis as the import program will be. We get more toys, and we obviously at the import level, we get virtually 100% recall as opposed to a 10 or 15% recall at, at when, when you do it at the retail level because you, you just can't get them all back at the retail or the consumer level. Did you say a 10% recall? 10% effective. 10% effective 10 to 15 on percent. a recall proposal. On a recall, when, once it's at the retail and consumer level, the, our ability to get them back is very, very limited. Um, however, obviously, at the import level, if you can stop them on the docks, we bat nearly 100%. Something like two-thirds of the toys that we regulate are imported, so by right. putting resources into this program, you're getting a bigger I assume that, that that poor recall compliance is a result of resources. You don't have people out there on store shelves and things of that sort. In that vein, are you supportive of what our bill does uh, in allowing the attorneys general to play a more effective enforcement role in enforcing those things that you, for whatever reasons, don't get around to deal with? Our general counsel's office has uh, explored that. Could Mr. Lacey be allowed to respond? Sure. Two quick points, Congressman. Uh, first of all, there is a provision for any interested party to, to bring a uh, enforcement action of this nature. The, the points that we would make for the committee to consider are that the 30-day notice requirement is somewhat diluted in this, in this case, such that it would be uh, conceivable that um, uh, actions could be brought that the commission would have uh, uh, no information about prior to the time that it's brought. The Are you concerned the about irresponsible action on the part of attorneys general? Well, the problem that you have goes to the um, other provision coupled with this, which allows an attorney general to seek civil penalties from our federal statute. What's troubling about that? Well, when you look at the original findings and purposes of the Consumer Product Safety Act, you'll see that the point is made that the CPSC was enacted, quote, to develop uniform safety standards for consumer products and to minimize conflicting state and local regulations. The problem that we have here, Congressman, with all respect, 
is the problem of conflicting state enforcement policies. Presumably, and we're not we're not talking about different laws. We're talking about one law that's that correct. Uh, would be enforced. And you've been lamenting the fact all morning that you don't have the resources to enforce the law. Here we are talking about supplementing your resources with the same degree of uniformity at the local level. I think the problem is the fact that it's it's not quite so simple when you have 50 different attorneys general mm -hmm. uh, looking at one law and you have a National Consumer Product Safety Commission which is purportedly setting a uniform consumer product safety environment I for the nation. I understand what you're saying, but quite frankly, you ought to just give some serious thought to capitulating on this, on this issue. That in fact, it is unjustifiable from the standpoint of the general public as to how you can come in and say you don't have the resources and then deny. And again, we're not talking about just anybody on the corner. We're talking about the chief law enforcement officials of the state who want this authority. And again, this is not a partisan thing. We've got, I assume, as many Democrats as Republicans. Um, and what we are talking about doing is having good enforcement capability out there. And I understand what you know, ideological arguments you may have, but this is something you ought to really think through and withdraw any objections to this provision. Mr. Uh, Cameron? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think one problem that I would have would be with that 120-day time limit in your mm -hmm. bill. Um, I'm afraid that what we might deem more important commission priorities uh, would take a back seat to maybe an issue that the Vermont State Attorney General thought was significant for his or her area. Uh, that still may not be a, a national safety issue, and I'm not quite sure how you work all that out. Well, presumably he's only going to seek enforcement of the laws that are in the regulations that you've got that are nationally applicable. Is it I, I think this is an area where uh, we, we probably all agree that getting state and local assistance to enforce our laws probably c is workable. In other words, we have a lot of contracts with state and local jurisdictions now that help us, and I don't know what the legalese is here that, that, that might be a holdup, but certainly uh, Chairman Scanlon has always been a strong supporter of state and local efforts uh, to work with CPSC uh, to enforce our laws and provide other services. So I think it's probably something that philosophically uh, there's agreement and maybe just the mechanism needs to be to be clarified. But uh, we'll look forward to the chairman reviewing his position on this and hopefully coming to the point of feeling comfortable supporting what the committee is trying to do in this area. And we thank you very much thank for you your very participation much. this morning. We're now pleased to have our next panel of witnesses, which is made up of um, Commissioner Carol Dawson, the vice chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and the Honorable um, Commissioner Ann Graham, Commissioner of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We welcome both of the commissioners to um, our committee. Their statements, likewise, will be made part of the record in their entirety, and they may feel free to proceed as they see fit. We'd be happy to hear from Commissioner Dawson um, first as, as Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you have noted, I do have a prepared statement, which I'd appreciate your making part of the record. I do want to thank the committee for uh, taking an interest in reauthorization. I think it's been far too long since the commission's been authorized by the Congress. And I also want to applaud your efforts uh, in general for oversight, because I think it's quite clear that, that uh, this, this is something which is needed. Uh, in my previous testimony last June, I mentioned that uh, there were um, couple of areas in the, in the current statute which I felt needed some revision, and those uh, mainly applied to the collegial structure, uh, the need for a two-member quorum, for example, and the need more for more senior staff accountability. I'd just like to reemphasize those two points. Um, and I think that overall, that although we have been, of course, paying a lot of attention to the ATV matter, that should not overshadow the other consumer product issues that we have been um, addressing such as have been discussed here today and which we will continue to address. I think another important thing that uh, needs to be stressed here is that uh, the collegial structure, although it may have problems, is also one of the great strengths of this commission. The ability to debate issues, the ability to exchange views and then come to a consensus decision, I think, is, is a good system. Another great strength of the commission is, is the dedication of its its top professional staff. I think we're very 
fortunate to have an excellent professional staff of people at the consumer product safety commission as small an agency as it is a lot of the credit for in fact most of the credit for the good that this agency does must be given to those professional staff people thank you and I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions thank I have. you very much Ms. Green. thank you mr. chairman I would simply reiterate Ms. Green, could you please pull the microphone in is that better uh, Fine. Is, is this on mm -hmm. um, I would simply reiterate that the Commission is accountable to Congress with all due respect I urge you to make us more accountable not only for our actions but our inactions as well I want to thank Senator D'Amato and those on this committee who have voiced very legitimate concerns, which I share. Consumer protection need not be and should not be a partisan issue. I think most of us agree that the consumer has the right to expect the products he buys are safe. Recent activities at the Commission remind me of the quote, no good deed ever goes unpunished. These activities have had a chilling effect and that must be reversed. The problems could be resolved if we all agreed to recognize what John Adams said over 200 years ago, we are a government of laws and not of men. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Let, let me ask uh, a bit about this um, Schmelzer affair. That um, the way the chairman explained it was that the, the gentleman was, was temporarily transferred because of management problems. An audit or an, a study was undertaken um, that made recommendations. The, the sense of the study, as I understand it, was that it was not as a result of, just, uh, of, uh, of vacancies or personnel under management. There were other things that were a problem. Mr. Schmelzer has now been reinstated. I thought I understood the chairman to say that with the enhanced managerial control that is now in the compliance division, Mr. Schmelzer will be able to implement whatever these new recommendations are. First of all, I'm not sure I understand what the enhanced management control is, whether that means there are new people that have been put in to supervise Mr. Schmelzer, who is the head of the, uh, of the compliance agency. Can you help us understand what it is that happened in the first place, what it is that's been done to change the situation, and why we will have more compliance now as a result of the studies and the restoration of Mr. Schmelzer. It's a very confusing thing. And our concern is the one that's been made reference to this morning, morale. If the perception is out there is if you disagree with somebody, you get transferred and it's only when Congress makes a big fuss and we schedule hearings that something happens to correct the deficiency. That's a perception, real or fancy, that is not healthy for any agency to have. If we're gonna have people wanting to work in, in a in, a, in an action-oriented way. Can you help us clarify this situation? Would you like Dawson? me to respond, Mr. Chairman? Please. Uh, in terms of the uh, reassignment of Mr. Schmelzer, uh, that was uh, a decision made by the chairman. The, the commissioners were not involved in that decision. Uh, as I stated at the time, I was not aware of the reasons for the reassignment. Um, in terms of the, the study that's been done and the report that's been made, I did receive a copy of that uh, late last week. I haven't had an opportunity to really study that carefully. Uh, but it would seem to me that uh, in an agency such as ours that it's important that we always review uh, our, the effectiveness of our management, particularly in our compliance area. And I would have assumed that that was ongoing. In other words, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that that uh, is something that, that's just now being done. Uh, if there were problems found, then certainly I would support uh, uh, corrections being made. I'm, s I'm still not convinced that there were problems that were attributable to Mr. Schmelzer's management, however. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I agree with Commissioner Dawson. Uh, I think that David Schmelzer has an excellent record, and certainly there are problems in all our directorates, managerial problems, but I think I, w too, was against his move. I think we should have made a bigger effort to try to help him resolve problems, many of which he'd already identified for us. Can I ask a question about uh, Mr. Dannemeyer's legislation? One of the things that has been of great concern to many of us is this whole question and the issue of information access that as of now, um, there is some concern about the procedures that are uh, required to be followed before someone who makes an inquiry of the agency is able to get information about whether it be a specific product or a generic grouping of products. Mr. Denmeyer's bill, as I understand it, as I read it, um, maintains that to determine access to that information, the existing process, which is to have the commission spell out a procedure that is not even sufficient. Rather, what we have to have now is a rulemaking, a regulatory process to determine how
how information will be made available. That's particularly ironic because we can't get rules made for the safety of products, but we have a proposal to have rules made for access to information about the safety of products. Can you give me your thoughts on, on that, that approach right. to access to information? I, I believe you're referring to our, our uh, 6B rule. Yes. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, of course, I, I support the 6B rule. I think that, that, it, that it does provide a safeguard. It's, it's important to safeguard uh, confidential trade information and so forth, which the, uh, in the commission uh, obtains in doing its work. Uh, there are problems because of the ma uh, major resources that are required many times to process requests, such as you're referring to. Uh, it may be that there is a middle ground here where we may be able to find a way to speed up that process without uh, sacrificing the safeguards that I think are so important. But Mr. Dendemeyer's approach is not, <coughs> I mean, you're talking about a middle ground mm -hmm. to speed it up, mm -hmm. but it's my reading of the mm -hmm. proposal that it adds further restrictions so that those of us who would like to move off mm -hmm. of the existing uh, 6B procedures are talking about, in some respects, providing greater information, greater access. Um, I, Mr. Dendemeyer is not here, mm -hmm. so perhaps we'll save uh, it for him, but I, I would just like to know if you've had the opportunity to look through Mr. Dannemeyer's procedures and reinforce or refute my observation that there are additional restrictions that are going to be imposed if his provision were put into law. I think it's a very complex issue, the whole 6B issue and the procedures that are used. And I would like to have the opportunity to provide something in writing for you so that I make sure we that We would I like to receive it. that from mm -hmm. you all three of the commissioners as to their views as to whether the Dannemeyer mm -hmm. approach superimposes new restrictions on access to information when some of us are trying to go in the other direction. Let me yield to the gentleman from Ohio. I thank the two uh, commissioners for uh, being here and welcome your participation and observations. Um, I have an a August 30th uh, Associated Press article regarding the safety of local playgrounds in front of me. The article states that uh, 200,000 serious injuries occur every year on playgrounds, cautions parents to inspect playgrounds looking for such hazards as areas for head entrapment, shearing actions, uh, and the like, uh, broken, uh, faulty welds, cracks, and the like. Is this an area of uh, future investigation, of uh, uh, future action? Uh, uh we have designated playground equipment as one of our priorities for the next fiscal year, yes. And the, uh, the purpose of, uh, of the, the newspaper story, I guess, is one of which to draw parents' attention to what may be occurring in, in their children's playgrounds? Uh, I'm not familiar with that particular newspaper story. If it was something which the commission uh, issued that okay. they're quoting? If we have a copy of it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get it for you. Um, I was just trying to figure out, you know, how as you move through the, through the process, that's the uh, Associated Press story there. Again, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm applauding what you're doing. I'm just trying to figure out how this turns into something that CPS does, CPSC does. Well, it's uh, playground equipment is a, uh, a product, of course, which our staff has been dealing with for many years. Uh, we have access to the in injury information through the NICE system and through other sources. And so, of course, we're aware of some of the problems out there. It's my understanding that in the last few years, uh, the manufacturer of playground equipment has, has undergone changes just as in any other type of industry. There are mm -hmm. new, new types of products out there, new, new materials that are being used, uh, the prevalence now of, of the, uh, the wooden materials yep. and the, some of the finishes that are put on those are all issues that need to be uh, examined by the staff. That was the point, uh, Ms. Dawson, that I was going to make. My son uh, has a new playground, um, and it's all that wood stuff. And uh, one of the things they discovered was that uh, dozens of children were getting uh, splinters. And so the school board uh, tried to figure out, well, what could we put on these wood things so they wouldn't get the splinters? And a couple of parents raised the point, which was a very good one, is that some of these paintings or coatings that you would put on the wood may rub off on the children's hands. And then what, I mean, is, is there a whole scenario uh, that, that would follow? So. 
I would just, uh, I guess for what it's worth, advise you that I am very interested in, in CPSC's progress in, in, in this matter. Congressman, may I add something? Um, I think you need to get a little closer to that microphone. We've been Mr. working on a voluntary standard with, with playground equipment for approximately eight years, and it is, it's not a particularly sec successful voluntary standard. One of the things that I learned in preparing for the hearing is, is that uh, the wood, wood playground industry is not well represented on that uh, voluntary standard group, and, and the CPSC staff is going to work to try to find someone to put on that. I'd be pleased to. This whole concept of voluntary standards, we're aware of the interpretation of apparently the commission that um, they're required to defer to voluntary standards. The presumption being, at least in the minds of some of us, that that was um, conditioned upon, the deferral was conditioned upon someone working on a voluntary standard. Frankly, some of us take the interpretation that that was conditioned upon a voluntary standard being in effect. As you say, in this particular instance, you're working for eight years to come up with a voluntary standard. In the meantime, nothing happens. The bill that we've introduced uh, provides for de deference to voluntary standards that are in effect and that the commission determines are satisfying the purpose. Are you in any way um, uh, unhappy with our changing the law so as to make it clear, I think in accordance with what the initial intent was, that voluntary standards can be deferred to only when they exist? as opposed to voluntary deferring to something that may happen at some point that may not be in existence. Is that a concept that some uh, you feel comfortable with? Well, I think the experience of the Commission since the 1981 amendments has been, uh, as you say, sometime, sometimes it's not clear whether we're deferring before they exist or deferring while they're being uh, prepared. Uh, maybe some clarification might be in order there, but one of the problems that we have is that we can't issue a proposed rule, for example, when, a, when an adequate voluntary standard exists. So there's some, there's some um, uh, complications in the, in the statutes and that, that could be clarified, I believe. My feeling has been that, that uh, part of the intent of those 81 amendments was that um, the Commission would perhaps propose through an ANPR or some other method uh, information which would lead manufacturers to uh, be motivated to work with us to get a good voluntary standard. Of course, what the bill does is give them the ultimate motivation, which is to pay for the mandatory standard, uh, in a sense, and the concept of user fees is one in vogue nowadays, um, so that this, in fact, is the ultimate user fee, that um, if the voluntary standard is not followed through with, and the agency has to come up with a mandatory standard, the industry that is subject to the mandatory standard will pay the administrative costs of the agency uh, coming up with it. So that I, I thank you very much for your observation. Thank you, Congressman. I thank, uh, I thank the Chairman, and I concur with the, the observation that he makes. Uh, Madam Commissioners, I guess that's the proper way to address you both, and if I'm not, I'm willing to stand corrected. The reason uh, Mr. Florio and I have introduced the legislation we have is simply put, to try to make sure that a majority of whatever stripe works. Uh, Mr. Florio and I are oftentimes in sets of circumstances where we win and we lose. Uh, we get more votes than the other people, we win. And we don't, we lose. And the frustration that we have experienced in having to write in a mandatory way, a bill that we believe would, should occur through the normal comity of procedures in the CPSC is uh, not our preferred course of conduct. Uh, we would much rather allow you all to, uh, to, to do the kinds of jobs, reading the law the way you read it, uh, uh, to give true consumer protection. Uh, and so it's important for you to understand, I think the public to acknowledge that we move forward with this legislation with a desire to let the law work and to enable a majority of the commission to function. The significance of, of those remarks, I think, uh, uh, moves back into the discussion I had uh, with, the, uh, with the chairman and the general counsel over the reassignment of the lawyers involved in the ATV case. If the law is to work, 
then it must be administered by people of good faith. And it must reflect the majority determination in defining that good faith. Let's move into the deliberations of the ATV actions and, and the reassignments in which I was involved. It's my understanding, uh, I guess I'll, I'll focus on, on you, Ms. Graham, first, because you, uh, I guess, initiated the motion in, in this matter, that uh, on, about May, on or about May 27th, a majority of the Commission adopted a motion by you to enter in negotiations with the industry to explore the possibility of settlement. Is that correct? Yes. And the motion set forth a rather detailed set of circumstances. <coughs> it was. I identified the two attorneys that I thought should head the task force. And that you initiated a ballot, I guess is the way, uh, dated May 28th, designating Bechtel and Birnbaum, who previously had been designated by Scanlon, the Chairman Scanlon, as ATV co-team leaders on January 8th, as the CPSC negotiating team. That's correct. It's also my understanding that you were joined by Ms. Dawson on May 28th to transmit the ballot as required by commission procedures. You asked the general counsel to do so, is that correct? Yes. Uh, the general counsel you advised him was, was primarily a function of ministerial uh, and that if he chose to dissent, he should forward the ballot with the dissent. Do I understand that the general counsel refused to do what the majority of the commission asked him to do? He did. He refused to do so. It's my understanding then further on May 28th, the general counsel sent a memorandum to his staff further telling the staff that he, they must report to him any conversations or meetings that they have with any other commissioners. Do you understand that to be correct? Yes, I do. It's my understanding that the general counsel wrote this memorandum after receipt of the request by you and Ms. Dawson to transmit the ballot. That's correct, as far as I know. Do I understand that subsequently on May 29th, you and Ms. Dawson requested the chairman to direct the general counsel to transmit the documents? To the best of my knowledge, yes. And do I understand that the chairman refused to do so? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Do I understand that also on the same day the majority signed the ballot and wrote the chairman that they were construing this action as a binding commission vote? We, we did. Have you ever had a response from the chairman in that regard? No, we haven't. And, and Congressman, I'd like to take the opportunity to say that I feel that those two attorneys are the most competent to serve on our litigation task force. I, I have absolutely no problem with their replacements in terms of the competence, but those two attorneys had more um, experience on the ATV case than any other attorneys at the commission, and I think that their removal has slowed down our ability to file a case. Do I understand further that on June 1st, the general counsel then removed from the ATV project Birnbaum and Bechtel? It was about that time. Do I understand that the general counsel's transfer of these two attorneys goes against the advice of both you and Ms. Dawson? Yes. I understand that on June 3rd, the Commission's Director of Personnel Management informed Bechtel that his de effective de date of departure would be June 5th. I was told that. Ms. Graham, did you ever notify Mr. Scanlon of Bechtel's willingness to stay on the case? I, I believe it came up at that May 27th briefing that we had where we designated them as, as co-team leaders. Ms. Graham, did you, uh, Ms. Dawson, did you ever notify Mr. Scanlon of your understanding of Bechtel's willingness to stay on the case? I'm not sure exactly what the time frame was, Mr. Record. Those dates are a little fuzzy in my mind right now, but I do know that at one point I indicated to him that I had heard or I knew that uh, Mr. Bechtel was willing to um, stay and finish the case. But in all, in any set of circumstances, Ms. Dawson, you advised him mm -hmm. sometime prior to the June 1st decision that they'd be transferred or removed from, from the case. As I say, I'm not sure when, I can't pinpoint the date when that would be. We did get assurances from Mr. Bechtel before, we, before I forwarded the motion that he was in a position to stay if, if we went forward and, and made that motion. Ms. Graham and Ms. Dawson, I have in my possession 
a memo from mr back tell a copy of which was sent to both you and chairman scanlon dated may twenty ninth approximately one week before the chairman's appearance here before this committee in which he advised all of you and mr lacy that i have decided to delay my appointment at for for several months to work on the a t v enforcement matter i assume that the commissioners normally receive copies of memos when it's indicated on the bottom that they have received a copy of them normally we do i did receive that one you do recall receiving this ms dawson you do recall receiving this well then let me ask you uh, uh, i guess ms graham first did you attend the uh, january fourth uh, june fourth hearing yes i did is there any way you can construe mr scanlon the chairman's answer as being uh, as representing the facts as you know them, that he was not aware of the offer by Mr. Bechtel to stay? I'm afraid, in all honesty, no. Ms. Dawson? I have no way of knowing whether he actually had that memo, but um, I, I, I thought he knew. And you do recall telling the chairman yeah. yourself? Mm -hmm. In any case, both of you spoke to him prior to the June 4th hearing in which he asserted that he did not know. Ms. Graham? Correct. Ms. Dawson? Yes. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I guess the point I wish to make with this is that uh, it's never tidy legislatively uh, to have to write into the law compliance with the law. I believe the two commissioners who are here uh, could find a number of decisions with which I would agree on how you voted. But I believe the majority of the commission, which is presently testifying, uh, has made a conscientious effort to live up to the constrictions and opportunities of the Consumer Product Safety Act. And in a pattern and practice, Mr. Chairman, have been egregiously frustrated by someone who either perverts the law, intimidates personnel, or absolutely ignores their legal obligations. It's my intention, Mr. Chairman, and I believe yours, to write a law that allows the majority to function. And if you all decide you don't want to do something, God bless you. But I am convinced that at least a majority of this commission ought to be allowed to exercise the will of the majority of this commission. And that is in an attempt to protect consumers legitimately and honestly uh, in the marketplace. Uh, not to be uh, uh, in loco parentis on every shopping spree that every family ever takes to every shopping or any shopping mall in this country. But to pick the significant products, the serious threats, the inherent dangers uh, that exist there. I'm convinced, Mr. Chairman, that our, our statute, uh, our proposed statute is necessary uh, because uh, at least in one set of circumstances out of the three, uh, given unrestraints, given, given a lack of restraints, uh, that law is going to be subverted and consumer protection uh, will ultimately be uh, perverted. I don't particularly like uh, Ms. Dawson or Ms. Graham to have to walk you through these, uh, these kinds of circumstances. It's never easy. Uh, but I think uh, your answering to this particular line of questions uh, uh, is helpful uh, to me. And uh, to both of you, uh, I, I submit uh, for the record that uh, I appreciate your work, I appreciate your effort, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, ask one last question that perhaps you can be of some assistance to the committee. Uh, you heard me ask Mr. Scanlon, um, uh, Chairman Scanlon, the question as to what information he has with regard to the ATV developments at the Justice Department. We've heard this term highest priority for, for a number of months now. Do you have any sense of um, what it is that uh, you or we can expect by way of action by the Justice Department to make the determination as to whether they will or will not 
and decide to uh, undertake the, uh, the action that you've requested they undertake? Either of you have any information? Uh, I don't have any new information. I was pleased by what Senator D'Amato said, but I share your concern about the, che the checks been in the mail for a long time now. I, I endorse the, your efforts and your reauthorization bill. I think we've got to find a fix one way or another. Um, I, I don't have any new information as to where justice is. Mm -hmm. In as much as both of you, at least, voted for the action that you've recommended, I assume, therefore, you'll have no difficulties with enacting, by operation of law, into the law, the proposals that you've um, suggested be undertaken through the regulatory process. It is only out of frustration because the regulatory process is not being pursued that the bill that um, Mr. Eckhart, myself, and others have introduced decides to take the somewhat unusual approach of enacting, again, by statute, the approach that we would have hoped would have been undertaken a long period of time ago through the normal regulatory process. I assume you're supportive of our efforts in that? Regard? I am, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I think that the Commission itself has to take a great share of the blame for not having filed this case at this point, because by taking those two attorneys off and, and having the time necessary for the other attorneys to come up to get up to speed, we have not always been able to provide justice with everything they need to get their part of it together. I just would like to add that I, I um, would have preferred that the commission would able to be able to follow its, its normal procedures and, and get this case underway. Uh, I sympathize with the statement that Mr. Barton made earlier about he didn't care who did it so long as something got done. So I understand the frustration that everyone feels about this important safety issue. I think we all like to see something resolved and however it gets done eventually I think that the American pub public will benefit. Let me thank both of you for your um, help and participation here today. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. We now are going to move rapidly to our next uh, panel of witnesses. I have been informed that we're required to uh, leave here by about 3.30, so we have an hour in which to deal with two panels. Uh, Mr. Jim Ryan, Program Department Volunteer, the American Association of Retired Persons. Ms. Susan Weiss, Legislative Representative, the Consumer Federation of America. Pamela Gilbert, of U.S. PERG, and Dr. Mark um, Widom of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So we welcome you all to our committee. Some have been here before, and we appreciate your continued uh, willingness to be of assistance to the committee. We would ask that your uh, statements be put into the record in their entirety. Proceed in a summary fashion. Mr. Ryan, we're happy to have you here again, and are pleased to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee. Subcommittee will kindly be in order. Those who are leaving the room will do so quietly. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is James Ryan. I am a volunteer for the American Association of Retired Persons, AARP, a membership organization of more than 27 million Americans age 50 and over. We appreciate this opportunity to comment on H.R. 3343, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, and H.R. 3443, Consumer Product Safety Act Amendment. Our positions on these two bills can be summarized as follows. AARP supports H.R. 3343. We view this legislation as an important attempt to strengthen the Consumer Product Safety Commission as a regulatory agency and improve its management through reorganization. We believe CPSC should be reauthorized, adequately staffed and funded, and encouraged to vigorously carry out its mission. AARP opposes H.R. 3443, which would place Product Safety Administration under the jurisdiction of Health and Human Services. AARP believes the CPSC will be more viable to consumers if it remains an independent regulatory entity. Strengthening the CPSC, as envisioned in H.R. 3343, would give the Commission the tools it needs to carry out the goal of assuring better protection to American consumers. AARP is gratified that this bill includes a requirement for a study of the need to expand or revise the existing children's sleepwear standards to afford similar protection to adults. Lives can be saved with the use of fire-resistant sleepwear, especially lives of the elderly. Current laws administered by CPSC afford many important consumer protections, and the Commission has acknowledged and addressed some of the unique problems which older people experience 
as they use various consumer products. Nevertheless, AARP believes that the operations of the Commission can be improved. EPSC's leadership has not always followed the spirit of the law. Indeed, its inaction or inappropriate action has sometimes had the effect of undercutting consumer protections. Sadly, CPSC is a much weaker agency in 1987 than it was in 1974, its first full year of operation. CPSC has relied in recent years almost exclusively on voluntary action. Should voluntary industry standards prove ineffective, inappropriate, or be inordinately delayed, AARP suggests considering either a trigger mechanism to move to mandatory standards or stronger intervention by the Commission. Informal discussions with industry and voluntary action should not be substituted for mandatory regulation and or enforcement by the Commission are necessary. AARP believes in cooperative efforts with private industry, but CPSC over relies on this one approach. Prompt and effective voluntary action, such as warning to consumers and voluntary standards, is preferable. But CPSC must be ready to act when private sector action stalls. Recently, AARP had a disappointing experience when CPSC informally helped pull together an apparel manufacturers and retailers to address the problem of flammable fabrics. After a year of meetings, the Joint Government, Industry, and Consumer Committee produced a simple, straightforward educational brochure on nightwear safety. And we showed that to you at the June 4th hearing. But at the last minute, the business groups refused to put their names on the pamphlet, contribute to printing costs, or distribute it. Our association's time was wasted, and a year was lost in warning and educating the public, especially older consumers. When CPSC drags its regulatory feet and industry drags its voluntary feet, the public goes unprotected and preventable deaths and injuries occur. AARP appreciates this opportunity to comment. We look forward to working with the subcommittee towards reshaping and redirecting the activities of the CPSC so it can more effectively protect consumers in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. White? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Stephen White, legislator. Could you extend on your Sorry. Uh, I'm Susan Weiss, Legislative Representative for Consumer Federation of America. We represent over 220 national, state, and local consumer organizations with a combined membership of more than 30 million people. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come here today to testify in support of H.R. 3343. Uh, this bill addresses one of CFA's highest priorities, the existence and need for a strong and effective Consumer Product Safety Commission. The bill holds the promise of returning this agency to the job it's mandated to do and has been failing to do. We strongly endorse your efforts. As the nation's largest consumer organization, uh, advocacy organization, we have witnessed with great dismay the significant decline of a critical health and safety agency. Once considered among the government's most cost-effective agencies, the CPSC's recent track record reflects an agency which is frustrating its very purpose and squandering taxpayer dollars. Uh, H.R. 3343 represents a tremendous step towards reining in this agency and steering it back on the course which this Congress has mandated for it. The CPSC is adrift in its mission. It is failing to protect consumers from exposure to hazardous products, and it appears unwilling to either regulate or enhance private sector initiatives. And the cost to this nation is thousands of lives, tens of thousands of injuries, billions of dollars in health costs and wages, and more product liability litigation. The priorities of this agency, as we, as we have seen today, have become clouded. The rulemaking has drastically diminished. In fact, this agency has not promulgated a single rule under the final rule under the Consumer Product Safety Act since 1984. Its consideration of safety issues has plummeted in the past six years, and the cancellation rate of commission meetings and the number of safety issues it has considered is impressive. The statute currently requires a three-member quorum. So with only three commissioners, the failure of one to appear can and has dis derailed this commission's business. We applaud the bill, which would stop the disruption, as, as just evidenced, by permitting a quorum of two when three of the five commission positions are filled. Uh, we've heard a lot today about voluntary standards and, in our view, the undue reliance on these standards. And I, rather than go into any more of the examples that we've already heard, 
concerning ATVs and, uh, and the problems that we've witnessed with disposable lighters and the fact that this agency has before it information that 125 children die every year from these and we still have not seen any action on a, on a standard and instead deferral to an inadequate voluntary standard speaks to the need for this bill. Um, and I, I'd like to uh, summarize. We have come to ask this agency, uh, that this agency be reined in. It must begin to do its job. No one benefits from in an ineffective safety commission, not the consumers and in our opinion not in the end the industry. Uh, as eloquently stated by Senator D'Amato, this is not a partisan issue. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 87 pr promises to streamline the agency's practices and stem the bleeding of personnel and resources that has beset the CPSC in the past six years. CPSC began 1981 with 900 full-time personnel and a budget of more than $42 million. Since then, its budget's been slashed by 30 percent and personnel by 40 percent. This has crippled the agency and has provided neither an improvement nor more cost-effective safety measures. Uh, the testimony we heard today is evidence of that. Uh, the measure proposes to tighten the regulatory process, reduce delays, and create regulatory deadlines for specific products that have fallen victim to recent agency delay or inaction. This agency would no longer be permitted to defer to a promised standard, one that is not final but merely hoped for. It would also not be permitted to defer to voluntary standards developed behind closed doors, closed industry doors. The bill provides for the consideration of comments by interested parties, such as retailers, academics, as well as consumers. And we urge this that this participation occur at the earliest stage possible to assure adequate voluntary standards from the outset. The CPSC's inability to address the risks of injuries posed by ATVs, disposable lighters, and other hazardous, hazardous products underlines the need for an effective mechanism for public challenge to agency in action. Interested persons must be allowed to challenge the agency when it has failed to act or when proposed voluntary action appears inadequate. Timely response and adequate review are critical to prod the agency out of its paralysis. Uh, currently, the CPSA, the Consumer Product Safety Act, provides civil penalties for violations of its statute, yet the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, which governs hundreds of household chemicals and safeguards our nation's toys, has no such provision. Uh, for the sake of our nation's children, we strongly endorse the civil penalty provisions in FHSA. By way of conclusion, Mr. Chairman, CSA believes that the reauthorization process today presents a critical opportunity to reign in this agency and to once again offer this nation effective health and safety protection. We have every faith that this bill can put the agency back on track as an effective watchdog for consumer safety, and we urge the subcommittee to give it prompt and strong support. Thank you very, for your very succinct presentation. Ms. Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Pamela Gilbert, staff attorney for the U.S. Public Interest Research Group. U.S. PERG is the national lobbying office for state PERGs around the country. PERGs are nonprofit, nonpartisan consumer advocacy organizations. I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to testify today in support of H.R. 3343, legislation to strengthen and improve protection of the public health and safety by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The CPSC is responsible for protecting the public against unreasonable risks of injury associated with the more than 15,000 consumer products available in the American market. When the Commission has actively pursued this goal, as it did in developing children's sleepwear standard, for example, it has successfully eliminated the risk of death and injury from thousands of consumer products. Unfortunately, recent evidence provides a view of an agency that, in the last six years, has almost totally abdicated its responsibilities under the law. The tragic result has been tens of thousands of needless deaths and injuries each year, costing society millions of dollars in untold human suffering. H.R. 3343 is a welcome and long overdue effort to put the agency back on the track of protecting the public from exposure to dangerous products that injure, maim, and kill unsuspecting consumers and their children. Last May, the Consumer Federation of America's report showed that there has been an astounding failure by the Consumer Product Safety Commission over the past six years to attend to even the most basic of its statutory obligations. The consequences of this inaction have been the continued presence of thousands of hazardous products in the market, the absence of effective safety standards for hundreds of consumer products, and the lack of incentives on industry to make safety a paramount concern 
when introducing new products into the marketplace. We commend the provisions of H.R. 3343, which forcefully address the Commission's stubborn refusal to regulate for safety when private industry fails to adequately police itself. The bill would remedy the agency's inactivity and excessive delays by requiring the Commission to act when a product poses a significant risk of injury, by establishing timelines for regulatory action, and by prohibiting the Commission from deferring to non-existing or non-consensus excuse me, non-consensus voluntary industry standards. Individuals who are directly involved in injury-causing incidents and their aftermath, such as consumers, medical professionals, and state officials, are often the first to learn of product hazards and to appreciate the significance of those hazards. We wholeheartedly endorse the provision that would allow interested parties to petition the CPSC for regulatory action and would allow those parties to receive a prompt response and then to appeal the agency's decision in federal court. Under this provision, the CPSC would be unable to ignore, as it does today, input from concerned individuals that shows the existence of clear product dangers and a means to eliminate them. We propose that this right be extended to rulemaking proceedings to declare a substance a hazardous substance under the Hazardous Substances Act or to be a banned hazardous substance or product under the Consumer Product Safety Act or the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. During the last six years, the CPSC has failed to act aggressively to promulgate new safety standards, to enforce existing standards, or to take action against products in the marketplace that present a, present a substantial risk of injury. Fortunately, however, during this same period, state consumer protection officials have not been similarly disinterested in actively carrying out their mandate. State officials, however, have testified that they are hampered in their ability to enforce health and safety laws because of their limited jurisdiction. Most products are marketed in more than one state and, and most, in fact, are distributed nationwide. State officials, however, can only enforce a law within their own state's boundaries. Therefore, to stop national distribution of a dangerous product could take enforcement efforts in as many as 50 different states, a mammoth waste of time and resources. We enthusiastically support the provision in H.R. 3343, which would permit state attorneys general and other state consumer protection officials to bring actions in federal court to enforce uh, consumer product safety laws. We also strongly endorse the section of H.R. 3343, which would require manufacturers to inform the Commission of malfunctions, defects, failures to comply with safety standards, and personal injury liability claims regarding the products they sell. This provision would enable the Commission to develop a database of information that would be an invaluable tool in carrying out their responsibilities to protect the public from product injuries. The database would enable the, the Commission, would provide the Commission with information about potential product hazards as those hazards are discovered. This would enable the Commission to begin public education campaigns, hazard investigations, and regulatory action much earlier than they currently are able to do. Um, I would like to uh, just make one comment about uh, the other bill that's pending before the subcommittee, the uh, Consumer Product Safety Act Amendments of 1987. U.S. PERG opposes this legislation because it will not solve the problem that, we've, that we are faced with of an agency failing in its mission of product safety. And also we believe that the CPSC should remain as an independent body with a collegial structure. Mr. Chairman, U.S. PERG commends you and many of your colleagues on this subcommittee for sponsoring this CPSC reauthorization legislation. We are hopeful that with the passage of this legislation, the Consumer Product Safety Commission will once again effectively protect the health and safety of American consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Woodham. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mark T. Whittem, MD. I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at the Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine. I'm also chairman of the Committee on Accident and Poison Prevention of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Indeed, I am here today on behalf of the Academy, an organization whose 32,000 pediatricians have a long-standing commitment to protect children from product-related injuries. It is in that spirit of child health advocacy, Mr. Chairman, that we want to congratulate you and your colleagues who have decided finally that dramatic congressional action is necessary to force the Consumer Product Safety Commission to meet its mandate. Over the past several years, pediatricians have taken every tack to attempt to overcome the inertia at the Commission with respect to all-terrain vehicles, which, as you know, 
remain unregulated freely available and hopelessly hazardous with each passing week more and more american children are killed or maimed while riding these dangerous yet very popular machines mr chairman when congress created the c p s c in one nine hundred seventy two its mandate was clear to protect the public against unreasonable risk of injury from consumer products with this mandate unfulfilled the public has now no recourse but to rely on you its elected officials to restore the integrity of the agency the legislation h r thirty three forty three although desperately overdue would help accomplish this goal and none too soon for the sake of children for as early as one thousand nine hundred eighty five the academy was here to report to the house the unreasonable hazards associated with a t v s between one thousand nine hundred eighty two and one thousand nine hundred eighty four there were two hundred forty eight reported a t v related deaths in the two and one half years since that testimony the commission although amply armed with enforcement powers has failed to take effective action by restricting the use of these vehicles today the toll mounts now more than seven hundred have been killed the victims include at least three hundred thirteen children under sixteen years of age one hundred thirty nine victims under twelve after two and a half years of unaccountable c p s c in action pediatricians believe that this technical nonfeasance must end how much brain injury permanent paralysis and premature death before simple definitive measures are taken mr chairman a t v s are not safe especially for children the commission has determined as much itself it established an a t v task force in april one thousand nine hundred eighty five the final task force report was submitted thirteen months ago this friday among its major findings are one children under the age of twelve are unable to safely operate a t v s two children under the age of sixteen are at greater risk than our adults on full sized a t v s and three the industry's current voluntary standards are inadequate mr chairman recent pediatric studies document the severe consequences of a t v use by children Spinal cord injury resulting from ATV misadventure was sustained by five children, managed over a 15-month period at the University of Alabama. Basilar skull fractures, liver lacerations, and splenic rupture were among injuries resulting from ATV mishaps in a series of 12 admissions over a 26-month period to the Pediatric Trauma Service at the University of Virginia. Seven children suffered head trauma from ATV incidents treated at the Gillette Children's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. At Virginia, the average hospital stay was 20 days. The majority of the Minnesota children suffered permanent damage or died. The litany is painful, persuasive, endless. Yet unlike so many of the childhood diseases with which we grapple, the cause of this carnage is not obscure. Current industry labeling provides for a minimum recommended age of only six years for the smallest ATVs. Experience in child development tells us that children lack the coordination, balance, reflexes, perception, maturity, and judgment to operate these motorized vehicles safely. No labeling, no education, no training, no practice, no supervision will fully compensate for this developmental immaturity. The truth is that the morbidity and mortality are likely to continue as long as these vehicles are available to children. ATVs are the most serious new product related hazard to the health and well-being of American children. Their availability and use must be restricted as li at least as forcefully as that which is contemplated by the legislation we today endorse. Your legislation, Bill 3343, is painstakingly framed to ensure that the CPSC once again will not only have teeth but use them. The Academy strongly supports this proposal which is intended to overcome the retrograde philosophy of governance at the Commission, which has rendered such a profound disservice to the children of this nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, all the witnesses um, at this panel. Gentleman from Utah. Mr. Chairman, we were up trying to straighten out the uh, maintenance problems on aircraft with the Eastern Airlines and so forth, and I had to miss a good share of the, uh, the testimony. I only had to catch uh, Mr. Dr. Wood Holmes and Ms. Gilbert, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Ms. Gilbert, you uh, mentioned that uh, 30, uh, 3443, the alternative, you've opposed that. Uh, were you aware that GEO made the same recommendations incorporated into 3443? Um, I, have, uh, I have read GAO's testimony before this subcommittee. Uh, my understanding is they did 
um, endorse they endorsed half of it. And they endorsed the part that uh, abolishes the commission, puts it in their HHS. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And then, and then felt that they did not have enough they information. They, they to felt a make single administrator was important, and you prefer a collegial group. From the, the testimony that I have, uh, did you I'm see much collegiality today? Former commissioners, yes. Excuse me. I said, did you notice any collegiality today? I noticed a, li uh, a little bit of um, <laughs> between two commissioners. Okay, uh, you heard the testimony of Cha Chairman Sandlin and Commissioner Dawson Graham. Based on that picture of uh, bureaucratic warfare that was presented to you, do you still think a single administrator is a bad idea? Uh, yes, I do. I don't think that uh, it's by nature of uh, multiple commissioners that we have the problems that we do at, at the Were commission. Were you uh, acquainted with the work of uh, Commissioner, former Chairman uh, Nancy Storch? Somewhat. And you had Mr. Scanlon on that commission at that time? Wasn't there the same kind of lack of collegiality then as there is now? We, I had, we had another commissioner who was equally combative, as I recall, at that time. In fact, there was warfare more perhaps then than, than now. Wasn't that true? That might be. I'm not, I'm not intimately familiar with the Only the difference is we had four people to divide among us instead of three. What's the right number? Should we have three, five? What's the right number? One, three, five, what's the right number of commissioners? Mr. Nielsen, I, I cannot answer that. I, I really don't know. I think that a multiple uh, person body is the it best for making We didn't decisions. have collegiality with five. We didn't have it with four. We don't have it with three. I'm wondering, is there some magic number? I don't think hmm. the number is the, is the relevant consideration, but I do believe that with a single administrator, there would be even more of a risk of uh, one person sub subverting now, is the your mission of the agency. Is your opposition to a single administrator the fear that the current, current chairman might be that administrator? Is that part of your fear? Or, some, or someone with an equally um, uncommitted to the mission of the agency. Okay. What if one of the two you happen to like was, were that single administrator? Would that be all right then in that case? Well, no, it would not. And I guess that's the problem is who would be that one person. And I think we have a better chance of of quality decision I'm making and independence on the part I'm of the I'm just wondering if it's a, based on who happens to be the administrator. Mr. Ryan, I understand you're testifying in favor of, uh, in, in lieu of Mr. Denning. Uh, you criticized the commission for failing to move more aggressively to regulate flammable apparel. The statement Arthur Delbert uh, attached to your testimony states the U.S. Fire Administration has not yet broken out of data to determine what areas of fire causation contribute most significantly to the Elder Fire Program. Problem, I should say. Does it make sense for the commission to spend a great deal of time and money regulating clothing when something like space heaters or flammable furniture might be a greater problem? Uh, yes, sir, I think it, it does make sense. I'm not sure that I agree that they're a greater problem. When the children's sleepwear standards were being established, the data that was available then, and I was the chief of the flammable fabric section of the Bureau of Standards at the time, so I was handling those data, showed that the problem was just as great for the elderly as it, as it is for children, it was. However, there was a problem of how you would identify clothing for the upper elderly, a discrete group, and say that we're going to regulate this top 10%. In the decade and a half since the children's sleepwear standard went into effect, production of fabrics that would meet that standard has increased greatly. And CPSC is, in fact, prepared to go into the marketplace and find out how much of present adult sleepwear, in fact, meets the children's sleepwear standard. I think the technological problem has largely been overcome that we had to defer to in 1970, and it's feasible now. Wouldn't it make sense for a manufacturer to, uh, to manufacture sleepwear, especially for older people, because he has the material and the know-how? Wouldn't it be to the advantage to market and so promote it? And if so, why not? Why don't they do it? In approximately 1970, there were hearings, the other body, at which uh, J.C. Penney testified that they had voluntarily marketed such garments, and they had, uh, and they declined to identify how little sales they had. However, Sears Roebuck indicated that they had had them available through their catalogs nationwide for three years, and in three years had sold a total of 25,333 units of children's sleepwear at a time when annual, this is in the zero to six X size only, at a time when annual production approximated 70 million units and they sold an average of 8,000 when it was voluntary. Let me ask you the same question I asked Ms. Gilbert. Uh, she is opposed to a single administrator like the collegial body. I assume you agree with that? Yes. 
It's interesting to note that uh, Mr. Statler, who was a commissioner, a Republican appointed by Mr. Carter, and Mr. S uh, Ms. Scanlon, a Democrat reported by Mr. Reagan, seemed to be on opposite sides of every issue, and I couldn't tell who was the Republican, who was the Democrat, who was the, I, who was the Carter appointee, who was the Reagan appointee, and there seemed to be a conflict. You take one side, I'll take the other all the time in the previous commission. Now we have the two Republican members who seem to be the good guys in this instance, and the Democrat chairman is the bad guy. Does it seem, is it, is it really needed to have three people? The, the reason it was done initially is so both parties would be represented. But the parties have been blurred in their actions and their activities. Is it really ne necessary to have both parties handling it? That hasn't seemed to work too well in my experience since I've been in the Congress. I think it's highly desirable. And from 1973 until I retired in 1983, I was on the staff of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So I saw the first five and most of the commissioners up to the present three. I think Mr. Scanlon came on board a month or two after I retired. Mm -hmm. So I won't re I'll, I'll stay away from the present three. I personally, and this is a personal observation, not AARP's, I personally think five was better than three because you had a better chance of at least three fairly objective people discussing things in an objective way while maybe one or two others appeared to be in, embroiled in, in bitter battle. The three could have, uh, and did in many instances, uh, and in some instances all five were, were, let's say, more peaceful people, at least openly. They discuss things in an orderly manner and it arrive at conclusions. It doesn't seem to have a, a particular partisan coloration, does it? No. In fact, one would almost guess the opposite uh, if, we, if we're not uh, told otherwise, wouldn't they? Well, I'm not sure what the opposite means. Well, but, uh, you have the majority members of this conference uh, putting all sorts of uh, praise on the two Republican members and all damnation on the one Democrat member. That seems kind of an anomaly to me, and uh, I just uh, wonder if that necessary partisan balance is really a, a recommendation for it. It has not worked in this agency at all. It may work in some agencies, but it does not seem to have provided the collegiality and the compromise and the working together type thing that we would have de desired from that approach. Well, Mr. Chairman, the, the original five commissioners, two of them were technical people. Uh, Dr. Kittle from uh, Pittsburgh University, I think, and Dr. Kushner, who was, had been the deputy director of the National Bureau of Standards. I think these people were picked for their objectivity rather than their political affiliations. And I think, yes, but your obser but observation but is true. But doesn't the law require there be representation of both parties on the commission? The law requires... Usually, usually when there's an odd number, at least two have to be from the minority side. I'm not sure about the present provisions, but as the law was originally written, it said that not more than three could be from the same political party. Well, if you have five, that means there must be two from another party then. You could, in fact, have one from another party and one an independent. That never happened, but theoretically it's possible. Is that a desirable provision to require both parties to be involved? I think so, yes, sir. Okay, let me ask uh, Ms. Ms. Wise a question. Your testimony is critical of the commission, stating it's frustrating its very purpose and squandering taxpayer dollars. Uh, do you have orga your organization have data that show that consumers run significantly more risk and suffer relatively more injuries from consumer product uh, now than they did in, uh, before 1980? Well, I'd have to provide that, but that is what, our, what our report showed. Yes, I will submit Would you please later. provide that? Mm -hmm. And the same question for you, Dr. Widom. Do you have any information that would indicate, compare effecting this commission from its, from its inception right to the present time, year by year or whatever, however else you want to break it down? Is it becoming less effective than it was? Is it more politicized than it was? Uh, what are the problems? And would you supply such data? The the Academy of Pediatrics was uh, involved in some of the testimony at the uh, first authorization of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and it was our opinion that uh, hazardous products were much more reliably removed from the marketplace early on than they have been in recent years. I will provide you with more detailed data in writing. Do you think that, uh, Ms. Ms. Wise, back to, to you again, do you believe in, in the 3343, uh, it's mostly product specific, a lot of it is product specific, as was the first reauthorization in terms of the uh, various standards. Do you believe Congress should legislate whenever a possible hazardous product catches attention? In other words, should there be specific legislation for ATVs, for example? Well, I think ATVs are... Suppose we're in between authorizations, that uh, whether it's a two-year, or three-year, four-year reauthorization, we're in between that period. Should we amend it and bring it up each time there's a new product that comes on the market to attention? Yeah, I think in the ideal world it's up to the 
commission to be doing its job. And I think what we've been Congress hearing Congress should not today, have to do that every time a new product comes in. Well, we'd like to see Congress not have to do that. But if you have a responsive mm -hmm. agency, then you wouldn't see Congress doing it. The problem is, I think, has been made clear today that that is not the case, particularly with APVs and the, mm -hmm. other, the other items listed. What about the swimming the pool covers? You mentioned those as being particularly hazardous. And uh, yet this legislation doesn't include them. It mentions other products. Should that be added to the bill? Well, I think that what, what we're hoping is that the agency has, has at least is at least going to take some action with respect to those what measures. About, what about bunk beds that might cave in and break them? And well, that's pending before the commission right now. But that's not mentioned in the legislation. That's right. Are these as important as the ones that are mentioned? I don't know if you can particularly balance. I mean, I think what's in the legislation are, are examples or mm -hmm. cases where the agency is so clearly what's not what's acting, and they are they are unreasonable risk of injury. What you're suggesting is the legislation should, is not inclusive enough. It ought to uh, say these are these not restricted to these. These are simply examples of things that ought to be regulated. I think what the legislation does, in fact, is address more broadly the issues of why the agency hasn't moved more quickly on voluntary standards, for instance, mm -hmm. on some of the issues that were uh, products that you suggested. And I, I think that's what we address as well in, a, in our testimony. Dr. Widom, you're a pediatrician of a, a great note, and you talked about the con severe consequences of ATVs in terms of uh, use by children, 800 injuries, I believe you mentioned. Uh, are the types of injuries suffered by children in ATVs more or less common than those by motorbikes or minibikes, snowmobiles? Snow the, the are they more or less dramatic than, than those other vehicles? Generally speaking, they've, they've been more dramatic, and I think that relates to the fact that we've seen so much head trauma and catastrophic neurotrauma as these machines flip over. Your is, question... Is that because they don't wear, uh, typically don't wear a helmet like as they do on a, a motorcycle, for example? Would that, be, would that be a factor? I think the helmet provides good protection when it's worn, and I think we've seen data from the Consumer Product Safety Commission that helmets are seldom uh, worn or more often not worn than worn. Uh, uh, does not seem to have as much effect on spinal cord injuries and paralysis and particularly the kind of neurotrauma that we've seen in Minnesota and Alabama. Uh, that relates more to uh, the mechanism of these uh, vehicles flipping over and, and uh, uh, you forces to the spinal column. You support Mr. Florio's bill on the ATV portions. What about the other parts of his bill on other products mentioned there? We are, we are concerned about a number of the other products. We're concerned about the, uh, about the butane lighters and, and the variety of other products that impact on uh, child health and safety. ATVs are the most obvious example. ATVs are particularly striking because they are so new and the types of injuries and the frequencies of injuries have been so dramatic. You mentioned that both bills are painstakingly framed to ensure CTSC once again will not only have teeth, but use them. You say they don't do that. Uh, uh, why do you say that? We, uh, what would you do to change let me, them? Let me, let me clarify. What would let you do to change them so they would be painstakingly drawn so we would have a better consumer product safety? L let, me, let, me, let me clarify the written, the written statement that we submitted. We are in favor of Bill 3343. We do believe that the Consumer Product Safety Commission should remain an independent agency rather than being absorbed into Health and Human Services. Okay, let me ask this question. As compared with 3343 or 3443 and a simple two, three, or four-year extension, which is the best way to go? We would be in favor of uh, Bill 3343. That's not my question. As com you uh, then I don't you prefer that over a simple extension? We prefer that over a simple extension. Why? Because we believe that that the Consumer Product Safety Commission has not made progress in recent years, that the ATV issue being one example has really been uh, uh, not dealt with adequately, and that anything that, that, that we can do to get them to, uh, to institute mandatory standards would be worthwhile. Chairman is glaring at me. I better quit, but I did have to ask one question. I couldn't ask the two commissioners here. I was at the other hearing, as I mentioned. And that was simply uh, uh, a question about uh, why, well, maybe I won't ask this question to you. I'll, I'll wait to get another chance. I'll, I'll submit those questions to the commissioners in writing. I have a question they need to answer, though. Uh, why they were split into two groups has not been answered by anybody yet. I didn't ha wasn't here to ask it. And I also have another question I'd like to submit for, for, the, for the record, for the, for the commissioners in writing. Chairman permitted, I mean, chairman needs more time. Chairman needs more no, no. I, the commission, is, the question is not too appropriate for this group. Uh, 
Let me ask this question to the other men, the other members of the panel. Is there anything wrong with just a simple extension? You know, we, the reason I asked the question, we batted this around 1983, my first chance, first time on this committee. I was just newly elected. We spent a great deal of time building a bill with all sorts of provisions, repealed 6B, we uh, took out the cellulose standard, we did a whole, whole bunch of things. We insisted they have 10 regional offices, we insisted they have at least 600 personnel at all times and so forth. We had all kinds of provisions. And then we, on the floor, we took it all out and gave them a simple extension of time and a 7% increase in budget. And that was done on the floor. And I'm wondering, are we going to run the same risk now of getting it so overloaded with all these different things that you want to add and then do the same thing with Shelby Amendment on the floor that we had that then, which is, by the way, a, a compromise between the, uh, among the committee members uh, on the floor. It passed very overwhelmingly the amendment, is Mr. Shelby's amendment, who, by the way, is a Democrat, and uh, who still felt that uh, we maybe put too many little fluidities in the bill. Are we in danger of doing that? Anybody? If I may, Mr. Nielsen, um, there are dangers in everything. I would recommend going forward with something more than a simple reauthorization. Um, is there somewhere in between simple authorization and the rather complex bill we've got for us? Uh, I still personally favor, as does the AARP 3343. Uh, my reasons are as follows. Um, for lack of a better word, and I won't take time searching for a better word, I think any federal agency can every now and then stand a little and excuse the language butt kicking. Um, I think I, I agree that we should not put in that you should not put in the bill all the different products that you ticked off and other possibilities to legislate all of those. I think legislating one or two will make it clear to the commission that the intent of the Congress is that they get on with their work. As long as it is listed as a examples and not a complete ex exhaustive list. Yes. Now, uh, having you don't want to limit them to the ones that specifically mentioned. Having been a federal employee for 37 years, I appreciate the importance of legislative history. This committee's report will mean almost as much to the commission as the final act. So if you feel that you have to back off from some of the things in the bill, but can put them in the legislative history, that'll have a lot of See, impact. I'm in the uncomfortable position. I don't, I am a co-sponsor of the other bill, but I'm not too happy with the other bill and I'm not too happy with this bill. I think there's some better, something better than either one, and I'm trying to find some common ground there. Let me ask you personally, just a personal question. Were you disappointed when in 1983 the uh, CPSC bill was changed from a, all the bill with all those goodies in it to a simple extension? Were you disappointed? Actually, that happened after I had retired. I retired in well, January that's why, of that's why, your, uh, that's why your opinion is very valuable. Uh, let me be perfectly frank. I retired in January of 83 because I was disappointed in the first 10 years. Probably at the time of the reauthorization in 83, I was paying my least attention to what was going on with CPSC and getting involved in, in retirement. I but guess what uh, I'm really asking is, had we, had we not made a simple extension then, would we be better off today than we are for having the simple extension? Well, it's, it's difficult to predict what would have happened had somebody done something different. Um, I think you've, been, you've had enough experience to kind of guess what would have happened. I give you more credit than you're giving yourself. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to work with the chairman to come up with the best bill, get the best Consumer Product Safety Commission activity, whether it's se separate or whether it's it's going to, it's by its in the individual or put it in some other agency. I want to also make sure that we have it with enough guidelines, but without so much encumbrances that we, we sink it. And I want to do that in a way that we solve the problem, get the most consumer protection for the dollar. We've got to do that with our budget situation. We can't pile on 10 regional offices. We can't, which is one of the reasons we had a problem with it before. We can't restrict, man micromanage too much, but on the other hand, we have to make them sure they know their mission. Not so I would like to pledge to the chairman, I'm willing to work with him on that regard, but I do want to find ground. I don't want to go through the length of time we've done the other and then cave it all in and go back to simple authorization. And that's what I want to avoid in this particular case. Unless simple authorization is the best. That's why I try to get you to say, was it better or not? And you won't say it, so I, I, I'll leave that question. I hesitate on 83 because I wasn't watching carefully. Right now, I think simple authorization would not be better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired.
Let me just make three observations. One is the question of the simple authorization, the reauthorization for a two-year period, or as the chairman of the committee, uh, the com commission asked for a four-year period. In order to sign on to that, one has to be enthusiastic about the status quo, because there is no evidence that anything is going to change unless we change it, that is, the, uh, the Congress changes it. So for those who are pleased with the status quo, um, the simple reauthorization might be satisfactory. On the question with regard to uh, product-specific components that are in the legislation that the, uh, the committee is considering, I think it's important to note that with the exception of the all-terrain vehicles, where you have an end that is going to be achieved, the end is the one that the Commission said should be achieved. The other proponents on the specific provisions do not determine what the end will be, but put into motion the initiation of the process that the Commission has not yet initiated. And then with regard to the GAO, and we're going to hear from the GAO next, uh, the record's got to be corrected in, in the sense that the GAO report does not advocate the shifting of the agency over to HHS, doesn't make a determination as to whether it should be an autonomous agency or not, merely states its opinion that there should be a single administrator. Presumptively, that could be a single administrator in an autonomous agency such as we have now, and I'll be interested in getting from the GAO um, their sense of what it is that's unique about the Consumer Product Safety Commission that would dictate a single administrator as contrasted with the Federal Trade Commission or the Interstate Commerce Commission or any of the other autonomous agencies. So we'll look forward to hearing from the GAO in that, in that regard. Let me express my appreciation to this panel for your participation here today and say that we're pleased to work with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move to our last um, panel of witnesses. We have Mr. Richard Geimer, Esquire, uh, representing the um, United States Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Milton Bush will be representing the Sport Sporting Goods Manufacturers Association. We're going to ask Mr. Richard Fogel, the Assistant Controller General for Human Resources of the GAO, and Mr. Alan Dean, the Chairman of the Standing Panel on Executive Organization and Management of the National Academy of Public Administration, to come forward. We want to express our appreciation to this panel, particularly for its patience through the course of a long, but I hope a productive day. All of the statements of the witnesses will be put into the record in their entirety. We would ask that any of the witnesses, if they're accompanied by staff, that they introduce their staff. And we'd be pleased to hear from our uh, representative from the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, in the interest of time, um, and especially considering the nature of the questions that are being put to the witnesses and the testimony that we've heard here today, um, I would uh, propose to dispense with even attempting to summarize our 28-page uh, statement which has been filed with the committee and simply indicate to you um, the nature of my background as a witness for the United States Chamber of Commerce uh, so as to put in perspective any uh, responses I might make to questions which you wish to uh, put to me through, uh, through the, to the chamber, through me. I am a private practicing attorney in Washington, D.C., and have been involved with the consumer product safety uh, activities of the federal government since prior to the creation of the Consumer Product Safety Act. And from time to time, and in connection with each of the various reauthorizations that have uh, taken place since 1972, I have been either a witness on behalf of uh, either the U.S. Chamber or the National Association of Manufacturers or involved in the development of the positions that have been taken by those two uh, national organizations. Also in my private practice, I have had the experience of being involved in both the regulatory aspects of the CPSC's work, but also have been counsel to private litigants involved in just about every kind of conceivable litigation that the Commission's various statutes authorize, ranging all the way from administrative complaint proceedings, seizure actions, federal district court litigation for injunctions, and appellate litigation. And based on that experience, um, I can summarize the views of the chamber as reflected in their statement as simply this. 
we believe that the present problem you uh, are articulating with respect to the Commission's activities are more a function of personalities and views of the present uh, Commissioner than they are of deficiencies in the existing legislation. We think, and moreover, we think that the testimony today would seem to bear out that there are two ways to deal with this problem, one through actions of personnel doing what the law presently suggests should be done, or of tinkering in the detail of how the Commission carries out its functions. We, in all due respect, we have examined H.R. 3343 with a uh, fairly critical eye, and critical by that I don't mean negative, but uh, analytical eye, and feel that while the uh, objectives that you have indicated today so clearly are in your mind, uh, are things with which we would agree in general. We think that almost in each respect that the proposed remedy would merely detract from the overall objective of forcing this agency to set national priorities and to take timely action, and that most of the proposed remedies would instead detract from the Commission and allow third parties, outside third parties, or judges to set the Commission's agenda. And that, we think, would not be what you have in mind and certainly wasn't what was behind the creation of the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission in the first instance. And with that, I would uh, uh, defer to uh, the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bush. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, someone's representing Mr. Bush? No, I am Mr. Bush. President, Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to first take the opportunity to thank you, uh, Chairman Florio, for SPMA's opportunity to testify before your subcommittee on 3343 and uh, note that I am an attorney and director of Washington a operations for the Sporting Goods Manufacturers Association, the association that together with its sister organizations represents approximately 3,900 U.S. manufacturers and distributors of athletic clothing, footwear, and sporting goods equipment. Um, I will also summarize my testimony for the uh, benefit of time and the subcommittee, but will proceed through the bill chronologically commenting on those sections that are of concern to SBMA in Title I, Sections 101, 102, 104, 105, and in Title II, Section 203 that deals specifically with lawn darts. Um, I'll also dispense with the reading of the appropriate sections. But in, tit in Title I, Section 101, what you're doing is changing, uh, your, your changing the current standard for risk of injury to unreasonable. Um, under current law, an ANPR would be promulgated um, with the risk of injury associated with a product must be unreasonable. Um, by lowering the risk of injury standard necessary to produce an ANPR and redefining the standard of risk for the issuance of a consumer product safety rule, you are, in essence, uh, making a tremendous regulatory impact. And this, in fact, we feel will have a substantial effect on our company's international competitiveness. We feel that at the regulatory level, with this continuing promulgation of ANPRs by the Commission, uh, sporting goods are especially sensitive to those product area where the use and the nature of an activity creates a question of risk rather than the product itself. Our point in this area is that by lowering the standard of risk and encompassing enorm enormous product areas, you place on the sho shoulders of the federal government an overwhelming task that with this massive trade deficit and uh, federal budget deficit doesn't presently possess the resources to handle. I think it's important to point out, again, that consumer products are now regulated under this higher standard of risk. And it requires the Commission to make the same kind of tough decisions that our manufacturers make to remain com competitive in the, inter in, the in the international marketplace. There's a risk of injury associated with any product in international commerce. By creating lower standards, you add another layer of, layer of cost and make industry less competitive. Mr. Bush, if I could just ask a question on that point, because I'm not sure I'm, I fully understand the thrust. Materials that are made, sporting goods that are Correct. made overseas, right. put into our market, they're going to be required to adhere to the same standards. So how will you have a 
competitive disadvantage if in fact we have this higher standard that everyone is required to comply with um, well by by putting additional requirements for example possible la labeling requirements on lawn darts over and above what the current regulations specify you are in essence adding costs for example uh, one of but the aren't those costs going to be equal to what everyone else is being imposed having imposed upon them in other words you're not saying that foreign products in the, in the United States no for those don't products have to comply well it's a it's a it's a simple uh, it would be a, a labor cost uh, when you're talking about lawn darts for example you may be uh, talking about affixing a, a permanent label to the fin of the lawn dart for that pro for that process to, to take place in the United States the hourly rate for that uh, would be much higher than that overseas so there would be a differential okay, I understand. Um, another concern that we have in lowering the standards is the effect that it may have on voluntary standards activities of many other trade associations not only safety standards but also performance standards the current higher risk of injury standards allows affected in industries the time and opportunity to work out compliance problems in an informal and less costly manner than through the formal proceeding of an ANTR and if a voluntary standard is deemed appropriate develop one through its own industry trade association that has standards writing capabilities. Uh, we feel under the section 102 that the public hearing should not be discretionary, that one should be held uh, with publication in the Federal Register. Um, also in section 102E2, SDMA believes that there may be inconsistent application of the risk of injury standard when an unreasonable risk of injury is required in a de novo proceeding in a trial court and a lower standard is required to promulgate an ANTR or consumer product safety rule. In the information section, we are very concerned, section 104, um, which states that information which was not developed by the commission and which, on which the commission has included a statement that the commission is not responsible for the accuracy of the information. Uh, SGMA believes that this section contravenes the purposes of the bill, which is to improve the performance of the CPSC by allowing the P CPSC to publish possibly inaccurate data under a disclaimer not only lessens the stature of an agency that you're seeking to improve, but such data may be used improperly in a liability action that the chairman mentioned earlier on that could have the effect of emasculating certain evidentiary requirements related to authenta uh, authent authentication of official documents. Um, under enforcement by state attorney generals and other officials, I'll dispense with the reading of that statement, um, but we note that in 73, Congress saw the need for a separate institution, which is the CPSC, and we felt at this time when we prepared the statement that the American taxpayer would want this type of action to be taken by a state attorney general to be submitted to a, uh, uh, the state to call a referendum on this particular issue with the, uh, the developments that happened in the hearing today, which I was unaware of, with the state attorney general actually asking for assistance in this regard, we'd be happy to work with the subcommittee in that area. Finally, Section 2, uh, Title 2, Section 203, Lawn Darts, uh, states that the Consumer Product Safety Commission shall review the regulations and exemptions which apply to lawn darts to determine if stricter requirements, including a ban, are needed for the protection of consumers, especially children, from the hazards of lawn darts. The Commission shall report for Congress not later than one year from the date of enactment of this act, the actions taken under this section. As a representative of SGMA and the association that represents 80% of the lawn dart producers in the United States, we believe that the section at the present time is unnecessary because of the actions taken by the commission and the voluntary actions by industry. A meeting between the commission, SGMA, and its, and its manufacturers on July 17, 1987, following field audits of current regulations covering lawn darts by the commission, has resulted in compliance by SGM man manufacturers to the current exemption to the ban on lawn darts. I note the Congressman Eckert's statement relative to packages of lawn darts not meeting current requirements. I was unaware of that. I would let, we are planning on following up immediately after that uh, uh, because I have letters and have asked the manufacturers of SGMA to submit to me uh, measures that ha they have uh, taken to assure compliance to current regulations and I'll be happy to provide those letters to the subcommittee. In addition, and prior to the Commission's vote on October 1st, 1987, which resulted in the publication of an ANTR on lawn darts on October 20, SGMA agreed to develop a voluntary standard on lawn darts that would cover all new requirements propo proposed by the Commission on October 1st. SGMA believes that this newly developed voluntary standard worth will assist in compliance with current future regulations concerning lawn darts. Um, I'd like to make a comment relative to the lawn darts, and in particular, uh, Mr. Snow's case. It did come out in earlier testimony that 
the lawn dart that caused the death of Michelle Snow was in fact altered and misused. Um, if manufacturers are not able to produce products that are going to be used in the manner of which they are produced, and I know that the chairman of uh, the subcommittee can agree with me, then we're going to have a, additional problems in the product liability litigation area. Also, I would like to point out that at the commission level, the data was split on whether lawn darts should come under a ban or a number of four different options that were presented to the commission. One, a preponderance, I would say it was evenly split, and the information from those directorates within the commission said statistically the data did not support a ban on lawn darts. I, I'd be happy to go into the details of the statistics, but I won't for time. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for subcommittee for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Fogel, pleased to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce Frank Ackley, who is with me, who is the project manager of uh, a lot of the work we have done at CPSC. I will just fundamentally sub summarize two points regarding the recommendation we made in a report to Chairman Waxman in April of this year that the Congress consider uh, changing the administrative structure to provide for a single administrator of CPSC. And the second point, which I'll just mention right now, is that you're absolutely correct in saying we made no recommendation on whether CPSC should be an independent agency or in an, an existing executive agency uh, cabinet level department because we could find no criteria uh, that would allow us to make that uh, recommendation. We also could not find specific objective criteria to measure the effectiveness of a single administrator compared to a multi-member commission. But we did find several indicators that suggested to us that CPSC could benefit from changing to a single administrator. Based on legislative history of looking at commissions, there seems to be three rationales for going a commission route. One is the assumption that the long-term appointment of commissioners will promote stability and develop expertise. Two is the independent status would insulate them from undue economic and political pressures. And three, commissioners with different political persuasions and interests would provide diverse viewpoints. However, since CPSC was established, there has been little stability in its leadership. Both present and former CPSC officials cited leadership turnover as the cause of much uncertainty within the Commission. For example, in its 14-year history, the Commission has had nine chairpersons, four acting and five confirmed. Additionally, since 1973, CPSC has had eight executive directors, of whom five served in an acting role. One of the acting directors was later appointed as executive director. Furthermore, during 1976, 79, 82, and 85, the position of executive director was vacant for periods of one to ten months. And finally, of CPSC's 13 former commissioners, nine did not complete their appointed terms. Relative independence from political and economic forces, forces was often cited in CPSC's legislative history as a reason for creating it as an independent commission. However, real independent status is difficult to achieve. And that has been evidenced by reviews that have been done by the uh, OMB, by the uh, uh, need for Congress over the years to decide that it needed to legislate certain actions because it didn't think the Commission was doing its job. Another rationale for independent commissions is that they provide diverse points of view. However, the Commissioner's voting records do not show much diversity on issues they have voted on over the past five years. Now, we recognize that voting records are not the only indicator of diversity because much discussion about the pros and cons of various issues obviously takes place before votes are taken. But in the final analysis, it is the Commissioner's votes that result in policy positions. And at CPSC, from fiscal year 1982 through 86, the Commissioners voted for the options recommended by the staff nearly 90 percent of the time. And the Chairperson voted with the majority 95 percent of the time. CPSC's Commissioners voted unanimously in 73 percent of the votes taken. In looking at the Commission votes for the first nine months of this year, we found that of the 45 votes taken, 32 or 71 percent were unanimous. There were also eight split votes and five votes with an abstention. The final point I would like to make is that seven of the eight other health and safety regulatory agencies we identified have single administrators. 
These are EPA, FAA, FDA, the Food Safety and Inspection Service, the Mine Safety Health Administration, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. We believe these agencies have similar health and safety functions, as does the CPSC. We interviewed officials in five of these agencies, all of whom supported the single administrator structure, particularly because they believe this structure would enhance the decision-making process. Other evidence to support a single administrator is evidenced by the fact that 68 percent of all the high-level officials we interviewed who had expressed an opinion, including all former confirmed chairpersons and executive directors of CPSC, indicated that CPSC should be headed by a single administrator. And as I'm sure Mr. Dean and Mr. Seidman from Napa will uh, elaborate on, all major studies over the past 50 years, including the Hoover Commission and the Ash Council reports, have indicated significant problems with commission administrative structures, not necessarily in studies they did of CPSC, but in other studies they have done of government agencies. And we'd be glad to respond to questions later. Let, let me just ask one question at, at this point, just to get the record clear. I mean, when you draw the analogy between the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission and agencies like EPA and FAA, I mean, those are not, I mean, you're not representing that those are autonomous agencies. Those are agencies that wouldn't, they have single administrators, but they're clearly a generically different type of agency than does the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's clear. We're not saying they're autonomous. What we're, we're saying is that they are similar in that they regulate either some, well, they regulate some aspect of health or safety. Okay. We'll, we'll develop this a little bit more later on. Mr. Dean. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, my name is Alan L. Dean. I'm chairman of the Standing Panel on Executive Organization and Management of the National Academy of Public Administration and a former Deputy Assistant Director for Management of OMB. I'm accompanied by Dr. Harold Seidman, a member of the panel of the Academy and former Assistant Director for Management and Organization of the Bureau of the Budget. He's also, incidentally, the author, author of the leading book on the subject of government and organization. I'm going to address and, and only summarize my statement the two major organizational issues before the committee. One, the single administrator. Now, it's rarely possible in government management to generalize and about applicable rules, but one rule that has served the test of time is that multi-headed boards and commissions are almost never effective in the carrying out of executive functions. As Mr. Fogel has pointed out, every study from the Hoover Commission on has indicted the use of commissions and boards for basically administrative or executive functions, including licensing and enforcement. For that reason, in the days when I was in the Bureau of the Budget and in the Office of Management and Budget both, we tried in every possible way to help the Congress achieve effectiveness and accountability by trying to put executive functions under single officials whom they could hold accountable. It is noteworthy the GAO uh, and its... Uh, yes. Who can hold accountable? I'm sure... The that Congress can hold the accountable. Congress, I think, uh, 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 digressing a little from my statement, the testimony here today, the frustration expressed by Mr. Bates, indicates what a sticky wicket the Congress gets into when it chooses a five or seven or three member commission to administer a function. If you have a single administrator, accountability becomes possible and that was demonstrated in the current administration in the case of EPA. Lord knows what would have happened if there had been a five member commission running EPA at the time Mr. Gorsuch was there. But because of the accountability that could be enforced, once it became apparent that that administration that agency was not well run, that person left. And the Congress and the President put into office Mr. Ruckelshaus, who brought a much higher quality of management. The reason you're having trouble in this commission and virtually every other commission has little to do with the personality. It's structurally defective. And we would strongly urge, along with the GAO, that it, this, the way you work your way out of this problem is not some strange way of electing the chair, but rather creating an agency, having that agency under a single person, named by the President and confirmed by the Senate, whom you can call up and hold accountable as a single individual. Now, I would like to say that there is a relevance 
what FAA and EPA and these agencies do to the issue. They may be larger, but I spent eight years as associate administrator of FAA, and I tell this committee, Lord save the people of the United States and aviation safety if it had been run by a commission in that period. And I've never heard anyone in or out of Congress suggest that we depart from a single FAA administrator or a single EPA administrator. Now the second issue I wish briefly to address is the independence of this little agency. You know, listening to witnesses think that there's something great about letting some small agency float around in the government really amazes me. The history of small independent agencies is a troubled history. They rarely are very successful. Look, so look what has happened to this commission, to its budget and, and its manpower resources. It could not have fared worse in an executive department. The FAA was the largest independent agency in the government except the Veterans Administration for eight years. It concluded it wanted to be in a cabinet department. It was the FAA administrator that recommended that so that there would be cabinet leadership and representation of the function. As an advisor to the undersecretary and secretary HEW, I studied this problem specifically and we developed a bill contemplating the movement of all consumer product functions under what is now HHS. I still think that makes sense. I think that having a cabinet officer work for and watch out for a relatively small agency, having it related to other activities like food and drugs <coughs> under a single coordinating authority will also help this committee and the Congress and the people get the kind of administration of consumer product safety they're entitled to have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. You obviously you raise a very interesting question. Might I ask if your sort of semi hostility to the, the concept of autonomous independent agencies um, in terms of not being accountable. Does that apply equally to the Interstate Commerce Commission, the, um, the Federal Trade Commission? Do you feel the same way about those agencies that you feel about Consumer Product Safety Commission? Mr. Chairman, in its excellent report of 1948, the Hoover Commission, that on which the Congress is represented, urged that within the executive departments be placed all of the independent agencies with very few exceptions, and one they made an exception of was the economic regulatory agencies, some of which you mentioned. Here they recommended that the president name the chair and the chair be the chief executive officer of the commission. But you, Mr. Chairman, and I have seen a little of the ICC, and we know what it has contributed to the Northeastern Railroads, which was disastrous. Frankly, I think a poor case can be made even in the economic regulatory area. But here, we don't have an economic regulatory commission. We have a health and safety commission. Well, Mr. Dean, though, is, isn't it, and I'm not saying you're naive, but wouldn't it be naive to somehow try to make these artificial distinctions between economic regulation and safety regulation? There are a whole lot of people, including myself, who would make the argument that this safety regulation agency is really making the determinations on the basis of economics. Likewise, the ICC that deals with ostensibly economic regulation, depending upon how well it regulates the railroad industry, is going to be making safety determinations with regard to derailments that come from inadequate revenues that may come to a railroad. So these artificial distinctions between safety and economic, I think are, first of all, artificial, but over and above that, I guess, if I wanted to follow through your logic, to its conclusion, I'd almost have to say that there would be no ability to have accountability in any autonomous agency, and therefore I'd want to fold it into some cabinet division for purposes of accountability. But Congress spoke out a while back saying that there are certain areas where you want sufficient independence, that you don't want to have the administration, whatever administration, totally in charge and able to superimpose its mandate on the workings of these autonomous agencies. Now, I take it you don't agree with that. Let me first point out we have two issues. I would favor a, a single administrator regardless of the organization location of the agency. Okay. Well, that's but I am saying that just as food and drug is in HHS, as DOT uh, has FAA, 
so the experience over many years has indicated that these kinds of programs in the long run fare better when they can be related to other programs under a single powerful cabinet secretary who can go all the way to the president. In fact, let me remind the chairman and the committee that the Congress itself, in enacting the Reorganization Act of 1949, which it extended many times, stated that it would be the policy of the United States to group, coordinate, and consolidate agencies and functions of the government as nearly as may be by major purpose and to reduce the number of agencies by consolidating those having similar functions under a single head and to abolish such agencies or functions thereof as may be necessary for the efficient conduct of the government. That made sense to the Congress in many separate enactments. I think it makes sense today. And the Congress, of course, has taken whatever actions it's seen fit pursuant to that mandate. It has not yet seen fit to abolish the agency, and it hasn't seen fit yet to uh, remove the independent autonomy of agencies, not the least of which is, is this one. Dr. Seidman, who has Certainly. a great background here, would like to comment. I'd like to comment, one, on the questions of independence and autonomy. Placing an agency outside of an executive department does not make it independent or autonomous of the executive branch. It's still a part of the, exe of the executive branch. The assumption that small independent agencies which are not in an executive department are somehow autonomous and not subject to executive control is part of the mythology. The problem is, is at what level are they controlled? And the experience has been with quite a number of these small commissions and bodies, they're controlled by a budget examiner in the Office of Management and Budget. They well, can't go any higher than that. That's where the control comes from. Do so executive orders, um, in your opinion, do executive orders dealing with rulemaking, as an example, that have been issued so that agencies such as EPA can't even initiate regulatory agendas unless they get clearance from OMB? Do they apply to autonomous agencies, they such as the Consumer Product Safety Commission? They would apply to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The executive order does not, as it's now written, include the economic regulatory agencies. And that's the other point. You asked the question, Mr. Chairman, is the difference. And I think one of the inherent differences is to which between, say, the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission and the Consumer Product Safety Commission, I think there's a question of whether they're performing quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial functions. The commission form has usually been used where the emphasis has been placed on deliberation. If we and could that not, it's deliberation. If we and could that it's, not, it's not geared to getting quick action, which we've been talking about here. I've been listening with great interest to the testimony this morning about how the Consumer Product a Safety Agency has been very slow in acting. Now, one of the reasons you create commissions is often so you don't get <laughs> rapid action. It's desire to get deliberation and slow uh, consultation. The other problem with commissions and dealing with an executive function is, and this is the experience, where they agree, and you can't say 95%, the commission and agreement, they agree to what? You get usually least common denominator types of decisions. You go and try to get consensus about the lowest level on which you can get people to agree. Uh, and Those are the easy things to agree on. That's right. So uh, It's the major threshold issues that uh, we don't have agreement. I would say one thing here which is appropriate uh, uh, is that, you know, this debate about single administrator versus collegiate bodies about as old as our republic, and I think it might be a very appropriate Going back to George Washington, who what he said, I think, applies very much to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, in which George Washington said, wherever and whenever one person is found adequate for the discharge of a duty by close application thereto, it is worse executed by two persons and scarcely done at all if three or more are employed therein. <laughs> That's George Washington. <laughs> George Washington, one presumes, acquiesced in the idea that we shouldn't just have an executive branch of government because the whole concept of diversified powers was something that was the oh, heart. I, I agree uh, completely, Mr. Chairman, and I think a single administrator, as Mr. Dean said, provides better accountability to the Congress because I think it makes it much easier yeah. for you to exercise your oversight functions in dealing with a single individual than with a commission where they can pass the buck to each other and where you almost have a revolving door in the membership. Let me just ask, uh, ask that perhaps Dr. Seidman 
might review his response to us that the Consumer Product Safety Commission is not, or uh, rather is, um, under the authority of the executive order. Um, my understanding is that it's not, and I'd, I'd appreciate well, if well you got a chance. Be looking at the specific language, I know yeah. the, the, in the, when they drafted that executive order, which I must say I had nothing to do with it, yeah. but uh, did exclude the Economic Regulatory Commissions. Now, whether it excluded yeah. the others. Now, legislation, incidentally, that was taken up in the Senate did propose that the OMB review of regulations be extended to all of the agencies. Well, that's a very important the point, economic though, I mean that because in some respects, there are some people, myself included, that don't like the idea of having the degree of control by OMB over agency decisions that um, we would be concerned would exist if one collapsed these agencies into executive agencies. But as I you can appreciate, as you can appreciate, that uh, let's assume that we had a single administrator and we had this agency in HHS and Mr. Scanlon was the administrator, there would be uh, a lot of us that would not feel comfortable with what would have taken place over the last number of years. Now, for those who, who sort of smile and say, well, that's shame on you, uh, that's too bad. Just keep in mind that the wheel turns and there may be a situation at some other point when there would be someone who would be in a position of authority who would be unchecked in his authority with an administration that had a particular agenda that might not be as evenly balanced. So that there is some value in having diversification so as not to vacillate from extreme to extreme, but somehow keep things relatively uh, moderate in, in the middle. Mr. Dean? Well, Mr. Chairman, the testimony all through this day has indicated a deep dissatisfaction with mm -hmm. the Commission. And what we're simply saying is yeah. it could not have been any worse if you had had a single administrator. Well, all of but us aren't really willing to subscribe to that because right. the fact of the matter is conceivably it could have been worse oh. if you had had yeah. the unchecked um, enthusiasm to go in one direction that at least the majority of the um, commissioners no. didn't believe. M Mr. Chairman, it, mm -hmm. uh, as I indicated in the case of EPA, it doesn't work that way. When you have a commission which begins to fail to act swiftly and decisively in an important area like safety, and you got five or three members fighting with each other, it is an almost hopeless thing for anybody to cope with. You have a single administrator, that administrator either performs or that administrator rather rapidly disappears. And I simply point out the change in EPA, mm -hmm. the change in the Interior Department. In, the, in this administration, that took place. Let me yield to the gentleman from Utah at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to talk to Mr. Dean and also Mr. Fogel on the, both, both of them. We have examples of good examples of uh, commissions. The Federal Reserve Board is a commission of sorts. ICC, FCC, F SEC, FTC, and generally speaking, we've been fairly pleased with the actions of those committees, although we have had some concerns in various places, but in general, they have performed quite well as commissions. You have the CPSC, which you already mentioned, which has been under fire the last, ever since I've been here at least, and then NRC is another example of where we've been constant bickering in the, those groups. You have one or two members uh, vigorously opposing the actions of the full commission and so forth. So you have both successes and failures in the commission form. Would, they, would you concede that? Yes, I would. I would like to point out that one of the problems with CPSC has been the total lack of stability in leadership given this structure almost since its inception. And that, from a management standpoint, is one of the things that very much concerns the GAO because you have not had continuity. Would you Could make that same statement with regard to NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission? I'd have to refer to my colleagues who are more familiar exactly with in the GAO. Uh, even I would have to yield to the chairman. Is there something unique that you think that uh, with the Consumer Product Safety Commission that is, is causing all this turmoil? I mean, is there something that's unique to the subject matter that we're talking about that results in instability and people coming and going, a sort of a revolving door? Um, I, I don't know why it is. Um, uh, I, 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 I just would, yeah, Mr. Deal with Mr. Chairman, uh, may I suggest a, uh, a, a comparison? You mentioned EPA, uh, that is Mr. Dean, I guess, mentioned EPA. You mentioned that Dan Gorsuch uh, Burford failed. 
and you suggest that Mr. Ruckelshaus succeeded. They were both single administrators. I'd like to compare CPSC with the EPA. They're both impossible problems, impossible tasks. It's almost impossible to regulate all consumers that need, uh, consumer products that need to be regulated and, and make sure all risk is taken care of. It's also impossible to take care of all the hazardous substances we'd like to take care of and clean up all the messes that are uh, developing daily. Uh, was, is the failure of CPSC and the failure of EPA related to the very difficult nature of the task in any way? One thing that analysts of government programs have commented on is you can divide agencies between consensus and non-consensus agencies. No, but I've got, an, yeah, I've right. got a consensus yeah. agent, I've got yeah. a non-consensus right. agent, right. both with difficult uh, problems, well. both of which have, have had miserable records, at least yeah. up, up no, to a certain no. point. Hear me out, Mr. Nielsen. Well, I, I want you to get on, the, su get on at, the subject. At the time the administration took over, the Reagan administration, it had not been established that EPA was a consensus agency. That is the reason for the toleration for only a short time of the initial leadership of the EPA. Now the point I tried to make was not that EPA was a failure under a single administrator, but the fact there was a single accountable administrator became quickly evident to everyone and it was possible to clean up the situation by the replacement rather swiftly well, well, of the administrator. Let, let, me, let me pursue this point just a moment and I will yield. Isn't it a matter of who the administrator is rather than the, the form of it? In other words, we've had good regulation good administration in commissions and bad regulation in commission. We've had good administration in single administrative areas and bad, administ bad administration. Isn't that I, true? No, I must respectfully disagree. The, the well, I've give, just given uh, you two examples. Right. Well, you good uh, regulation in SEC and poor regulation in NRC, both commissions. No. You had good regulation in the uh, EPA under certain circumstances and bad under some certain other circumstances. Well, uh, isn't, I'm saying, isn't no. it a matter who's administering the program well, rather than the type? No. No, you, it is true in a single-headed agency. An incompetent administrator can poorly manage the agency, but that person usually goes. If it is administrative function, and every single study has documented this, <coughs> the boards and commissions, even though they may have short honeymoons, in the long run break down into indecision, lowest common denominator decision making, delays of the kind with counting with this commission. That is why in the important safety and health area, there are only two commissions out of probably 13 major agencies. And those two commissions, there are hearings being held this Thursday, also on the elimination of the commission in NRC or some other fundamental re reorganization of NRC. Don't, as George Washington warns, don't try to administer programs in, involving the actual carrying out of functions important to health and safety in some ponderous board or commission. I'll yield to the chairman. He had a, maybe I, I, maybe I, I passed I'll, it. I will. Uh, okay, thank you. Let chairman. me ask another question or two. Uh, I, uh, I'm not convinced uh, you're, that you're the, there's a difference. I'm, I agree with the chairman. I'm not sure there's a real difference uh, between those which regulate economic activities such as the FCC, uh, SEC, FCC, and FTC, and so on and those that regulate health. And I don't understand why one area is paramount over another area, unless it's by tradition. Now you mentioned EPA. That was set, set up as a single administrator right from the start in 1972. So your point to saying it was not established as a commission, it really begs the question. CPSC was set up the opposite way. President Reagan did not change the organization of either one. He's now recommending and proposing that we do change the recommendation. But why? Why is the difference between, what is the difference between the economic ones and the safety ones? I will answer partially, and then I think Dr. Seidman would like to further elaborate. He struggled with this for a long time. First, I'd like to attack the major premise. Well, I'm it just quoting, no, I thought no, I was quoting right. you. It is yeah. not necessarily true that the economic regulatory agencies have on the whole been all that effective and efficient. Oh, we, we, we quibble yeah, with them, but yeah, on, the, yeah, on the whole, yeah, I've never heard yeah. anyone, at the time, well, time I've uh, been here, suggest the, we get rid of the ICC or the well, FCC or the SEC or the FTC. Well, and Mr. those are four major agencies. Mr. Nielsen, the ICC has been dying on its feet for years. But have you heard anyone suggest it be reorganized yeah, and yes, eliminated? Yes, hmm. I have, sir, and I spent quite a few years in the reorganization of Northeastern Railroads, as the chairman knows. 
And one of the reasons for the problems in the Northeastern Railroads was the ponderous, time-consuming ineptness of the, in, of the ICC. And that is a matter of historical fact. Why, and since it's 1877, when I believe it was first uh, put in, why, have we, why has it persisted for 110 years and it is that bad? Oh, and it took the railroads a long time to realize that the ICC was not its friend. 110 years? It, it certainly did. The railroads were in a monopoly position. I don't want to go into railroads, which is a great subject with me, but uh -huh. the railroads were in a near monopoly position on land transportation until we, after we World War II. We found problems with CPSC in 10 years. Yeah, it didn't right, take 110 yeah. years. Well, What's the difference? Mr. Mr. Nielsen, I'm just telling you that the ICC, in facing up to the practical problems of railroads in a genuinely competitive environment of post-World War II, was a disaster for the railroads. That's a matter of historical fact. But the point is we're dealing with a, with a specific health and safety-oriented agency. The GAO did a lot of research, and it's an excellent report that they have presented to the committee. We in the National Academy you have no axes to grind, don't favor any part of the programmatic stuff in these bills, simply are telling you that our people who study these agencies think you're going to be better satisfied in the long run if you have a single accountable administrator. Yeah. Well, the, only reason, the only point I was trying to make is that you did have a commission basis which has lasted for 110 years, and at least part of that time it was considered to be quite effective. You uh, still have a number of these other agencies, Security and Exchange Commission, which still seems to be quite well regarded. I have not heard the chairman suggest that we should reorganize that or, or give it the mu so much ma micromanagement they're suggesting here. We, we did suggest FTC take over some, some extra things like cigarette ad advertising and things of that nature, and on-time situations with the, with the airlines and so forth. But I have not seen the micromanagement approach required to those other agencies that I have this one. So I think this must be a unique situation, not the fact that it's a commission form but the nature of the beast, the nature of the area it's trying to administer, the impossibility of doing the task with the resources we give it, I think there are a lot of reasons why this agency's had in, been a troubled agency. Now you put OSHA in, AMSHA went into effect about the same time as this agency did, in the early 70s, and we've not had, we've had complaints with admin, single administrators, individuals, we've uh, gotten rid of a few along the way and we've protested and so forth, but we've not cha seen fit to change the structure. So I wonder if it's the structure or whether it's the, what we're trying to ask them to do. I, I just have that question. Anyone else like to add, add that? Or? The one, we did abolish the CAB and the Federal Power Commission, and I think the ICC is on the road to being abolished. But uh, I think well, you have CAB to CAB would just change the FAA. That really, you can't well, use no, that. Well, no, CAB no. was not change. It was the it, function of the It's a general yield on that. I mean, the CAB has been Man. sort of collapsed into but DOT. I don't know anybody that's particularly yeah. happy with the aviation but, uh, service uh, performance over the last number of years. Uh, the ICC, and, and the gentlemen are correct, the administration proposed to right. eliminate the ICC and give to the DOT and the Justice Department the ICC's functions. I don't know anybody that thinks that DOT and, and notwithstanding the, the miserable record of the ICC over the last couple of years, the idea that somehow the DOT is now going to assume the responsibilities of the ICC, uh, that almost taxes well, they, credibility as well. They, so I guess in some respects I'm agreeing with you on, on some parts, but um, I'm not oh. sure that the experience recently about abolishing an autonomous agency and collapsing it into a line agency in the cabinet is, um, is full of uh, a lot of optimism that we're going to get a better performance than we had previously. I well, think John, you I would, would agree, Mr. Chairman. Nothing guarantees anything, but uh, uh, we do you know about that. But uh, there are two points I would want to make in response to Mr. Nielsen. One, the assumption about the performance of the independent regulatory commissions. Uh, at the time, I was assistant director of the Budget Bureau, later of the Ash Council under Nixon, the studies most of the th generalizations about them, that most of those have become captives of the, or, or, of the very agencies they were supposed to regulate. They weren't very independent, and that, they said, was often a factor of their independence since that was their principal constituency you with mean those they were, they regulated. They were captured because they were, they were, captured. Because they were commissions or because yeah, they were by their interest groups. What? 
Because they were commissions? Or? Partly because they were commissions, which the, often the or interest because they had a weak administrator. Uh, because the, it's much easier to capture a commission. You don't think FHA is has not been captured by the banking interest? No, I would not say that. <laughs> well, I mean, they're sort of implying that the single, single administrator can't be captured by the one he's trying to administer either. No, I, I would never make so in, in absolute terms, but no, the no, likelihood. But, but I'm just trying to, for every example you can name, I think I can name another uh, uh, of the opposite the other category th in the, the same category. The uh, point to make is in generalizations about the uh, independent regulatory commission, you can't talk in general terms. You have to talk may about I interrupt you say what functions I, they I, May I interrupt? I am supporting the Dan Murray bill. I'm yep. a co-sponsor. I'd like to believe that the problems will be solved by making a single administrator. But the arguments you're using are not compelling because I can think of a lot of uh, commissions which are working reasonably well and have done for years. And I can think of some single administrators which have failed utterly uh, over the years. And so I don't, I, I wish you had a little, a little stronger reason than the fact that well, George Washington said well, that or that, let me, or that, uh, uh, let me, you, or that you, GAO said that. Mr. Nielsen, if I could point out, and you, you've talked about commissions, you have to talk about what they've done. And there's a difference in their performance to based on what the function and what the function in which the independent regulatory commission, where they've had safety functions, like ICIC, they perform them miserably. And the record is perfectly clear on railroad safety and truck safety. They are not capable. Like the, as I said, the, the, this is where you get back to basic. You create a commission initially because you want deliberation. You feel the emphasis should be on slowness, bringing in multiple views into the process. And when you're dealing with questions of safety and execution of that kind of program, that are kind of structure makes it much more difficult to accomplish. Are you suggesting that uh, CAB and FAA have been no. so much better than, no. No. than this agency no. or OSHA? No. The OSHA and MSHA have been so much better in, in terms Congressman, of performance? Congressman, let me, let me <laughs> illustrate um, the advantages sometimes of a single administrator from an accountability standpoint. I want to pick up on what... Well, I, I agree with that what, point. Yeah, what Mr. Dean said. And let's, let's just use three agencies here. One is... Uh, FDA, and I, I'm not speaking here an accountability standpoint from whether it's an independent agency or part of another agency. But if the general, yeah, I mean, isn't sure. that a key important point? I mean, when you say you're not addressing that component, that is also a very important part because the value of autonomous agencies, whether you have one person or a board, is that it is autonomous. Oh, that's now, correct. Now, you could say that's good or bad, but it is the rationale for it existing. So uh, I would just ask that you do, if you're going to respond to the question, try to address it in the context of whether you are advocating a single administrator, um, notwithstanding the fact of being autonomous or not autonomous, and I can accept that. I can accept that. There's a certain amount of common sense in that under certain circumstances. But it, it, it also, sure. to not make the distinctions between autonomous is to miss, miss the policy justification for having an autonomous agency that is independent of and administration. Well, we, uh, we would favor a single administrator regardless of whether well, we're talking. Well, that's easy, though. That's right. <laughs> but what I, wanted, what I wanted to emphasize was you had a problem, for example, with an AIDS epidemic. Now, FDA had to follow the Administrative Procedure Act and the, the whole, you know, quasi, if you almost want, judicial process to approve those drugs. But you had an accountable individual there, the, the commissioner who was able to direct the agency, marshal its resources, and through a process that still guaranteed health and safety, get on the market quicker than normal a uh, drug, that AZT, that may have some beneficial effects. What I'm saying is that's an illustration, it seems to me, of how put, placing accountability in a single individual can help facilitate a decision quicker than if you have, would have to do that through a number of commissioners. I don't think, though, you could ever guarantee that one form or the other is going to work in all cases. And I think this discussion has, has illustrated that. But I think what we're saying is based on um, experience looking at other things from a managerial, in an administrative sense, a single administrator facilitates management and decision making. Assuming, though, that you're always going to have appropriate safeguards in terms of uh, the hearing process, letting people comment mm -hmm. on uh, proposed rules and so forth. The gentleman would yield, but I mean, when you say it facilitates quicker decisions, you're presuming that it's quicker, wise decisions. 
and the policy virtue for the collegial approach is to maybe be a bit more inefficient, yeah. but the theory is that what you're doing is contributing more to the ultimate wisdom, the thought being three people, five people contribute more in terms of policy diversification to come to some decision that is you're in correct. the long term wiser. So conceivably, on the one side you're trading off speed, on the other side you're trading off access to um, more diversification. That it, it really almost goes to the concept we lift it to a larger level in terms of democracy versus a more autocratic form of government. I mean, someone can get the trains running on time if you've only got one person making the decision, but there are other values and virtues that you give away when you've got one people making the decision. Isn't that a, a legitimate policy analysis that's the alternative? Yes, I would agree. Okay, I thank you, gentlemen. I have just one more question, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the witnesses, but uh, some of the advocates of the collegial structure, the two commissioners who spoke later, have asserted that structure provides for free debate and exchange of ideas. Uh, expressions of views and so on, whereas a single administrator does not provide that. Do you have any opinion as to whether such free debate and exchange occurs in a single administrator agency such as the FDA or the, or the uh, EPA, for example? Do you think there is a free exchange and free debate and expression there in a single administrator? Well, there certainly is in um, FDA in the drug approval process and in, uh, I'm thinking of a specific case where we looked yeah. at recently uh, for uh, Senator Metzenbaum looking at the approval of aspartame. There was a whole series of uh, public hearings, a debate among the scientific community, very extensive public analysis of uh, the adequacy of the studies that were done to put it on the market. Now, ultimately, all of those public bodies that were convened by FDA had to make a, make a recommendation to the commissioner, and he made a decision one way or the other. So at that final point in time, there wasn't a debate before he made his decision, but, but there was extensive debate guaranteed, again, by the procedures and structures that were available. I there. detect that Mr. Dean wants to answer that question also. Well, I can simply say I was associate administrator of a large health and safety agency for many years, and FAA. And I can assure you that the fr framework within which a single administrator functions with his principal staff, the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, certainly give every opportunity for free debate. In fact, a great deal freer than you now find in the NRC with its staff out in Maryland and five commissioners hiding in the Metonic Building. One last question. I thought that was the last, but you've raised another one. Uh, which actually, to, I want to ask Mr. Fogla. You say every previous administrator, every, every previous chairman of the uh, CPSC. Confirmed chairman. Right. Every confirmed right. chairman right. Uh, prefers a single administrator over their experience. Did their yes. attitude change because of their experience, or would, did they have that idea when they first joined the commission? Let, or do I'd you like have any let Mr. Ackley Would you respond. find that out and let us know? Yeah. Either uh, one or two of them said they had changed their mind uh, after serving as chairman. In fact, even Mr. Scanlon originally uh, favored the uh, uh, commission, but uh, has changed his mind. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. So, Let me just raise two questions. One, and I know that Mr. Dean didn't intend to rewrite history, but having been involved in the EPA fiasco during the Gorsuch days, I mean, this was not a self-monitoring administration change that took place. It was an impeachment by uh, the Congress of the United States that caused the, uh, the resignation and the change of policy. Now, there you had an individual who theoretically was accountable who, to all of the process and the procedures that you laud as being out there, and yet we had policy decisions that were being made that were, under most objective analyses, atrocious in terms of health and safety and, and concerns about environmental protection. Wouldn't that be an example of the opposite of what it is that you've been advocating? Well, in fact, I give the fullest credit to the role of the Congress. And all I, my basic point was that because it was possible to focus upon a single administrator, that single administrator disappeared. And moreover, the administration found it had no choice but to seek a very highly respected and experienced person to head that agency. Do you think if you had three people with different views on the board that we would have had to wait for two and a half years 
um, and an act of impeachment uh, to be bring to the public's attention if what it is that was going on in that agency? Mr. Chairman, I really believe there's been a board. You might still be having hearings on who said what in that board and who should go with those fixed terms. Let me, let me just conclude by making an observation and, and, and I suppose in a sense in agreement with uh, my colleague from Utah that you know, personalities will always be in agencies. Structures are interesting but not determinative. In some respects, what we're having now and the disruption that we've seen over the last six or seven years particularly is as a result, in, in my opinion, of a fundamental question about agreement with the missions of the various agencies. That what we have is a somewhat you know, candid approach to not being supportive of governmental intervention in general. And then you've got people in positions of authority at all of these agencies that uh, ideologically don't agree with the mission of the agency because they fundamentally don't agree with the concept that government has any role to play in dealing with these things. That's the problem, it seems to me. So you can change the structure and you can put Mr. Scanlon in charge of a one-person agency that is autonomous or not autonomous. You can have all three people and have what you have now so that until, unless and until you get people with a commitment to the mission of the agency, and there will always be differences, but there'll be differences within a scope, within a framework. When you get outside of that framework, then you're gonna have the dilemma at the various agencies that we see happening now. May I ask Mr. Dean whether you think there's any validity to that analysis? Certainly, a great deal of validity. And the only observation I would make is that if you have a single administrator who is committed to a program, he will it. make great progress. Okay. Yep. What happens if you have a single administrator who is committed to undoing the no. agency? He will do no worse than a, a committee. Are you really, sh are you really <laughs> confident in I'm saying that? How could anyone have brought the Consumer Product Safety Commission to a lower estate down from 900 and something? I will tell you exactly how. Yeah. I mean, but for the disarray that's over there, but for the embarrassing silliness that goes on, there would not have been the public attention even drawn to the issue. That it is only, and you know, I heard a little bit today about how the agency now is doing some things and their injury rate is falling off. It is in large measure because of the public disarray. Now, I'm not comfortable advocating that there's some virtue in disarray, but as contrasted between disarray and public exposure and quiet, systematic, very talented, single administrators decimating the law with nobody knowing about it, I think there's some value for democratic disarray. Now, you may not feel comfortable with that. Okay. I don't feel comfortable advocating that. But when the choice is only disarray that at least focuses public attention on things, as was the case with EPA and Mrs. Gerford, Burford, and systematic, quiet dismantling and shredding of protection, um, I'm not sure which is, is a more tolerable approach. Well, Mr. Chairman, the things we heard today depend on action. The action is not occurring with this commission. I s respectfully submit that had there been one person on whom attention could have been focused, you might have a lot different leadership under a single administrator and a lot more faithfulness in carrying out the program. I respect your view. I'm not sure I totally disagree or do agree with it, but I, I think obviously, and this is an interesting academic discussion, unfortunately, those of us here haven't got the authority and the, um, the, the mission to just ab academically discuss these things. We've got to make some decisions, and of course there are competing views in the legislation that we're um, talking about now, and we take the hand that we've been dealt. And therefore, what we're trying to do, and hopefully will be able to do, is make those structural changes that will provide for a higher degree of accountability, and I'm, I'm hopeful that um, all of the members will at least agree with that general approach and we will try to uh, move forward as quickly as possible. The panel's been helpful to us and we thank them very much for their participation. If there's no further business to come before the committee, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much.
watching a hearing on the reauthorization of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. To contact the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Commerce and Consumer Protection, you may write to 151 House Annex 2, Washington, D.C., 20515. If you watch the Congress on C-SPAN, you'll want to purchase the all-new Gavel to Gavel. This newly revised edition will help you understand how the U.S. Congress operates. Gavel to Gavel explains how and why television cameras cover the Congress.